видео есть. Ну, коллеги, можем, собственно, можем приступать, можем начинать. Можем начинать, да? Расстат. Да. Итак, здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги. Hello, dear colleagues. Рады приветствовать We всех are вас. glad to welcome you here all from different countries. Today, on the 18th of June 2021, it's 9 o'clock in Moscow. Of course, in other countries, it can be different, different time, and that is why um, we start uh, with the Japan, and um, then uh, we'll go uh, from the east to the west gradually. Today, we conduct already the ninth conference, international conference. Today, we have 49 presenters um, from 28 countries of the world. It will be very interesting um, uh, to listen uh, to uh, public procurement development in Russia and abroad. You can know that our program is on the side of our conference. We can also copy this in chat if you need it. How um, will uh, our event uh, be done? Uh, translation uh, will, uh, will be uh, onboarding. Uh, there are two channels, Russian and English channels. Uh, we have simultaneous interpreters and you can uh, listen to our presenters in any language. You can use Russian or English language. Now I would like to welcome uh, uh, the second moderator, introduce him. Uh, this is Stanislav Nikonov. Head of the international direction of the electronic trading platform Kasprom Back. And the second coordinator and moderator is me, Kuzma Kichik, associate professor of the business law department of the law faculty of Lomonosov Moscow State University. I would like to give the floor to Evgeny Gubin, head of the business law department of the law family of Lomonosov Moscow State University, scientific director of the procurement law center of MSU, professor, honor lawyer of the Russian Federation. Thank you very much. Uh, now you can see me very well. Good morning, colleagues, uh, for everybody. But remembering the previous our meetings, and we have eight of them, now I can feel that I lack something. And I understood that I lack this conference, which is now today, because um, it is like the main event for us uh, of summer each year. And without this conference, I can feel uh, like some void, you know, some, some lack of something very necessary and interesting and exciting. Everybody says to us, pandemic is horrible, pandemic uh, prevents us from doing things, uh, we cannot, cannot communicate well enough. I think it's an exaggeration, vice versa. Today we can see that we have a meeting and we can see that we uh, that pandem pandemic for us, it's not an obstacle. Uh, it's just a little bit different um, format of communication and we discuss a lot of problems and topics uh, which we face. And um, we, uh, uh, so uh, I uh, also would like to, I, I, why uh, uh, am I uh, saying now first? Uh, because this is uh, the night meeting, which is organized uh, also by uh, the law, um, business law department of the law faculty of um, uh, SU. And that's why maybe I, uh, uh, say the first, uh, because I represent this uh, faculty, the law faculty. I think the law faculty is very important here regarding our topic today, public procurement problems of law enforcement. And we'll speak um, about uh, this important tool of the market economy. It's an extremely important tool of the market economy. And we are convinced one again that this tool, the sector of the market economy is undoubtedly characteristic for all countries existing today in the world and uh, how many countries will we have how many presenters will we have 28 countries will present uh, from all continents which uh, are on this uh, globe now i would like to say also uh, that uh, the uh, the Institute of Public Procurement is very important for us 
Correct. It's uh, it has interdisciplinary character. Uh, we don't uh, separate this uh, into private or public because we look at this institute as uh, the one. Uh, there are this, uh, there is we have criminal law, also administrative um, administrative uh, aspects. Uh, there are so many things, and this is a very a huge complex uh, of uh, problems. Uh, and this is a very necessary institute of the market economy, and it attracts so many specialists and people who dedicate their lives uh, uh, to this um, topic. Uh, they have been studying this uh, topic for many years. Um, my MSAU, uh, the law faculty, um, I welcome all of you today uh, and uh, welcome all participants uh, who will take part in this conference. And also I would like to say uh, that uh, our colleagues help us a lot, support us, our partners, friends, I mean electronic uh, trading platform of Gazprom Bank in particular, which uh, really uh, did a lot to uh, make uh, uh, our cooperation uh, happen and they contributed a lot to development of this institute i express my gratitude to organizers also and i can say uh, that uh, it's really now um, uh, our accomplishment that we can communicate uh, at least in electronic format but still i wish success in this work Thank you very much, uh, uh, Evgeny. I would like to clarify. Uh, to, today uh, we uh, have 28 uh, countries and 49 presenters. And also, you noticed know, quite well uh, that uh, the law faculty is one of the um, main uh, organizers of, the con of this conference. And in other countries, which are included in CIS, uh, procurement is being done not by faculties, uh, uh, but uh, faculties of administrative uh, uh, law. And uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, so today our conference will be started by Ria Yasuda. He will be the first uh, to speak from Japan. Uh, so this, uh, he represents uh, the um, School of Law and uh, he represents administrative uh, uh, law. Now I would like to give the floor to Viktor Vaipan, Vice Rector of Lomonosov Moscow State University, Professor of the Business of Law Department, Deputy Chairman of the Moscow Branch of the Association of Lays of Russia, Honorary Lay of Moscow, Doctor of Law. Thank you, Kuzma uh, Valerovich. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, sorry, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, for many years, uh, uh, the uh, law faculty of MSU uh, spent uh, uh, this conference during summer. And this conference is dedicated to our uh, topic, public procurement problems of law enforcement. Uh, this is uh, our very important event for our specialists. Uh, and uh, as Evgeny said, I am glad to welcome all participants in this very interesting scientific uh, um, uh, event uh, and uh, we all know that in Russian Federation we have a huge uh, global federal contract system of uh, state municipal, municipal uh, procurement uh, which uh, goes through all spheres of all our Russian economy. Uh, on the 30th of March in our single uh, information system uh, 312 uh, customers were registered uh, and uh, uh, we have information about 5, 511 in the first quarter uh, 1.23 million of applic applications we had and they all and uh, on average uh, 3.58 uh, applications uh, we had on the whole we have a competitive uh, environment regarding procurement i uh, can uh, state you another figure. In the first quarter, customers uh, uh, had contracts uh, for 1.6 million contracts for the total amount of 0.3 uh, trillion of rubles. Uh, this is 5% uh, um, uh, higher than in the first quarter last year. 
Uh, so you can see this is quite a serious system, global system of procurement. And this system of procurement uh, is always changing. It is changing gradually. We can uh, see uh, the reforming of legislation and contract system of procurement. Uh, and uh, recently, uh, we had a legislative measures to simplify procurement system. We shorten um, cyclicity of procurement, uh, and uh, there were some resolutions regarding uh, electronic shops. Um, recently, we had uh, shortening of uh, deadlines of payment. Um, they, so we we are always improving of this contract system in this uh, aspect uh, and we uh, will optimize this uh, later uh, we will support fair competition and we all participate in this process since the first of uh, july uh, the um, uh, there will be change uh, of uh, uh, informa of information entering regarding fair competition when you plan uh, procurement uh, you will need to register more information since the first of july electronic procurement could be um, uh, appealed uh, through uh, the um, unified information system and we have spoken about this option for a long time for since the first of october uh, through yes you uh, can get information about about all preliminary suggestions uh, and you will uh, have uh, the requirement regarding energy efficiency of many goods. Uh, there are always improvements uh, and changes of the system, uh, the system of um, uh, this um, um, uh, this uh, instrument uh, and also um, i can speak about the uh, finalizing of digitalization of uh, procurement system we should simplify uh, this uh, procedures of procurement we need to improve uh, remote um, checkups uh, uh, and the checkups of unfair suppliers. Uh, Evgeny mentioned that we have such an opportunity to work remotely, uh, but uh, this remote work um, should uh, touch uh, uh, also all procurement issues. I'm sure that these um, issues and other issues will be a subject of today's discussion. That's why I wish you all uh, an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Viktor Alexeyevich. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, uh, now um, uh, we can start uh, uh, to listen to our presentations, which we have today uh, in our program. And I would like, uh, as I've spoken already, uh, uh, let's uh, start with Japan. And I would like to give the floor uh, to Associate Professor of the School of Law in the Nagoya University, Doctor of Law, Ria Yasuda. Uh, this is our huge friend from Nagoya, uh, Ria Yasuda. In last uh, year, we heard his uh, presentation uh, regarding a very interesting specific topic. Uh, he spoke about um, He, he spoke about uh, subsidies um, payment uh, uh, to those who suffered from uh, pandemic. I think that's quite an interesting uh, so payment of subsidies, and this is also a part of procurement. Uh, speaking about Japan regarding procurement, uh, uh, it's a huge country, unique. Uh, and uh, there are many regulations uh, on the ba based on ca on customs uh, and traditions. Uh, uh, so our colleague, please, uh, Ray Yusura, the associate professor of the School of the Nagoya University, you're welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Rie Yasuda from Nagoya University in Japan. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So, I'd like to report on the issue of administrative fine and criminal penalty imposed by the state on companies in Japan in case of cartel in public procurement. No cartel case has yet arisen with regard to public procurement of COVID-19 control policy. 
However, we foresee that such case will take place in Japan in the future. This case means when one cartel occurs in relation to public procurement, the question is whether or not it is possible to impose both administrative fine and criminal penalty on, on the companies of the cartels. And when this combination of these fine is added to the civil obligation to pay, which, which in Japan may also impose. So the question is how these three combined, combined, combined payment can be justified. So, This, so this is case discuss this point. So I will firstly, I will firstly introduce the case. Next, I point I point out what is problem about the approach of this code, and finally I will discuss what solution Japan has in mind. the case about cumulative imposition of administrative fine, criminal penalty, and obligation of beneficiary in bad case. The social insurance agency, the state, which is in charge of the nation's pension affairs, invited four, company, four companies to participate in a nominated competitive bidding process for the procurement of stickers to conceal names, amount of other details on pension notice sent to the public. These four companies from 1989 to 1992 determined the prospective contractors by means of collusion and rather distributed the profit. So first of all, let's talk about administrative fine. The Fair Trade Commission found, found that the collusion constructed a cartel prohibited by Article 3 of the Administrative Act. The Fair Trade Commission ordered the four companies to pay a surcharge under Article, Article 7.2.1 of the Act. This order is the first administrative decision, disposition. And the four companies appealed against the order. They, fi they, they filed a request for appeal with the Fair Trade Commission. The Fair Trade Commission initiated the appeal proceedings and following it, and, and finally decided to impose searchers on each of four companies. This is uh, the second administrative disposition. The four companies appealed against the decision. The five are sued for the revocation of decision with the Tokyo High Court and and the court, the court and its appellate body, the Supreme Court, upheld. The decision is Fair Trade Commission. So therefore, the four companies have obligation to pay the surcharges. Apart from the aforementioned surcharge payment, the public prosecutor also charged the four companies with violating the anti monopoly act. So in this criminal case, the court ruled each of the four companies to a fine to a fine. This judgment became final. Therefore, the company were obliged to pay the fine. Furthermore, apart from a payment of surcharge and imposition of criminal penalty, the social insurance agency claimed, claimed that the contract with the four companies for the delivery of seals. 
and invalid on ground that the collusion has taken place and filed a lawsuit against the four companies under Article 7, 704 of the Civil Code. So claiming obligation of beneficiary in bad faith to return. At that time, the Supreme Court decision requiring the payment of the surcharge, the civil time was civil action was still pending. So the issue was how it is it could be justified to impose three disadvantages on, cal on a cartel, a surcharge and an anti -monopoly, monopoly act, and criminal penalty and the civil obligation to pay. So in particular, particular the, un the unconstitution of the calculated imposition of the administrative fine and criminal penalty was in question. This is become, because Article, Article 39 of Japanese constitution prohibited, prohibits double jeopardy. Excuse me, Miss Ria. Uh, you just, uh, as, as I realized, there's something in front of your microphone, and it really? kind of it creates different noises. Can you please <laughs> just please. pull it back a little bit? Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yes, please. So, how about my voice? Right now, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the. Decision. The court has held that cumulative imposition is constitutional. Administrative fine differ from criminal penalties. In both the in function, uh, in the in, in both the intention and in function. Criminal. Wow. Oh, so. Okay. It, uh, criminal penalty is sanctioned, but administrative fine is not sanctioned. Therefore, it does not constitute double jeopardy. Special, specifically, the purpose of the administrative fine is it ensure the full fit, fulfillment of obligation. The function is to recover unjustified profit to the treasury. treasury. And, and uh, in the intention of criminal penalty is to condemn the cartel, the cartel socially and ethically. The function is to impose sanction. In addition, since the civil action is unsettled, the tree, tree tight charge is only, the, um, only an argument for future possibility. So the court ruled in this way, how, however, some of scholars have questioned this decision. What is the problem? The problem is that cumulate, that cumulate imposition is too much disadvantage for one illegal act, one cartel. Japan has, Japan has traditionally made a distinction between administrative fine and Criminal, criminal penalty, the criteria for this, this, for this distinction are the same as those stated by the court decision referred to earlier. This, this, this dichotomy makes it possible to impose double jeopardy, jeopardy. However, Japan amended its, its Anti-Monopoly Act in 2005 the amendment made the amount of surcharge very high. This amendment changed the function of surcharge, which are administrative fines. In the past, the function of surcharge was to recover unjustified profit to, to the treasury, but now the function is the surcharge uh, surpassed that of the former, uh, it becomes sanctioned. In other words, 
the function is the social charge was become same as the criminal penalty. It can be said criminalization of administrative fine. Furthermore, in Japan, as mentioned above, there is a lawsuit to return to the profit earned by the companies through the characters to the other party, the contract. In this case, social insurance agency. The national treasury recovers the expenditure and uh, separate from this, the social insurance agency as a private party to the contract recovers the, the expendi expenditure. This feature of Japan occurs the problem that cumulative imposition is too much disadvantage for one illegal act. So, and uh, the question is whether the criminalization of administrative fine violates the constitutional provision against double jeopardy also became more acute. So finally, I will discuss what solution Japan has in, in mind. It's, it's a proposal, a new theory of sanction. First, the concept is of sanction should be broader in other words, sanction include not only penal, a criminal penalty, but administrate, but also administrative fine and more obligation of beneficiary in bad face. So, and it takes the sanction as a totally and then it considered that the legal issue is not double jeopardy, but the application of proportionality. It does not, it does not consider criminal penalty and administrative fine as matter uh, of double jeopardy, but rather the first two one and civil obligation as a sin in the application of the principle of a proportionality. Proportionality means here <clears throat> whether the total amount, this amount of disadvantage is balanced against a single act. So once the sanction as total amount has been decided, the problem of adjusting this sanction is solved. The solution to this problem is as follows. First, the charge, criminal charge is imposed and, and then the civil obligation to pay. And the final sh shortfall is appro <coughs> appropriated by administrative fine. So in summary, I'm, I have argued that in Japan, in legal theory of sanction against cartel arising from public procurement, is shifting from the prohibition of double jeopardy to the publication of proportionality. This is my conclusion. Thank you for your attention. Yes, Thank you very me. much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I just have a question. Uh, is it a common thing, the cartels in the public procurement in Japan is like usual or it's uh, something that you see not very often? Um, very usual. Very usual. So very usual. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's a, it's a common schemes to, to do the wrong thing with the public procurement. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I thank you so much, uh, Ria. We are happy to, to collaborate with you and your colleagues from your university. And we will be more than happy uh, to see you uh, more at our conference. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I would like uh, to give the floor uh, to the next speaker. Uh, we come uh, to uh, southern uh, South Korea, uh, which is close uh, to Japan. And uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, 
Professor Son uh, Oh, uh, Professor of Law in Seoul National University School of Law, PhD in Law, Public Procurement and Fraud in Korea, is the subject matter of his discussion. And uh, we are very much interested in uh, uh, just studying their expertise. And in Russia, we had Ros Zakupka as the body to be fully in charge of the public procurement, but it never worked in Russia. But the Korea embarked on that road, uh, having the similar entity. Uh, Professor Son U, the floor is yours. The legislation uh, related to the public procurement and fraud in Korea. Um, hello, guys. Do you hear me? Yes, we do hear you. Perfect. And we see okay. your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Kuzuma, and thank you, um, Stanislav, um, for this wonderful um, conference and this um, uh, moderation. So um, I, I understand that I have 15 minutes, so uh, I will be somewhat quick uh, in my speech. So um, my talk is about public procurement law uh, and fraud in Korea. So actually, um, this is uh, the update of my previous um, presentation. And so today, this year, so I will more focus on um, section four, so which is about uh, public procurement and fraud and cases. So uh, it was quite interesting that um, Lee Yasta uh, we are quite near Japan and Korea, but we didn't have a chance to discuss about the topics, but so I was so much surprised that we were sharing quite common kind of issues in the cases. So I will talk about that later. So be before going into section four, so let me briefly um, yeah, talk about the other part. So section one is the, uh, the overview of procurement law in Korea. So, Mm, so I, I believe that that should be quite similar in other countries. And in section two, so this is about the legal nature of government procure, procurement contracts. So whether it is the uh, private law relationship or whether it is a uh, public law um, relationship. So I try to introduce quite interesting um, Korean uh, Supreme Court cases. So, and maybe the conclusion might be uh, the procurement contract is the combination of uh, both uh, private and, and public law uh, natures. And section three is composed of the um, statute um, surrounding uh, fraud and collusion in procurement procedures in Korea. And section four is about uh, one interesting case in Korea. So and section, section five is about uh, somewhat theoretical um, legal framework for understanding uh, procurement contracts. So uh, I use uh, some public law perspective, maybe public interest theory um, versus uh, public choice theory perspective. And, and section six is about uh, government contract and private auto autonomy. So this is another uh, quite theoretical uh, topic. Uh, I presented this topic maybe two years ago. Uh, so this is the, the uh, overview of the uh, the total talk, and I will go to section four directly. Okay, so um, so this is another um, collusion case in Korea. So it's about a uh, military oil, oil procurement collusion case, um, and this this case was dealt dealt with in three layers of um, court trial from uh, Seoul Central District Court uh, in the year of 2007 and at the Seoul High Court, Operate court, court in the year of 2009. And finally at the uh, Supreme Court at, in the year of 2011. So let me briefly um, introduce the facts. So in this case, the plaintiff was Republic of Korea, so especially the military uh, department. And the dep defendant was uh, four major uh, petroleum companies like right? SK Oil, GS Cartex, S Oil, 
uh, Hyundai Oil Bank, uh, etc. So the major uh, oil companies are the defendants. And the plaintiff was uh, procuring the military oil from the, those defendant companies. So from the year 1998 to 2000, so in every year procurement procedures, the defendants occluded the prices of the bidding and got contract with plaintiffs according to the uh, pre-colluded shares of each company. And uh, Korean Fair, Fair Trade Commission, so KFTC, found out that the illegal collusion of dependent companies and levied uh, administrative penalties. And um, plaintiffs, the uh, military of defense, raised a civil tort suit against the defendant companies, uh, claiming that the illegal illegally colluded actions of the defendant are fraud and inflicted damages uh, as much as uh, about uh, 150 million US dollars in total. And fact findings and illegality of the defendant's collusion was uh, without arguing because this, these issues were verified at the process of care. Illegality of the defendant's collusion was uh, and, and main legal and factual issues in this case was how to calculate uh, damages. Mm. So the damages in Korean tort, tort law is as follows. Um, it is explained as like this one. So the monetary disadvantage from illegal tort activity so, or the difference of plaintiff's monetary status between before and after of the illegal tort activity so, or the difference of plaintiff's monetary status between the status plaintiffs would have got but for the illegal tort activity and the real status of uh, after tort. So, um, so in this case, th these legal issues has been raised. The main, main legal issues was how to calculate um, damages. And so in front of the judges, um, they had two options or two alternatives. So one might be called um, MOPS, a means of plot Singapore yardstick methods. So it is kind of simple way of uh, compare, comparing with the uh, MOPS, um, Singapore price uh, versus the real uh, colluded price. So just calculating the difference between the two prices, um, the damages uh, can be calculated. Mm. So this is the first option. So another one is MRA, so multiple regression analysis. It's more uh, economic analysis or kind of scientific way. So it is statist statistical regression of but for price. So uh, by using um, stati statistical methods, it is how to say regression uh, or, or uh, recalculating the but for price if the collusion has not been uh, made between the uh, companies. It is using kind of economic analysis. So this is the district court um, decision. So the, uh, the judges took, uh, in, at the hard, hard to debate, uh, they took the MRA. So they ruled that um, economic analysis and statistical analysis like MR, MRA is the more scientific reasoning to find out legal solutions. So, and uh, among the MRA, so at comparison between ORS, so which is ordinary least squares method, and WLS, so weighted least squares method, the court took WLS and built up its own analysis after considering plaintiffs and defendants analysis report. So uh, this was kind of in Korea. So the first case in the courtroom, in, the, in front of the uh, judges, the uh, economists in both parties uh, uh, argued they, their way of regression and, and in, on that focus, a kind of legal debate has been uh, made, which was quite interesting case. Um, but in the high court, at the appellate court, the decision has been changed. Um, the, the high court judges also accepted the reasonableness of economic analysis, including MRA. So however, so they doubted the validity of the normative estimation of judges about the economic analysis. So especially uh, the modification of the analytic tools itself 
and variables um, by the judges. So I mean, so at the district court level, the judges were quite how to say quite active and in some sense brave. So they try to understand the economic analysis and, and they built up their own way of how to say uh, framework to calculate the damages. But the high court judges were doubting um, on, that, on that part. So, and they rejected the MRA and took MOPS kind of uh, came back to the traditional way of um, comparison. So MOPS um, compare, comparison method. And this, so this case was brought to um, Supreme Court and um, quite interestingly, the Supreme Court also rejected the high court decisions on the ground that the MOPS method is not an optimal method in calculating damages in, the, in this case. So MOPS is based upon the assumption that the Singapore oil market is working almost in perfect com competition conditions, but a Korean oil market is under quite different situation. So uh, it cannot be um, just compared in the same horizon. So they uh, ordered that in the, it is needed to develop more sophisticated method of calculating the damages. So, and with this, um, the, the Supreme Court remanded this case to the High Court. And finally, at the remanded High Court, this case was solved by settlement between the, the parties. So no additional legal decisions of the issues of damages calculation has been made. But so I can say the, uh, surrounding this case, so uh, the issues of how to calculate damages um, in uh, procurement for the case, um, but, but also more, more fundamentally, so how much economic reasonings or economic analysis can be uh, used in legal um, decision-making process. So, um, so this is quite um, phenomenal and quite interesting case in Korea. So uh, related to uh, procurement process in, in, in South Korea. So, uh, so this is the point, uh, the, the, my presentation and Lee's Lee pre presentation is sharing some uh, common, common uh, basis and issues. So um, this is the topic I wanted to share with you um, today. So I believe that I have used um, almost my time already. So uh, let me finish um, now. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Son U. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Kamzamita. I, I like to pronounce it in, in Korean language. Uh, dear Son, uh, we have uh, one question uh, for all our participants. Uh, uh, what about uh, small business entities? Um, do you have a special regime for small business in public procurement in South Korea or not? Oh, surely. So it's called maybe SME, small and medium and enterprise, yes. So we, we have kind of special uh, so law and regulation for special uh, treatment for SME, of, of course, uh, in the um, general procurement process. So that's the, um, the simple and basic answers I can, I can say to the questions. <laughs> so, yes. of course I have huge, huge details on, on that issue, but um, maybe next time I can um, talk about that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And that would be great if next time you will uh, tell us about this uh, special regime for them. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Спасибо большое, уважаемые коллеги. Давайте поблагодарим. Dear colleagues, uh, let's um, uh, thank uh, the professor uh, from uh, uh, Seoul National University at uh, the university number one. Uh, in uh, the whole South, uh, South Korea. Regarding um, entrepreneurship, uh, we studied legislation of Korea and in particular Japan one year ago. Uh, Rian Suda also presented uh, the topic uh, <coughs> which uh, concerns this um, 
a subject uh, um, of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, SMEs uh, in Japan, there is an agency uh, under Ministry of Economy of uh, uh, Trade Commerce in Japan, and they uh, um, also uh, were uh, the, those uh, who initiated the subsidies for uh, suffered uh, who. Uh, for, for those who suffered from COVID-19. Uh, and today maybe we'll um, uh, hear something new from our uh, presenter about this. Um, uh, so colleagues, um, we uh, don't believe uh, uh, our, the South and Korea. We'll now hear our other uh, Korean colleague, um, uh, Lee uh, Ju, Assistant Professor of the Faculty of Real Estate and, and Construction Engineering of the Kangham University, PhD in Law, uh, Careers Public Procurement Law in the Age of COVID-19. Uh, so this is what I already mentioned. I think this is very relevant for us now. Так, э, здравствуйте, вы меня хорошо слышите? Да, очень хорошо слышите. Да, прекрасно. Да, очень хорошо, да. Да, да. да доброе утро, Кузьма, и доброе утро, Станислав, и дорогие э, россияне. Э, меня зовут Ли Джоу, э, но сегодня я буду выступать на английском языке с вашего разрешения. Вот. Э, uh, so let me begin. I am Professor Lee Jae-woo from uh, Onam University, and the topic of my presentation is Korea's public procurement law in the age of COVID-19. Um, I'm, I'm not sharing my slides with you. Uh, can you show the slides to the public? Uh, Stanislav or Kuzma? Yeah, we're working on it. Yes, I, yes, can, yes. I can see Kuzma okay. working right. on it. So. Okay. Of course, of course. Yes. Thank you. It's okay. coming. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so as you can see on page two of the presentation, uh, I'll be talking about the main legislative amendments that took place due to COVID-19. And then I'll be providing a legal assessment of these amendments. So as you can see, there have been very many uh, provisions that were revised due to COVID-19. Um, and since there are so many, I'm going to categorize these into three groups. And so if we move on to page three of the presentation, um, you'll see that uh, there were uh, the, the purpose of amending these provisions uh, were threefold. So first, it was to expand the use of negotiated contracts. So it was expanding the exception to the principle, which is competition. So it would be possible to forego competition in favor of uh, negotiated contracts. Uh, this regards articles 26 and 27. And then the second purpose was to lessen the burden of the tenderers. And so we would reduce the, the um, tender bond, the, the performance bond, uh, the contract bond, etc. And finally, the third was to reduce the timing to give public notice of tender. And all of this was uh, the result of the recognition of COVID-19 as force majeure. Uh, this is not only the case in Korea, but I believe in uh, most countries, uh, including the Russian Federation. So uh, if we move on to page four, this will be the first um, group, which expanded the role of negotiated contracts. So as you can see in article 26, uh, uh, ground for uh, permitting negotiated contracts instead of competition was added and as you can see, I've uh, highlighted it in red uh, letters. The infectious disease has been added. Uh, so it is in order to prevent from occurring or spreading uh, COVID-19, it is possible to uh, permit negotiated contracts right away. Uh, these exceptions have uh, existed before COVID-19, but uh, this has been a very 
important addition to uh, the, the act. So this I'm talking about the enforcement decree of the act on state contracts. And then if we move on to the next slide, you can see that um, the even where there is a tender, um, where there is only one tenderer, usually there would have to be a second public notice of tender, but it became possible to forego that and go straight into negotiated contracts. Uh, now, the next slide shows, uh, this is slide number six, it shows that, uh, as I've said, the burden of the tenderers was uh, reduced. And so, as you can see here, it had to be at least 5% of the tender price. Now it can be as low as 0.24% of the tender price. And also the next slide shows Article 52, uh, which shows that the performance bond could be reduced in half from 15% to 7.5%. And finally, the next slide shows uh, that um, the inspection period can be reduced from two weeks, 14 days to seven days, one week. Now, the important thing about lessening the burden of tenderers is that, as you can see below, uh, all of this stays in effect, stays in force until the end of this month. So starting from July, there will no longer be, these provisions will no longer be applicable to COVID-19. Now, I've stated that all of these legislative amendments took place due to COVID-19 and because it was recognized as force majeure. Now, with the passage of time, since force majeure has to be unpredictable and has to be unavoidable, uh, it can no longer, well, relatively uh, speaking, it can no longer be considered as force majeure. Maybe it hasn't been force majeure for a long time, but uh, in order to avert an eco economic crisis, uh, we have kept these provisions for quite a long time. And finally, the next uh, slide shows that uh, the, the timing of public notice has, has been consider considerably reduced. It usually takes up to 40 days to give notice of tender, but now it's been reduced to five days, making it really quick uh, for the procedure to be implemented. And so uh, finally, I want to talk about the effects of all of these um, legislative uh, amendments, if we can move on to the next slide. So there have been positive moments and negative moments. The positive moments uh, regard the matching of demand and supply in the market. Uh, since there was an explosion of demand for certain goods and products like face masks and medical products during the outbreak of COVID-19, it was very important to be able to supply the, these goods uh, via the public procurement system. And it is uh, now uh, generally recognized that the legislative amendments that took place uh, at the um, initial stage of the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, did a very good job in um, meeting this uh, challenge. And this in turn has led to a minimization of economic depression. Luckily, Korea has been very fortunate enough to avert a direct impact of uh, the worldwide economic depression. And um, it's uh, fared quite well. Um, yes, there have been economic hardships, but uh, relative to other countries, uh, we have kept the economic um, growth uh, on a significant level. And also it, it made it easier for us to implement the safety protocols. We still have up to this day in Korea, uh, mask mandate. So everyone has to wear masks when we go outside and when we're inside with other people. Um, and especially in the beginning where when there was a shortage of masks, uh, it would have been impossible to keep, to implement these protocols without these legislative uh, amendments. Now, uh, the, these are the good moments, but the bad moments are that all of this, the, the possibility of going straight to negotiated contracts 
and lessening the burden of tenders has led to the loss of transparency, loss of efficiency. And so there has, uh, competition has overall suffered as a result. And this will, in the long run, create uh, problems. And so that's a challenge for us. Especially there will be many legal disputes uh, that will arise because uh, the, the quality of the goods have fallen. Uh, that, that is inevitable. And so uh, since the, the, these provisions, the effect, the legal effect of these provision, provisions will last until the end of this month, uh, everything will go back to normal starting from July. And so uh, there will be more competition and we will be returning back to the formal level of efficiency and transparency. And so, as I've put here in the box, um, how long was COVID-19 for Smojo? I can't say. But for Korea, I believe that it wasn't for a very long time. So the fact that the, the, the legal effect expires at the end of June uh, means that there was added protection for the tenderers. Maybe it was overkill in some aspects, but it was necessary in other aspects in order to minimize the impact of economic depression. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to end my presentation. I didn't have a lot of time, so I wanted to keep it very short. Thank you. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting as always, because you touch upon very interesting subjects. And speaking about force majeure, as we know, Russian court and practically each country, they also uh, adopted uh, the legislation regarding COVID-19 and force majeure. Uh, so now it's not already force majeure, as you've said. And today, uh, uh, some presenters, presenters um, us, us for, uh, will speak about force majeure situation. And one year ago, they also presented this, uh, uh, for example, oh, yeah. Dr. Timberlands uh, from the Netherlands. And today we'll speak uh, more uh, about this. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was an extremely um important uh, subject uh, because uh, uh, the legal uh, regulations should exist uh, um, in this situation or in other case um, uh, so uh, so there are different loopholes which can be used that's why here it's extremely important to use uh, uh, all this legislation acts and so on uh, colleagues uh, we proceed um, and um, as uh, uh, as we say, uh, we go from the east to the west, uh, and our new country, this is uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, People's Republic. I would like uh, to give the floor to uh, you in uh, Zan, a senior lecturer at Shanghai University of Politics and Law, postdoctoral researcher at East China University of Politics and Law, deputy head of the Center for Exchange um, and cooperation under S under the SCO Legal Services Commission, China. Uh, please, um, you're welcome, you, your son. Uh, please um, uh, switch on uh, the sound. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Коллеги, пока у нас пауза небольшая выдалась. Да. Now we have a small pause. I would like to notice. Попросить направлять вопросы в 
uh, uh, to ask uh, you uh, to send your uh, questions uh, to our chat, YouTube, uh, and then we'll ask our speakers, ask these questions of uh, the speakers. Существую, это отвечаю, конечно. Есть закупка единственного поставщика, прямая закупка. Какие ограничения на вот? So what limitations? Restrictions are the same as in other countries, as in Russia. Uh, this is the volume uh, of this uh, procurement, uh, uh, the uh, urgency, specifics uh, of um, both uh, goods uh, and services. Uh, but um, uh, if you want to uh, get uh, the answer, uh, can we start now? Yes, of course. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, I, I would like uh, to thank the organizers, the law faculty of MSU, uh, for the organizers. Uh, it's an honor for us to participate in this conference. Um, uh, my name is uh, Yu Zhang. I am a senior, uh, senior lecturer at Shanghai University of politics and law, and I will speak uh, at, about the state procurement. Uh, and uh, my uh, presentation will consist of four parts. The first part, uh, uh, the uh, reforming of state procurement in China uh, in the middle of 90s, uh, in order to satisfy the needs uh, of socialistic uh, uh, system and building up uh, uh, the financial system uh, China in the reform of state procurement, of public procurement. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, these uh, public procurements played a very important role in China. In practice, uh, uh, we uh, had also some disadvantages uh, uh, and uh, efficiency of uh, procurement um, uh, and uh, some uh, breaches. Uh, and uh, sometimes um, at, pre at present, um, uh, we continue to reform the system of public procurement uh, uh, to solve uh, the uh, problems in practice. Uh, in practice, uh, uh, the market, legal, business environment, uh, uh, and we need amendments and improvement of legislation uh, in uh, public procurement. Uh, and since the course of December 2020, uh, the um, uh, authority and the government uh, adopted the draft law about public procurement, which there were some new uh, provisions, uh, uh, and uh, um, these provisions spoke about the reform of state uh, pro of public procurement. The second part, uh, this is uh, uh, law enforcement regulation. Uh, the Chinese procurement are regulated by different laws. Uh, the law about uh, cartels, and uh, there are uh, two more administrative uh, 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 regulations uh, about regularization of uh, main procurement and uh, the uh, law about um, uh, tradings. Also, there is a change. Uh, in uh, the law on the 4th uh, of December 2020, the Ministry of Finances uh, announced um, about the reconsidered uh, uh, draft um, regarding um, uh, public procurement, uh, which uh, uh, were coordinated uh, and uh, uh, reflect also uh, the reform system uh, and uh, 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 speaking about efficiency uh, of uh, public procurement, uh, uh, we need uh, public uh, traders as the main uh, uh, way uh, to have this uh, procurement. Uh, we have the framing agreement uh, and uh, uh, we have one out uh, of six uh, uh, legal uh, laws. I don't see your presentation. <clears throat> but this presentation is not open. Uh, are we going um, uh, to open this presentation? I opened the presentation, but we don't see your presentation. That's the problem. It's quite difficult without the presentation. Uh, you choose uh, uh, the demonstration of a particular part of the screen. And you need to go to the PowerPoint or something. Нажмите еще раз на демонстрацию экрана. Press once again uh, screen demonstration. 
Вот, вот, теперь все в порядке. That's great. Now it's, it's very good. Отлично, отлично. Извините, извините. А сейчас уже третья часть. Now it's already the third part. Okay, I will continue. And uh, uh, these uh, amendments, uh, um, uh, we uh, have uh, quite, a quite a lot of articles and we have new amendments. Uh, the head of uh, um, management uh, of demand uh, on procurement uh, uh, and uh, we also added the principle of efficiency. Uh, it means uh, uh, that uh, manage efficiency uh, this is quite a big change um, in public procurement um, and this is a sign of legislation and stationary of management and uh, also uh, we uh, can uh, speak um, about complex management uh, and uh, uh, we can have clear understanding Uh, of um, public procurement. Um, we need complex uh, uh, procedures uh, uh, for management. Uh, and regarding uh, the uh, other projects, uh, we can say that public trading uh, should be the main way uh, for procurement, uh, which uh, can help us uh, to resolve uh, uh, the uh, problem of a uh, very big uh, burden uh, on uh, Uh, the uh, trading in practice and low efficiency. And at the same time, um, it's uh, uh, so we can have uh, uh, one uh, of uh, the uh, legal ways uh, for public procurement, which facilitates um, uh, the satisfaction um, uh, of uh, uh, needs uh, to simplify uh, the procedure of procurement and also achievement of uh, Um, of economy, of big scale of procurement. Additions. Um, in the project, uh, we uh, have um, uh, some uh, uh, new heads, uh, management of demand on, on public procurement, uh, the head of politics of public procurement, electronic uh, uh, reverse shooting, um, and the dealership. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, we uh, have uh, the management of all uh, chain um, and uh, also um, we should uh, have uh, uh, the uh, politics of procurement, procurement operations uh, and management of contracts. Uh, um, Uh, we need uh, uh, to have uh, this mechanism uh, and we can make uh, this uh, uh, decision. Uh, we have a serious uh, um, uh, problem. And uh, that's all uh, for, uh, for me. Uh, thank you uh, for thank attention. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you for coming and for your wonderful opportunity to speak Russian and the Chinese uh, uh, expertise is of great interest to us. As we know that uh, China has its uh, specificity in the sphere of procurement uh, and uh, a great role uh, is uh, played by the Communist Party of China in the uh, sector of procurement uh, and the party may assume some serious obligations on that sort and as to the contract implementation and uh, thank you once again thank you for coming uh, thank you for being with us thank you once again have a good day Uh, so, uh, we are uh, now moving to Beijing gradually, and I would like to give the floor to our next uh, speaker, uh, to Professor U Hua, the doctor uh, of the Partner of Beijing Guntao Jiamao Law Firm, PRC, Doctor of Litigation Law, Visiting Scholar of uh, Tokyo University, uh, Dr. Wu Hua. 
as far as I know, the message uh, will be conveyed in English. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I can't open my camera. Um, so... We, we have the same problem on our record. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can't open, open my, my camera. camera. No, it just shows the black screen. Yeah, yeah. but, but I, don't I don't have a PPT, PPT to, to present, PPT. so I can I can read the article I'll without. Uh, uh, so my name I, is Tong Li, and my I am Ms. Wu Hua's uh, colleague, and she can't attend the meeting because of other commitment. So I uh, she asked me to read. Uh, the, the article in, in this meeting. Uh, shall I begin? Okay. If you're ready, for sure. Okay. Um, uh, his uh, article, the topic of the article is the brief introduction to the legal system of government procurement in China. Uh, China's government procurement system was formally established by the government uh, procurement law of the People's Republic of China. Um, yeah, hearing after referred to as the government procurement law, which came into effect on January the 1st, 2003. Uh, after a pilot program began in 1996 and uh, full implementation in 1994, Eight. Yeah, from the statistics of the Ministry of Finance of the People's Republic of China, hearing after referred to as MOF, the scale of government uh, procurement has shown a significant increase over the past two decades, which is 3.1 billion yuan in 1998, 230.57 billion yuan in 2004, 1,130 billion yuan in 2011, 310.89 billion yuan in 2016, and 330.67 billion yuan in 2019. The procurement scale of 2019 is more than 1,000 1, times that of 1998. And the average annual growth rate of the national government procurement scale is about uh, 11%. So this is the overall of the um, article. And this article is about the four part. The first part is about the legal system applicable to the Chinese government procurement. Uh, uh, first, in China, there is a distinction between laws in a narrow sense and in a broad sense. In a narrow sense, uh, law refers only to the normative documents enacted by the National People's Congress and its standing committee through legislative procedures. Uh, in a broad sense, laws include not only the laws enacted by the National People's Congress and its standing committee, but also administrative regulations and local regulations enacted by the State Council and the People's Congresses of Provinces, autonom autonomous region, municipalities directly under the central government and larger municipalities and other and their standing committees through legislative through the legislative procedures, but also included departmental rules and local rules uh, enacted by departments of the state council and the people's governments of provinces, autonomous regions, municipal municipalities directly under the central government and the larger municipalities through legislative procedures. So there are two legal systems uh, applicable to government procurement projects. One is the legal system of government procurement, and the other is the legal system of bidding and tendering. Uh, the first, uh, the legal system of government procurement. The legal system of government procurement is ap uh, applicable to non-bidding procurement of construction projects, government procurement of goods and services, 
uh, except for international bidding for mechanical and electrical products. Uh, there are three uh, resources. Uh, first is law, uh, which is the government procurement law. Um, it was adopted uh, on June, uh, on June 29, 2002, and came into force on January 1, 2003, and it was amended on August 31, 2014. And it applies to government procurement of goods and services, as well as construction projects procured through competitive negotiations or single source procurements. And second is administrative regulations. The regulations on the implementation of the government procurement law uh, was uh, reviewed and approved by the State Council on December 31st. 2014 and came into force on March the 1st, 2015. It consists of seven chapters and uh, 79 articles, including general provisions, government procurement parties, government procurement methods, government procurement procedures, uh, government procurement contracts, challenges and complaints, supervision and inspection, legal liability and the supplementary provisions. And uh, we also have uh, a lot of um, administrative rules, which is um, can be uh, de uh, departmental rules, uh, usually, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, enacted by the, mem the Ministry of the Financial. For example, uh, the matters for the administration of bidding for the government procurement uh, of goods and services uh, and the uh, matters for the administration of government procurement information release uh, and uh, matters for challenges and complaints against the government procurement uh, and the matters for the administra administration of government procurement by no bid procurement methods and matters for the administrative administration of government procurement of services. Um, this is the uh, legal system of the government procurement. And also the other uh, legal system is the legal system of tendering and the bidding. Uh, the legal system of tendering and the bidding is applicable, applicable to the bidding project in government procurement of construction and the international bidding project for mechanical and electrical products in government procurement of goods. And for instance, uh, the, the law, the bidding law of the People's Republic of China was uh, implemented in, in January the 1st, 2000 and revised um, on December uh, 27th, 2017. Uh, according to the provisions of the Article 6, uh, Article 4 of the Government Procurement Law, the bidding law is applicable to the tendering the bidding of government procurement of construction projects. And second is administrative regulations. Uh, regulations on the imp implementation of the bidding law of the People's Republic of China uh, were reviewed and approved by the State Council on November uh, 30th, 2011, and came into force on February the 1st, 2012. The implementation of the regulation has made the legal system of tendering and bidding more complete. And then we, we also have the administrative laws regarding the tendering and the bidding legal system. The first is the provisions on um, engineering projects, which must be subject to bidding. Uh, it was the, enacted by the National Development and Reform Commission, um, effectively from June the 1st, 2018. Um, also uh, matters for the administration of the issuance of the bidding announcements and the publication information. Uh, 
um, and uh, rules regulating various uh, bidding activities. Uh, there are measures for survey and design bidding of construction projects and measures for construction bidding of construction projects and uh, yeah, uh, the, those are uh, for, the, for, the, for the time I, I will read them all. And also we have rules regulating bid evaluation activities and the measures for handling the complaints concerning the tendering and the bidding activities for engineering construction projects and uh, implementation measures for international competitive bidding for mechanical and electrical products. Um, in addition to the above mentioned departmental rules, local legislature will also formulate corresponding local regulations and rules, which are also the legal provisions that local government procurement, procurement should comply with. And this is the um, first part about the legal system um, applicable to Chinese government procurement, which is the uh, legal system of the government procurement and the legal system of the tender and the bidding. Okay, and uh, the, the second part of the article is about the scope of the application of the government procurement law. Uh, the government procure, uh, procurement law came into force on January 1st, 2003 and has been in force for 18 years. The law is applicable to only to government procurement uh, that occur in Chinese mainland. According to the definition of the government procurement and Article 2 of the government procurement law, the scope of application of the government procurement law shall be defined from several aspects. First, the subjects of government procurement should be state organs, institu institutions, and organizations at all levels excluding state-owned enterprises. State organs include state power organs, state administrative organs, state judicial organs, state procuratorial organs, etc. Uh, institutions refers to social service organizations that are organized by state organs or other organ organizations using state-owned assets for the purpose of public welfare and engaged in education, science and technology, culture, health and other activities. And the group uh, uh, organization mentioned in the government procurement law refers to the parties with financial subsidies and the social organizations approved by the government. Group organizations without financial subsidies are not the subjects of government procurement. And the second, government procurement should use fiscal funds. The fiscal, the, the government procurement law is not applicable to procurement using non-fiscal funds. Fiscal funds refer to funds include, uh, inc uh, to funds included under budget management. Borrowed funds repaid with fiscal funds shall be deemed as fiscal funds. In practice, if a uh, Procurement uses both fiscal funds and non-fiscal funds. We should first judge whether the procurement project can be divided into a uh, divided according to the different sources of funds. If procurement projects can be divided into different independent sub-projects, the, pro the portion using fiscal funds shall be governed by the government procurement law and regulations. If a portion using fiscal funds and a portion using non-fiscal funds cannot be partitioned, partitioned, yeah, be divided, the procurement shall be governed by the government procurement law and regulations in its entirety. And third, the objects of pro, uh, government procurement shall be the goods, construction, and the services. And it was listed in the centralized procurement category, abbreviated as, abbreviated as CPC, uh, published uh, by the published by the government procuring regular, uh, regulatory authorities, abbreviated as GPRA, or value of which exists the respective prescribed 
procurement thresholds abbreviated as PPT for goods, construction, or services. One funds for centralized items to be purchased, uh, to be procured uh, from the central government budgets, the applicable CPC and the PPT should be issued by the state council. When funds are from the local government budgets, the government of CPC and the PPT shall be issued by the cognizant provincial government or agencies with their authorization as applicable. And this is the second part. It's about the, it's about the, um, scope of the application of the government procurement law. And the second and the third part is the objects of the pro government procurement and uh, administrative supervision. Uh, the objects of government procurement includes goods, construction, and services. According to the statistics from the MOF, Ministry of, of Finance, the scale of national procurement in 2018 was 35.80, 80, <clears throat> uh, uh, was 35.861 billion yuan and uh, an increase of 11.7% over the previous year, accounting for 10.5% of national fiscal expenditure and 4% of GDP, respectively. The procurement scale of goods construction services is 806.53 billion yuan, 157.152 uh, billion yuan, and 120.81 9 billion yuan, respectively, accounting for 22.5%, 43.8%, and 33.7% of government procurement. The, the, increments, the increase was 0.8%, 3.3%, and 35.7%. In procurement of services, the services required by the government and the public services provided by the government to the public are uh, 57.05 billion yuan and 63.764 billion yuan, respectively. It accounts for 47.2% and 42.8% of the scale of service procurement. Um, the objects of government procurement uh, are, three, are divided into three categories. The first is goods. Goods, as referred to in the government procurement law, are goods of all shapes and kinds, including tangible and intangible objects, intellectual property rights, such as exclusive use of trademarks, copyrights, and patents are treated as goods. And construction mentioned in the law on government procurement means construction projects, including the construction, reconstruction, and expansion of buildings and structures, as well as relevant decoration, dismantling, and repair. For government procurement projects and goods or service related to the construction of such project, if methods of bidding is adopted, the bidding law and its implementation regulations shall apply. If any other method is adopted, the government procurement law and its implementation regulations shall apply. And services. Services, as mentioned in the government procurement law, refers to any objects of procurement rather than goods or construction, including various professional services, information network de development services, financial insurance services, transport services, repair and maintain services, including services needed by government agencies and their staff and the public services provided by the government to the public. Considering the variety of the services and the difficulties of uh, expressing them in brief legal language. The scope of services is stipulated by the exclusion method, which is also a common international pra practice. When the government procurement law was implemented in 2003, the term service, as mentioned in the government procurement law, mainly refers to the service needed by the government itself. That's been extended to public, public services 
uh, purchased by the government from social forces. Um, and uh, in this part, she also talked about the administrative supervision department for government procurement projects. Where a government procurement of construction project is tender, it shall be supervised by the Housing and Urban Rural Construction Department. International competitive bidding activities for mechanical and electrical products or shall be supervised by the commercial department. And the above mentioned two departments applies the legal system of tendering and bidding for supervision. And projects other than above mentioned are supervised by the financial department. The financial, uh, the finance, de uh, financial department, uh, 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 the financial department applies the legal system of government procurement for supervision. Uh, the administrative supervision department is mainly responsible for the handling of complaints arising from the projects investigation and the publishment of illegal acts, etc. And this is the third part of the article. And the last part is the methods of government procurement. Uh, government procurement stipulates in the government uh, procurement law, uh, public bidding, selective procurement, competitive negotiation, single source procurement, request for quotations and other methods permitted by the GPRA, which is Government Procuring Regular, Regulatory Authority of the State Council. Um, public bidding shall be the main procurement methods of the government procurement. In the practice of government procurement, there are six ways in practice because the MOF stipulate, stimulated, stipulated the method of competitive dialogue. So according to the statistics of the MOF in 2018, the national government procurement scale was 35.8614 billion yuan. Public bidding, selective, procu uh, selective procurement, competitive negotiation, competitive dialogues, request for negotiation and a single source procurement uh, accounts for 70.5%, 1.1%, 3.6%, 8.3%, 2.3%, of the national government procurement scale respectively. So, and the proportion of the single source procurement decreased by 40 point, uh, 4.4%, uh, 4. 5.4% among which the proportion of single source procurement for services decreased by 11.6%. Uh, here public bidding refers to the procurement method in which the purchaser invites non-specific suppliers to participate in the bidding by means of tender announcement according to law. And selective procurement refers to the procurement methods in which the purchaser randomly selects more than three suppliers from the suppliers who meets the corresponding qualifications according to law and invites them to participate in the bidding. And the main differences between the two is that the former invites non-specific suppliers to bid and latter invites specific suppliers to bid. And the uh, the competitive negotiation means that the negotiation, negotiation team negotiates with qualified suppliers on procurements of goods, construction, and the services. The suppliers submit response documents and the final quotations according to the requirements of negotiation documents. And the producer determines suppliers from the candidates proposed by the negotiation team. And the procedure of the competitive dialogue is similar to that of com to competitive negotiation. The main difference between the two is that the evaluation method adopted by the former, which is the competitive negotiation, determines suppliers from the candidates within the lowest quotation under the same conditions, while the latter, uh, which is the competitive dialogue, uh, determines suppliers from the candidates by adopting the comprehensive scoring method. And this is the uh, competitive and negotiation and the competitive dialogue. 
And the single source procurement refers to the procurement of goods, constructions and services by the purchaser from a particular uh, supplier uh, for a procurement of goods or services when one of the following conditions is satisfied. The, the single source methods may be adopted. First, one, only one supplier is qualified to supply the items to be procured. And uh, second one, it is infeasible to procure from other suppliers due to an unexpected emergency. And third, uh, one consistency or compat uh, compatibility of services require uh, procurement of additional services from the same supplier, provided that the total value of the additional procurement does not exceed 10% of the value of the base government to procurement contract. And the method of the request for quotations, RFQ, refers to the procurement method in which the uh, RFQ team issues RFQs to eligible suppliers for procurement goods, requiring the suppliers to quote a price that cannot be changed at one time, and the producer determines the transaction supplier from among the transaction candidates proposed by the RFQ team. The request for quotations methods should be adopted for those procurements of goods, the standards and the specifications of which are uniform and supplies of which in shortage are sufficient with a little fluctuation in price. And the, procu the, the, the procedures of the different, different procurement methods described above vary. Overall, the most open, fair and impartial method is republic bidding, which takes a longer time for the procurement. The quickest way is single source procurement, which is less open, fair, and impartial. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, unfortunately, there is no time for questions. We're already sliding out of the, of the timing. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, there is the question, so we'll translate it to you uh, via the, the chat. So we'll kindly ask you to answer this, if possible. And thank you very much. So we're moving on. Thanks. Uh, I'm no, Ms. Wuhua is the expert of this area and I'm no expert, but if you have uh, some question and you can tell me and I'd like to write down and uh, pass it to her and uh, see her if can answer, uh, she can answer the question uh, later, <laughs> okay? Thank you, thank you very okay. much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, can I leave now? For your decision to take participation in our conference. And we will be happy to see you in our future uh, events. Sorry. The colleagues, um, I would like to give the floor uh, to our colleague from Kazakhstan. A uh, retired uh, judge of the North Kazakhstan Regional Court, PhD in law, Inessa Kuanova. She is now at a very important event. That's why we have to make changes uh, in our schedule. And then we have to listen to her first and then to other speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. I, can, uh, I hope that you can hear me and see me well. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, can you just lower your camera a little bit? Uh, yes, yeah. excellent. Uh, I uh, will uh, switch on the presentation. Uh, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Yes. Colleagues, I welcome you all. Uh, and uh, let's uh, look um, at three main uh, issues uh, on public uh, uh, procurement in Kazakhstan. First, um, let's look at changes uh, which were done during this uh, last year. Also, let's uh, look at law enforcement practice on procurement. Um, I try to find a very interesting example. And thirdly, uh, these are trends uh, to improve uh, legislation about uh, 
uh, state purchases. Uh, where, uh, what is the direction here? Let's start from the first question. Uh, in uh, the legislation of Kazakhstan, we don't have such uh, a term public procurement, but we have state procurement. And uh, we have um, such uh, uh, a saying, uh, a state uh, procurement uh, in the aspect of state sector. And uh, there is a list uh, of uh, subjects uh, of quasi-state sector. So uh, what uh, that we don't have this term? Public procurement, it's not a problem that we don't have such a term. But actually, it means um, that uh, this problem is not only um, the problem of understanding or terminology uh, here. Uh, the problem is uh, deeper. It means uh, the public state procurement uh, and uh, uh, procurements of other uh, subjects are rather far from each other. And uh, law enforcement, their law enforcement is so different that it cannot allow uh, to combine them in one uh, thing. Speaking about the law itself, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, the law about state uh, procurement was uh, adopted in 1915, uh, there were uh, so many amendments done here uh, because it means uh, that, uh, that uh, there is always attention to it. But for participants of state procurements uh, uh, for players, it's not convenient when rules of uh, the game uh, is, are always changing and the changing quite dramatically. What um, are our main uh, trends uh, of uh, development in state purchases, state procurement? I can uh, here identify four main directions uh, in accordance with which uh, we have improvement of legislation in Kazakhstan. First of all, centralization of state procurement. Secondly, digitalization of this uh, process of state procurement and third, um, support of domestic uh, producers. Um, uh, fourth, uh, we can see uh, these attempts uh, to synchronize legal regulation of state uh, procurement and other types of procurement in this quasi-state sector. Uh, I, I would like to ground all of this uh, thesis in short. Centralization of state procurement has been um, started since 2014 uh, and the um, centralized uh, procurement system was created for this. Um, the system of certain bodies which are authorized to uh, conduct um, a state procurements uh, but it uh, coexisted with other organizers of state procurement. In 2017, uh, the decree of the president and um, it was instructed to implement uh, the united system of state procurement in accordance with the principle of centralized uh, system 2020 we had a pilot project which is called centralized uh, state procurement and um, then um, we can see um, the result of this pilot project a number of organizers uh, of state procurement reduced from 25000 to um, about 500 organizations. I think this is an extremely um, good effect because um, 500 organizations um, means uh, uh, that um, uh, this um, organization of procurement can be done better than 25,000. And those um, as managers um, uh, who have uh, quite um, uh, poor understanding of state procurement and they make a lot of mistakes. Uh, next direction, digitalization of state procurement. In Kazakhstan, procurement uh, uh, has always uh, has been done for a long time through a web portal, but this uh, functionality of a web portal is always expanding. For example, some part of activities of state procurement is done by automatic web portal. For example, we have a tender and the protocol of this um, um, auction uh, is made uh, automatically uh, by the portal. Nobody makes any amendments. Um, and it means uh, that for those uh, who disagree 
<coughs> or unsatisfied with the results of state procurement, and there are less legal grounds uh, to dispute auction itself and protocol. Uh, what can you dispute there if nobody will interfere there? That's why um, it leads to shortening of disputes um, about state procurement. Uh, since the 1st of January 2020, we, uh, speaking about um, terminology, we have this notion electronic wallet, and it uh, performs the function of providing an application for participation in the center. And uh, if potentially uh, the uh, potential supplier did not win, automatically web portal uh, returns this um, uh, application uh, provision to back to the uh, electronic wallet. Uh, this is automatic process and it excludes uh, some subjective uh, moments which could be here. Regarding support of domestic um, uh, producer, here we have quite a good example. In Kazakhstan now, we have construction and reconstruction of Turkestan city. Uh, this is um, a very important um, place for Kazakhstan. We expanded uh, uh, authorities of the government. Now it can define uh, uh, persons um, uh, for buying, for procurement from one source. And there are 145 uh, Kazakhstan firms. Uh, the um, government indicated Kazakhstan uh, producers. Besides, uh, you seen uh, this is national um, uh, chamber of um, entrepreneurs uh, leads a register of domestic producers on the basis of two types of certificates. Uh, Kazakhstan standard Kazakhstan certificate and industrial certificate. And um, the suppliers, uh, producers of domestic uh, uh, goods uh, can uh, have some benefits to access uh, of um, uh, participation in uh, um, state procurement. Regarding the fourth direction about clo getting about closing of state procurements and public procurement, uh, uh, here we have this um, already started. Um, we um, already have some changes uh, uh, in legislation about state property uh, and national well being, in particular. In this law, now we have such. Uh, notions as potential suppliers, operators uh, of uh, um, information system, then the commission. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, that uh, uh, this uh, quasi uh, state uh, procurements became closer to state procurements. Uh, but uh, speaking that uh, this, we can't say that this is one thing. We have, and the, the, we can't say now that we have um, the unified system of public procurement, which it's uh, quite far from this. We can't say so now. Next, the court uh, practice. I uh, can uh, show you some particular examples how pandemic influenced on our suppliers and organizers who. Um, uh, try uh, to conduct state procurement in such a way uh, that they try to do this from one source. We have um, a reducing uh, of uh, this grounding uh, to make procurement from one source. And we start to invent uh, some other things. And recently we had such a case uh, when uh, uh, COO, uh, it has a patent uh, uh, it, it is a patent owner of four, of four utilities. Uh, what utilities do we mean here? Uh, these are disinfectants. Uh, disinfectants. Um, uh, they all bought uh, this from one source, dis disinfectant um, appliances from this uh, TOO company. And they uh, referred to the Article 39 of the law about state procurement. And I can... Um, 
refer to this. That is way from one source on the be applied in cases of uh, buying goods, services, which are objects of intellectual property from persons uh, having exclusive rights uh, regarding uh, apply uh, regarding bought goods and services. And this TOO uh, organization have have a patent uh, for this. Uh, um, things uh, uh, so um, uh, they bought uh, these uh, things at the price uh, two three uh, times higher uh, than it is um, offered uh, by other supplies. What is a disinfectant? Uh, some um, uh, spirit um, uh, content uh, solutions, uh, plus minus, maybe some chemical uh, contents compounds about disinfectants uh, cannot be exclusive, you know. And that's uh, why suppliers who lost uh, this um, procurement, uh, they, he applied to authorities and he indicated uh, that you understand uh, this uh, law in the wrong way, uh, also can be a patent owner uh, for other disinfectants with other ingredients. And what does it mean? Uh, here we speak uh, about protection of intellectual uh, uh, property and uh, this uh, legal protection is given not to this particular good disinfectant but to the technology, uh, to the way to make it. Uh, this dispute uh, now is still going on. Uh, two authorized bodies um, considered this and made different conclusions. Uh, some say, one say, yes, we are mistaken, and the other is says wrong. Um, we, we, uh, everything is good. Uh, so, um, as it seems to me, it's quite interesting. Uh, and uh, I don't know how to settle uh, this dispute because uh, interpretation of the law is quite uh, uh, important uh, of, for uh, having this integrity of the legislation and court practice. Regarding uh, the third issue on improving of state uh, procurement, where are we going here? Uh, recently, uh, the president of the Kazakhstan Republic paid attention uh, to a low quality of roads. Uh, you know, we have the problem full and roads, and this is not only a Russian problem, it's a global problem. And uh, when we analyzed this problem with um, roads, uh, the National uh, Chamber of Entrepreneurs, Atomikian, called Atomikian, uh, understood that the supplier uh, for road construction is chosen in accordance with uh, cheapness criteria. But if we look at the international uh, uh, practice, priority is given to other criteria, for example, ecological, innovative, and other criteria of suppliers, but not uh, the cheapest one is chosen. And uh, that's why roads in Europe are, uh, you know, quite uh, different, uh, are, is, are a far cry from what we have in Kazakhstan. And uh, now we have um, a proposal, and uh, we already initiated it, um, that we need to change uh, this um, directly in the law. And we need to say that uh, this state procurement should be done on this food tender, and we should have some minimum uh, standards uh, uh, and criteria requirements, uh, for example, material, uh, uh, what materials should be used, uh, uh, maybe, um, uh, suppliers should have uh, a concrete factory uh, in ownership. There should be um, some criteria and uh, it, sh it should not be chosen on the basis of the cheapest price here. Regarding international cooperation, here one of the main problem is that um, in the in states uh, of Europe, uh, Europe, uh, um, Eurozest, uh, uh, we don't have uh, digitalization here. Kazakhstan has good digitalization, but our partners are still uh, at the beginning of this. Uh, and uh, this complicates uh, the procedure of participation uh, uh, in uh, state procurement of these other states. Uh, uh, Kazakhstan is the chairman um, here in Yevrozes, uh, uh, and uh, it means uh, that this problem uh, uh, can be um, considered and some uh, 
measures uh, uh, can be uh, can be undertaken uh, and uh, we should uh, uh, settle these issues uh, uh, how we can participate um, in this uh, procurement uh, these are the main uh, thesis uh, which i wanted to convey uh, thank you for your attention if you have questions i'm uh, ready to answer them thank you very much uh, your presentation was very interesting uh, uh, dear colleagues, um, uh, I would like uh, to answer the questions which we have now in chat. Uh, so, uh, now um, we have many questions um, regarding uh, some spheres uh, which, uh, uh, which have our mo monographs, uh, collective monographs. Uh, uh, and why am I speaking about this now? I don't want uh, to send you these books because now we're writing a new book uh, and uh, the prevailing number of um, foreign presenters, foreign speakers uh, um, are interested in this book and they are co-authors of this book. It will be uh, produced uh, in summer of this year. Uh, and... Um, uh, it will be uh, in uh, two languages, in Russian and in English. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now we have, uh, we know that you know you have a very important code, uh, code, code uh, dispute, and you should go to this code. Uh, uh, so now um, let's um, go on, move to Indonesia, Indonesia. And uh, in Kazakhstan, we have uh, the trend of digitalization. And uh, earlier, uh, there, there was, were 500 uh, players uh, and earlier 25,000. Uh, so in Indonesia, also we have a centralized system of procurement. Uh, uh, and Arya um, Afrianish uh, told about this one year ago about it. And uh, now we'll uh, listen to our Indonesian uh, colleague uh, uh, with pleasure. He has a new presentation today. Arya, you're welcome. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much, uh, Kusma. Ladies and gentlemen. Спасибо thank you. Uh, th uh, thank you for uh, this very warm welcome. And uh, please uh, bear with me because I cannot speak Russian as the uh, previous uh, speakers. Uh, but someday I will learn uh, maybe some words of Russian and hopefully I can uh, visit uh, Russian someday. So as uh, Kusma mentioned, uh, yeah, last year uh, I spoke in, in this uh, uh, event. And what a time flies, right? A year ago, and now uh, we're here we're back again. So um, if I may share to you, I'm just uh, gonna be uh, very brief because um, uh, this is something that uh, I really want to, I really don't want to uh, uh, repeat of my presentation last year, but I want to share about you about how um, crucial uh, the enforcement uh, of uh, cases uh, in regards with the um, uh, public procurement in Indonesia, because as Kuzma said that uh, a centralized uh, uh, regulation of a public procurement, and then the form, the vulnerabilities uh, of uh, the case of public procurement is even uh, bigger. Yeah. So um, today I'm going to speak. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to speak mostly about a case. Yeah. I just want to share you how. Uh, 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 how the case in public procurement uh, is uh, going to typically happen in Indonesia. And uh, I would like also to uh, highlight some of the provisions and, and also to uh, uh, give you the idea of uh, the recent cases uh, regarding the public procurement, even in the, in the, in the public uh, uh, era. Uh, and, and lastly, I just want to uh, make some uh, highlights uh, that probably uh, useful, uh, especially for Indonesia and also for maybe others that could be uh, uh, taken into uh, uh, consideration. So, um, yes, uh, public procurement uh, in Indonesia is still uh, becoming a major economic drive because uh, we are not quite um, 
uh, depend on the uh, uh, private sector in terms of the uh, economic uh, uh, development. So uh, whenever the ministries or the uh, government institution make a procurement, uh, it uh, relates to a very huge uh, number of a budget. Yeah. And uh, in order to uh, taking care of this uh, really uh, crucial, uh, um, let's say, processes, uh, we have a national uh, institution that's specific uh, for uh, overseeing and having the regulation for the uh, public procurement. We call it the uh, LKPP or the National Public Procurement Agency. Yeah. However, however, uh, the corruption. Uh, um, crimes uh, in the public procurement is uh, still massive um, and then uh, uh, there was uh, uh, in, in this uh, presentation I would like to uh, uh, take to you the case um, of uh, oops sorry um, uh, there's a, a procurement case that uh, involving uh, our then uh, Minister of Health uh, as a suspect of corruption uh, uh, as a corruption uh, of a medical uh, uh, procurement, a medical equipment procurement, yeah. And uh, the case uh, was handled uh, by the Indonesian uh, Corruption uh, Commission, yeah. Uh, we call it as a KPK, which is a special uh, 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 enforcement law enforcement agency, and uh, uh, we we uh, noted that uh, the approximate state loss in this case only uh, involved uh, 5.8 billion rupiah or um, equal to 400 uh, million uh, US dollar. That's for a single case. Uh, so this is one of many cases that involve in, in public uh, procurement. So uh, you know that uh, how is the uh, uh, vulnerability of the public procurement to corruption? So, as I said, uh, uh, the defendant or the accused is our then uh, for, uh, health minister. Her name uh, is uh, Siti Fadila Supari. She is the Indonesia's uh, health minister for two, 2004 and 2009 uh, period. And in this period, uh, she uh, was allegedly uh, uh, doing the, uh, the corruption. So this is the chronology. Uh, when um, uh, we, uh, the, uh, the commission, you know, the corruption, uh, anti-corruption uh, was uh, investigating the defendant's uh, uh, time during the health minister. And the KPK found that uh, she abusing her authority as the minister yeah, uh, to have a direct appointments to the medical equipment uh, procurements yeah, project. And the trial uh, uh, begin in 2017. And in this trial, uh, the, the, the then minister uh, admitted that she recommended uh, the direct appointment of uh, the partners to the work of procuring medical uh, equipment for handling uh, for the bird flu uh, in 2006. And this recommendation uh, was given uh, via the Secretary General of the Ministry of Health. Yeah. And, and then uh, in this uh, direct uh, in appointment, the Indo Pharma, the, the, the state owned uh, company, uh, earned a profit of 1.5 uh, billion uh, rupiah. And then at the same time, given the loss to the uh, state, around uh, 6.1 uh, billion rupiah or equal to uh, 420 million uh, US dollar. And for this reason, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the bribe money that uh, city receive is uh, around 20 traveler checks worth of uh, 500 million or equal to uh, 35,000 US dollar and a similar cover check worth of uh, around uh, 100,000 US dollar. Uh, and uh, unique uh, in the situation, uh, not only uh, the minister herself, but uh, the husband and also the, the, the daughter uh, of the minister also received uh, the money from this uh, process uh, that equals to uh, 8,200 uh, uh, US uh, dollar and uh, uh, 34,000 uh, US dollar. 
And in the trial, uh, the minister then uh, proven guilty uh, because of this uh, 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 made a direct uh, appointment uh, without a proper uh, uh, mechanism of procurement uh, that uh, take event in 2005. And uh, this uh, money to bribe uh, the minister uh, is given to revise uh, the budget and also to the uh, uh, recommendation uh, for the winner of the uh, procurement. And finally, uh, the judges uh, found uh, uh, the minister guilty and sentenced her to four years in prison and fined uh, around 15,000 uh, US dollar and subsidiary uh, to the two months uh, prison uh, uh, in jail. So um, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, process in terms of the uh, uh, legal proceedings, uh, we can see that uh, the KPK, the, uh, the Corruption Commission, uh, uh, play a very important role because uh, KPK is start uh, handling the the low level uh, corruption uh, case, uh, and uh, when this uh, case came uh, into uh, radar, uh, it creates a what do you call it a, a, a many of uh, what do you call it uh, many. Uh, political uh, turbulence because uh, uh, Siti Supari is, is also uh, uh, can be uh, considered as a, a very high uh, political uh, profile uh, at that time and up until now, uh, until uh, she was verdict in, into this case. So uh, in this uh, case, uh, the law was, uh, uh, of course, mainly uh, violating on the law of uh, corruption. Yeah and also about uh, uh, our uh, criminal code because uh, she's, she's uh, using her uh, authority yeah, to, um, what do you call it, uh, to make a special arrangement uh, of this uh, public procurement in terms of the medical uh, equipment. So uh, I forgot to mention that uh, during this procurement, it was during the, 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 the period of the uh, bird flu uh, or do we call it as a Singaporean flu at that time. So it's kind of uh, similar to uh, happening right now. And also uh, in terms of the uh, uh, law on the corruption, uh, uh, City also um, uh, found guilty that uh, she makes uh, a grant or uh, arrangement of grant and promises uh, in terms of uh, her authority as the Minister of Health. Uh, and now uh, we'll continue to uh, how we make a similarity to the current uh, situation and how uh, it's going to even more uh, vulnerable in terms of public procurement. Uh, in last year's uh, national budget, uh, the government uh, has made a special allocation uh, for the COVID management uh, around 60 trillion rupiah or 4.2 uh, million, uh, sorry, 4.2 billion, sorry, this is a mistake, 4.2 billion uh, US dollar, and then slightly increase uh, in uh, this year into 4.9 billion uh, US dollar. So it's a very big uh, 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 money, and it's also uh, uh, many um, watchdog or uh, civil society organization uh, takes notes that so many procurement during the, the, the pandemic uh, uh, were uh, conducted uh, without uh, transparency and without a proper uh, procurement. Yeah. So, uh, and this is uh, a proven, yeah, because uh, of course, as you may know in all over the world that uh, the state needs to procure the vaccines, the, the medicine, the, and the medical equipment, uh, especially, yeah. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, situation where the money involved is so big uh, and the players is uh, not that many. So, and, and the government is need to make it the process even faster. So it creates a more, even more vulnerable situation uh, of the corruption. And unfortunately, the another high uh, profile corruption case was actually occurred uh, uh, last year, where uh, uh, when our uh, social affairs minister 
uh, were fa was found uh, guilty uh, to corrupt uh, the social assistance uh, fund, uh, which is uh, the fund is uh, intended to give the uh, those who are um, uh, quit from their jobs and they need to uh, uh, give an assistance from the, the government. And uh, the, the amount of this money is really huge as well. But the, the trial is not begin yet because the KPK is still under the investigation. And of course, uh, similar to uh, uh, Minister uh, Health uh, previously, uh, they were charged uh, with the law on uh, eradication of corruption in conjunction with uh, our criminal code. Yeah. So finally, finally, uh, comes to my critical notes. Um, of course, uh, Indonesia has designed and enforced numerous regulations to secure proceedings of the public procurement. And this is especially with the existence of the uh, National Public Procurement Agency, uh, to, which is tasked to formulate government procurement and give a public procurement technical guidance, and as well as, as, well as the public procurement special certificate examination. But given the circumstances and also the uh, 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 the need to uh, having a faster uh, procurement, uh, the corruption is even uh, 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 what do you call it uh, a massive uh, uh, happening uh, uh, with with whenever the, the the money is involved. And uh, again, not only uh, the previous cases that we have discussed, but then our Minister of Social Affairs uh, uh, involved uh, in the current uh, situation as well. So. I guess uh, Indonesia and maybe uh, other countries who may have experienced a similar uh, to Indonesia uh, uh, needs to have a more robust uh, uh, supervision and also a more, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, efficient, faster, but still uh, very vigilant uh, in terms of uh, 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 preventing any uh, corruption that can happen uh, in the public procurement, uh, especially in the times of uh, emergency. Terima kasih, spasibo. Adia Saul, and maybe we can have uh, for the discussion. Thank you very much. Spasibo. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. It was very really Thank you so much. Uh, Some piano music on the background. Are you at yes. the station? Yes, he, uh, my, my son is uh, having a practice uh, oh, okay. <laughs> piano lesson. Yeah. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, I just have a question, a uh, small question for you. Um, according to corruption, uh, do you think that digitalization of the procurement, of the public procurement, will uh, decrease the cases of the corruption? Is it the poss possibility for uh, the transparency increase and the control increase? Yes, indeed. Uh, the the process of the procurement, indeed, now we are, we are having more and more uh, online. But then uh, it's because of this uh, abuse of power, uh, especially with the high uh, uh, position of the in within the ministry. It it it's usually uh, makes the the system not so well. Uh, the digital or the online process is good, but then uh, when when the person it, him or herself is trying to abuse the power, then it's really hard to, uh, uh, to prevent. Uh, however, I was thinking that uh, maybe uh, uh, the power of uh, uh, the minister or maybe the higher ranks uh, in, within the, uh, the, the government needs to have uh, another, uh, maybe uh, a position or another uh, counterpart that can, uh, what do you call it, has, has a, a counterpart to check and balance, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, what do you call it, this uh, authority in terms of the public procurement. Because with this very uh, big uh, uh, responsibility and big uh, uh, discretion, uh, it's really uh, make open, uh, wide open way to corruption. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank no you worries. for your presentation. No worries. Thank you. Looking forward. Thank you. See you at our next uh, conference and yes. uh, I hope to see you personally in Moscow. Yes, next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. My dear colleagues, uh, allow me to uh, say something about a few words about the Indonesian expertise. And uh, Indonesia exercises the uh, 
an instant procurement uh, for the organization of the R&D conference, uh, which uh, gives us uh, a good reason uh, to organize the public procurement uh, this way. And let's just move to India gradually. And we have our Indian partners here with us. And last year, our uh, colleague uh, uh, Kumar made a presentation and he dwelt upon the Indian experience uh, at the COVID era and uh, some measures were undertaken and that was the ban for purchasing the uh, foreign made mobile phones and only Indian uh, manufactured phones are to be uh, procured. Uh, but it wasn't the only measure of that sort uh, for procurements and allow me to give the floor to our colleague uh, Kumar Chaudhuri. Uh, the advocate partner competition law practice group Haitan and this company LLP India. Dear colleagues, the floor is yours. Uh, may I start now? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kuzma and Stanislav. It was wonderful since morning. I have been uh, listening to, watching all the very interesting development. I would definitely admit that the year before this one, last year, I think it was again June of 2020 when we made this presentation. And I was a little reluctant to as to how the overlap between the public procurement and competition law would really go well with the audience. But this year, I am very confident because since morning, I have the opportunity to listen to the Japanese and the South Korean colleagues here. They spoke very, very openly that the competition is likely to be harmed if at all the public procurement is flawed. So that is what has given us strength to really take whatever we spoke last year to a next level. So my colleague Ibad would be uh, making a short presentation for my portion and then he would be taking up the next portion. Thank you, Yibad. So can you move to the next slide, please? Yes, so public procurement in India and for that matter in any other country is definitely a contract because it is a contract between the government, the procuring agency and the private parties who would like to participate. So it has been governed by the Contract Act for years. It is nothing new in the realm of Contract Act in India. Then we have got constitutional provisions also in the uh, Indian constitution as to how the business, that is the trade and commerce will operate in India with reasonable restrictions. So naturally the constitutional guarantee for a freedom of trade and commerce is also having a reasonable restriction which the government may like to impose. So the constitutional provision also empowers the procuring authority to go ahead and make the procurement. These are the basic fundamental laws behind the procurement. Then there are guidelines which are in the form of judgments. The judgments when I'm talking as the form of law is I'm talking about only the Supreme Court judgments, which would bind all inferior courts in India. Then we have got central legislation. When I say central legislation, I mean federal legislation. We have got states and the state legislations, and then there are administrative policies and of course, as on today, we don't have any umbrella legislation with regard to public procurement. Ibad, next slide, please. Yes. So when I say constitutional guarantee, I'm talking about one of the frameworks of the constitutional fundamental rights, that is Article 14, where the judiciary had time and again pronounced and propounded the theory that there cannot be any arbitrary act by a public authority in whatever business they engage in. So some judgments we have culled out to show that the Supreme Court in many cases have actually tried to enunciate a ratio which would show that there should be fairness in dealing and people should be treated fairly between equals. So Article 14 of the Constitution is one of the fundamentals, fundamental rights in India available to the citizen so whenever I'm talking about public procurement, I'm actually talking about taxpayers because end of the day, whenever the government procures, they're actually utilizing the revenue of the government to pay to the suppliers, which means that the taxpayers are directly affected 
if the public procurement is not properly regulated. That is one of the fundamental principles of equality before law. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes. So what when I say the constitutional guarantee, the Supreme Court judgment, the Constitution of India, the provisions of Article 14, all of that is fine. But end of the day, where is the procedural rule? The procedural rule is the administrative rule, which actually takes to the authority who is intending to have some kind of a public procurement. These are called general financial rules, which has been amended in 2017, very late amendment, very recent amendment. These amendments are actually trying to bridge several legislations into one, ensuring that all stakeholders are equally placed in the process of public procurement. As I keep on saying that it is the taxpayers who are the worst, if the public procurement is flawed, that is what is actually putting us together to have an uniform process of procurement. Most important set of administrative guidelines on public procurement, the executive instructions are always there to be observed. And this was issued for the first time when India got independence in 1947. And from time to time with the dynamism in the market, the changes in the market forces, the procurement policies keep on getting amended. Ultimately in 2017, the last amendment which has actually brought about made a lot of interesting changes, which I'll just walk you through as I go forward. Ibar, next slide. Yes. So rule 163 of the general financial rules typically talk about there should be two bidding system. When I say two bidding system, I mean one should be a technical bid and the other should be a financial bid. Both these bids will have to be submitted as per the procedure in a sealed cover and it has to be first opened, the technical bid. If the suppliers or the participants are able to get through the technical bid where there would be a basic minimum standards laid down by the department that this is what the technical standard should be. And once they have crossed the threshold of the technical standards, only thereafter the financial bids of those people who have qualified the technical bid would be opened. Combination of the two, with the intent of keeping the financials at the lowest, the highest technical bid should be considered. But it may so happen in some cases that the party who may have actually got highest marks in the technical bid may have higher financial bid. The government has the ability to consider that rather than the person who has given the lower bid. That is what is the purpose of the technical bid. It depends upon how do you really manage the ultimate analysis of the bidding process, which would be translated into a reality in a project. So the technical bid becomes very important in some cases where the financial bid may take the second stage. But end of the day, the government would always try to have the financial bid as one of the main considerations. So as I said that the two bids, they will likely to be opened by a select committee of government officials, and then they follow the principles in such a manner that if at all tomorrow there can be some litigations against the procurer or the people involved in that, it should be able to really justify that. So the due process issues are very strictly followed in this process. Next slide. So a very interesting, there is a very strict code of integrity. There's something very integrity uh, packed, they call it in the procurement process, where the procurer and the suppliers, they would be entering into a pact, an agreement, which will ensure that both the parties are having a very strong integrity parameters while entering into this agreement. In the process of any breach of this integrity pact, the penalties and the blacklisting would be very high. So naturally the process of integrity pact is one of the cardinal principles of public procurement now in India. It applies to both the procurer and the bidder. The procurer is uh, having a risk of being faced a corruption charges and bidders can face a situation of bid rigging. They may be colluding, they may be repeatedly rotating the bids. All of that is against them and procurers are vulnerable against corruption charges. So this integrity pact actually ensures that both the parties are able to abide by the process of law. Uh, the sectors also are having some very specific uh, procurement legislations. 
the defense procurement procedure 2016 it, it has a manual of 2009 which has been upgraded to a procedure in 2016 new exploration licensing policy for the energy sector preference for domestically manufactured electronic products 2013 national policy of biofuels and the strategic plan for new renewable energy and pharmaceutical purchase policy of 2013 all these are directly indicative of a direct public interface whenever there is a procurement by a government agency when i say government agency we have state owned enterprises who also are abiding by the principles of public procurement as laid down by government of india similarly the ministries and their departments are also to be governed by the policies and the principles laid down by the government in the gfr and other constitutional provisions yeah you are next slide so what are the important legislations which over the years have really been changing the landscape of indian public procurement as i said that earlier the things were very different with the markets having changed after the economic liberalization of india in 1991 india signing the wto in 1995 all things started moving towards market power market forces market dynamism consumer welfare stakeholders interest all of these are now within the concept of the total procurement when i say some important legislations i am talking about only the federal legislation competition act which ivad would uh, walk you through as to how this is having an interface with public procurement prevention of corruption act this is of course an old legislation but it does wonderful uh, analysis of how corruptions are possible and how they can be prevented contract act it is a old legacy act of india is still very strong in india it talks about contract which is enforceable in law sales of goods act is again a very old legislation which also governs and right of information act which has come out in 2005 gives rise to transparency in procurement and then the rules regulations which state and the central government from time to time uh, enact and then that also governs the process of procurement i would uh, like to answer any questions but before doing that i would like ibad to take the next uh, portion of our presentation that is the competition act thank you спасибо большое спасибо большое thank you very much manas and uh, uh, do you have a next presentation or you have uh, yeah. no it is uh, next next three four slides ah okay yeah ibad please please go ahead, proceed thank you manas Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Sanis. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope I can be heard clearly. Yeah, you are audible, Ibad. Yes, yeah, so we can hear you. Yes, everything all right. All good. All good. Thank you. So the promotion of efficient uh, efficiency in a public procurement is very crucial and it's very important. And hence, uh, it inevitably becomes the primary objective of any good public procurement policy. Efficiency requires the selection of a qualified bidder and not only a qualified bidder, but the one which can provide the lowest price. And this can be only be achieved if we have a robust competition policy, uh, a, a, a robust competition amongst the bidders and in the whole bidding process. Because curtailing of competition will ultimately lead to the taxpayers' money's money getting wasted. So, uh, so it is essential that there are uh, certain factors are taken into consideration when it comes to a development of any bidding process. And uh, we find that there are some factors which are internal in nature, and there are some factors which are external in nature over which the uh, procurer would, does not have a lot of control. The factors which are internal in nature are factors such as the auction design, the code of integrity, and uh, the blacklisting provisions themselves. And these are a few things which the uh, which the procurer can take care of. However, unfortunately, there are always certain factors which are external in nature and are which, which, uh, which uh, it cannot really be taken uh, care of to, uh, uh, completely by the procurer itself. And that is where the role of a national comp competition regulator comes into picture. 
in fact if i would uh, uh, i should go back one step and uh, and uh, and also convey that the role of a competition agency like the competition commission of india india's national competition regulator is not only limited to the control of competition in the external factors but it also is included in the control of internal factors of any bidding process because the competition commission of india and uh, other competition regulators like uh, the uh, cci they are they also participate and are also advance advocacy and training programs for the procurer and also advocacy programs for the suppliers themselves by conducting road shows and by uh, by uh, by uh, by uh, conveying uh, knowledge to them of the consequences of, uh, of 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 a bid rigging and the severe penal consequences these are all uh, factors which the cci time to time through their road shows and other advocacy programs does uh, inform uh, and train the suppliers as well and uh, in addition to this of course uh, the cci is uh, the, the competition regulator like the cci is also involved with the public uh, with the procurer uh, to uh, in in designing of a robust uh, of, of a robust bidding process this it does through uh, at, uh, from time to time by various other government departments so uh, we we understand that as of now the cci is looking at the government of india's uh, model concession agreements and are uh, trying to uh, and and are trying to uh, develop and make it better so as to ensure that uh, those concession agreements take into concern the various uh, competition concerns which uh, may be present so as i mentioned the competition uh, commission of india which uh, has which gains all of its powers from the competition act uh, uh, is the ex uh, is the exclusive uh, enforcer of uh, the provisions of the competition act and the commission has extensive powers uh, at all stages of, uh, of of a case before the commission so it has uh, wide ranging powers of investigation which uh, uh, which include uh, powers such as uh, uh, which includes powers such as calling for information documents and also uh, taking evidence on oath but uh, its powers are not only limited to the powers of inquiry and investigation but also extend to uh, the power of uh, levying a penalty on uh, a very severe penalty and um, uh, and uh, putting in place other remedies uh, when it uh, comes to cases where uh, the cci has confirmed that there is a contravention and the cci through its case laws has developed a very robust jurisprudence specifically in cases of public procurements so we have had cases like the public sector insurance case the delhi jal port case where the cci dealt with certain nitty gritties of uh, the procurement process and uh, and issues of bid rigging so for instance in the public sector insurance case the cci was dealing with uh, Uh, with tenders of the government of Kerala, where uh, it was alleged that uh, the public sector insurance companies, and when I see when I say public sector insurance companies, I mean to say insurance companies which are owned by the, in, which in these cases were uh, insurance companies hundred owned hundred percent by the government of India. Uh, so these insurance companies, it was alleged that uh, they pre-decided the government of Kerala's uh, insurance activities related uh, tender. and uh, uh, essentially they uh, um, uh, essentially they rigged uh, the tender uh, but however uh, when it came before the cci they tried to argue that they were a single economic entity and hence uh, because of the fact that they were all owned by the government of india however uh, the cci distinguished uh, and 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 essentially they said that uh, there couldn't be an agreement between uh, two or more entities if they belong to the same ultimate parent the cci however uh, found out after after its investigation that at no point in time had they consulted the relevant uh, ministries of the government and when it came to submission of the bids they had taken their own independent decision at the company level and hence cci did not exempt them under the single economic entity uh, doctrine and uh, did in fact levy hefty penalty on these insurance companies similarly in the delhi jal board case uh, the cci has provided us with uh, a very important clarification that what in cases where in a given tender uh, a bid bids are being placed by two group entities which have the ultimate same parent 
So uh, how how do they have to act uh, with respect to the tender and what with respect to the competition between them? The CCI has clarified that even if uh, tender uh, bids are being submitted by companies which are group entities, they cannot collude uh, uh, in those tenders and their bids have to be completely separate. So essentially in the Delhi Jal Board case, the CCI found that uh, two group companies had submitted two separate bids. However, uh, the CCI found that at uh, while deciding the bid, they had discussed uh, with each other the uh, important and sensitive information, including the financial aspects of the bid. So this, according to the CCI, was a clear contravention of uh, the provisions of the Competition Act and was a typical case of a bid rigging. And it cannot, uh, once again, uh, the CCI clarified that these companies who may be uh, group companies and having the ultimate same parent cannot take the benefit of the single economic doctrine entity, which suggests that within the uh, uh, that uh, that within a group of companies there may be communication which cannot be termed as anti-competitive agreements. In addition, it is very important to note that the provisions of the Competition Act also include whistleblower-like provisions, which are uh, which have been further uh, detailed out in the Lesser Penalty Regulations of the Competition Commission of India. So, under the Lesser Penalty Regulations of the Competition Commission of India, uh, one of the participants of the uh, uh, of the cartel can come up to the CCI and request the CCI to impose a lesser penalty on the car on that cartel participants in lieu of they providing uh, robust evidence to the CCI to establish a finding of cartelization. Very interestingly, the first decided case of the CCI in respect of the lesser penalty regulations was a case of uh, was a case involving public procurement. And uh, so essentially the CCI was investigating a uh, a tender from uh, from the uh, from from the Indian Railways for uh, brushless fans, which uh, would have been used in the uh, trains of uh, Indian Railways, uh, and uh, while the, the investigation was uh, underway, one of the parties came up and uh, they uh, they they confirmed that uh, there was indeed a cartel and they submitted sufficient evidence before the CCI, and accordingly the CCI did grant a lesser penalty uh, to the lesser penalty applicants. It is very important to note that the CCI over the period of time has developed a very uh, has, has developed a very robust methodology to find out uh, cartelization in uh, uh, in cases of tenders and uh, and to confirm cases of uh, bid rigging uh, because the C, uh, because the CCI has time and time and again repeated that uh, cartel is an offense which uh, entails very hefty penalties and the parties know that uh, it is because of this reason that the parties will take uh, will go to lengths uh, the cartelists will go to lengths to uh, to hide any evidence uh, of uh, the cartelization and therefore the CCI says that uh, at many times it will be crucial that the CCI relies on circumstantial and economic and on economic evidence rather than on direct evidence because there may not be any direct evidence in these cases. Uh, so CCI has time and again uh, relied on call and SMS detailed records. So uh, there have been instances where the CCI found that closer to the date of submission of the bid, the calls between the competitors increased. And, uh, uh, and those calls suddenly once again decreased when the bid was submitted. So CCI considered the, this as one of the plus factors uh, in its analysis. Similarly, the CCI also time and again uh, has reviewed uh, email dumps of the marketing pers personnel of the suppliers to find out if, if, if there was anything which, uh, which they were discussing over email. So these are all things which uh, the suppliers need to keep in mind that uh, essentially CCI has wide ranging uh, invest, uh, investigate uh, powers of investigation. And uh, accordingly, um, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to get away with uh, cases where, uh, you know, there have been cartelization and there have been discussion uh, of, regarding the financial bits amongst the competitors over emails, over calls, or even uh, in certain cases over WhatsApp messages. 
in addition to the circumstantial evidence which the CCI uses, such as call and SMS detailed records, uh, so th uh, there have been instances where the CCI found that the bid had been submitted from the same IP address, so which uh, cl uh, which uh, clearly brought out that uh, you know while uh, the bids were being submitted in name of two separate competitors, but it was being submitted from the same place. So these are other circumstantial uh, evidences which the CCI does take into consideration, and in addition to this, they also take into consideration economic evidence. So essentially, uh, suppose a, a very similar uh, a price uh, of uh, the price is quoted by different competitors the cci would go then go into the uh, the cost of production of each of uh, these competitors to find if there is any i mean if the amount quoted by them uh, has uh, can be reflected into the cost of production if it is not reflected then uh, the cci considers that as one of the uh, other plus factors which it takes into consideration by confirming a finding of contravention In terms of the uh, the amount of uh, public procurement in India, with, uh, uh, which is uh, I mean, uh, which forms a, a part of the larger GDP, uh, it's quite high. It's about it's estimated to be about 30% of the entire GDP of the country, and uh, in uh, and hence it it is very important, and it's recognized that in India, public procurement still remains very important. Uh, however, with uh, the pandemic uh, the uh, government uh, and the, then the various government departments have been very quick uh, to adopt electronically backed methods uh, including putting in place a government e marketplace similarly i must also mention that the cci also has been very quick to adopt to the new circumstances which surround all of us and uh, accordingly, the CCI does now allow electronic filings and are conducting virtual hearings. And uh, more specifically regarding the pandemic, the CCI uh, came up with an advisory uh, um, um, about more than one year ago when the first wave hit uh, all of us in April itself. And the CCI clarified that the safeguards uh, for the companies uh, are already inbuilt within the Competition Act. And uh, uh, but of course, CCI uh, said that uh, we are aware that there will be more joint collaborations between uh, various companies during the time of the pandemic because of the changes in the supply and demand patterns. But uh, the CCI said that companies must be careful uh, in uh, those collaborations. Of course, they can take into consideration all of those collaborations which are necessary to ensure a continued supply and uh, which are reasonable. But still, uh, the CCI cautioned uh, the business houses that they must not take uh, advantage of the situation and accordingly remain compliant with the provisions of the act. And so far as uh, the, uh, the economic effects of the pandemic are concerned, there are already inbuilt provisions under the Competition Act, which take, into, take that into consideration. Accordingly, in its practice also, the CCI, while, imposition, while imposing penalty, has uh, been careful and has recognized that uh, financially, because of the pandemic, some of the players, which may have been found to be uh, contravening the act, uh, are uh, not in a good position. And accordingly, the CCI has been lenient when it comes to imposition of penalty to the extent that, and more particularly in cases of small and medium enterprises, the CCI has gone to the extent of imposing, not imposing any penalty on a contravening party. So as I mentioned, the public procurement uh, in India remains very important and it has been recognized time in and again uh, by the ministries that uh, not only is public procurement important in itself, but it also supports domestic, domestic manufacturing activities and helps in developing a robust uh, you know, value chain. Uh, so because of which the regulation of public procurement in India also remains strict and hence it is very crucial for suppliers to remain aware of the various consequences which their actions could have. Thank you. That would be all and uh, in case there are any questions. Ah. Thank you very much, Shabbat. Thank you. It was very interesting and we uh, want to say that we, uh, we are happy to start our cooperation with you. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we have no time for questions uh, and we must go ahead and... Um, Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much and see you in Moscow you. next year. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank Спасибо. you. Спасибо. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you so much. Now uh, we go to uh, the uh, Southern African Republic, uh, uh, professor um, uh, of Stalin Post um, University, uh, African um, uh, procurement um, uh, system. Uh, uh, Keoli um, uh, Earlier, uh, he had a very interesting presentation. Uh, he spoke uh, that in Africa uh, there is uh, the central platform uh, which uh, also uh, you know uh, takes part in the uh, on the whole continent. Uh, Ten years ago, it, this platform existed. Is it only relative to medical equipment, medical procurement, or some other procurement as well? Uh, uh, we know uh, that uh, Geo will speak, um, and uh, in ten minutes uh, he will have also a lecture. Uh, and then, um, uh, Leo, please, please, you're welcome. Thank you very much, um, uh, Kuzman Stanislav. Um, uh, I, I'm just going to uh, quickly try and share my screen with you. Um, <clears throat> so let me just see if that is working. Whoop, there you go. Okay, let me just quickly see if I can, okay, share my screen. Almost done, we can see your screen. There we go. So hoping that you can see my slides now. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in um, this conference again. A year ago, when we last met for this conference, I spoke about the approach that South Africa is taking to public procurement in its response to the pandemic. Um, and those were, of course, the early days of dealing with the pandemic in South Africa, given that we only recorded our first case in March uh, 2020 and only issued a state of disaster on 15 March 2020, which created the overarching legal basis for government's response to the pandemic. Now, in mid June 2021, we are in the full swing of a third wave of infections and um, vaccinations are, are really only proceeding at a, at a snail's pace. And when the story of South Africa's response to the pandemic is eventually told, there's no doubt that um, public procurement will be a major theme in that story. But unfortunately, it will be part of the dark side of the tale. To say that we have experienced challenges in public procurement in relation to COVID-19 in South Africa is an understatement. Uh, it has been one of the major Achilles heels uh, of our response. And uh, the procurement failures vary from inefficiency to outright abuse and corruption. It has also struck at the highest levels. At present, our National Minister of Health, which is obviously the key government leader managing our response to the pandemic, is on special leave pending an investigation into alleged irregular award of public contracts to suppliers that are um, associated with him and from which he allegedly benefited. The Provincial Minister of Health in the province of Gauteng, which is our most populous um, province and the home to our capital, has already been removed because of irregularities relating to COVID-19 procurement. So you can see the scale um, of the abuse that we are talking about. In my um, brief remarks, I want to focus on some of the key challenges that public procurement has faced in South Africa in response to the pandemic, what they tell us about our um, procurement system and the reforms that are acquired. And in some cases, we uh, are already seeing emerging in this space. So turning first to the absence of an appropriate procurement um, method. Between uh, 19 March and 25 August 2020, uh, that is just over a five month period, the South African National Treasury issued no fewer than four complete sets of instructions containing the specific rules governing public procurement for the pandemic. These varied from reliance on the use of emergency procurement to a specialized central procurement regime to eventually a return to standard procurement rules by September last year. Subsequently, and despite the seeming return to standard procurement rules, Key procurement transactions, such as those relating to the vaccine program, late in 2020 and early this year, were conducted by way of deviations from procurement rules. 
when one considers all these sets of instructions, there's no clear, single, or coordinated approach to the rules governing procurement that emerges. For the most part, procuring entities were instructed to rely on a hodgepodge of existing procurement methods and emergency rules with some adjustments and ad hoc arrangements. The legality of some of these ad hoc arrangements is highly questionable. However, due to the high turnaround of the different sets of rules, no single set of rules was subjected to close scrutiny at this time. Subsequently, it has become clear that this approach greatly facilitated extreme abuse of the procurement system. The core legal issue here is the absence of an appropriate procurement method that could be utilized under the circumstances. Now, while South African procurement law provides for emergency procurement, it does not effectively provide a procurement method or a procurement procedure for such procurement. The rules regarding procurement under emergency conditions amount to little more than abandoning any legal control over procurement transactions. The core rule simply states that if it is impractical to invite competitive bids, the accounting officer may procure the required goods or services by other means. The only real restriction is that the reasons for the departure from the normal rules must be recorded and approved by the entity's accounting officer, that is the administrative head of the entity. In the case of an emergency, the reason is the existence of the emergency itself. And during the pandemic, uh, even this requirement was rendered ineffective uh, in that the National Treasury instructions deemed the pandemic to be an emergency as envisaged under this rule. And hence, that there was automatically a reason for deviating from procured, uh, procurement rules. Once the conditions for a deviation have been met, there are effectively no further procurement rules governing the particular procedures to be followed. In the absence of specific prescripts about what procurement methods to follow, general rules such as administrative law rules apply. However, the experience during the pandemic is undeniably shown that these general rules are ineffective to achieve the constitutional requirements of public contracting in terms of a system that is fair, equitable, transparent, competitive, and cost-effective. A special investigating unit report on procurement of various goods and services relating to COVID-19 between July and November 2020 has shown, for example, a widespread perception that the national state of disaster meant that all procurement is conducted without compliance with any of the normal prescripts regulating public sector procurement, and that various officials merely rubber stamp decisions taken, which resulted in a complete breakdown of checks and balances. Turning secondly to the high levels of decentralization, a second major legal challenge highlighted by COVID-19 procurement flows from the highly decentralized nature of the public procurement system in South Africa. This system, which was implemented from 2000 following the adoption of the Public Finance Management Act and the Municipal Finance Management Act subsequently, resulted in the complete dismantling of the former central state tender board, which procured on behalf of the entire South African state. In its place, all public entities across all three levels of government were mandated to procure for themselves. Today, under this system, every entity takes responsibility for its own procurement in terms of its own supply chain management policy created within the broad regulatory framework. The result is, as a former Minister of Finance has stated, in the present system, procurement transactions take place at too many localities and the contracts are short term. Consequently, there are hundreds of thousands of transactions from a multitude of centers. The procurement regulatory regime does not provide for mandatory centralized procurement. While National Treasury may procure on behalf of multiple public entities in what is called transversal contracting, participation in such contracts is voluntary. It is up to each individual entity to decide whether it wants to join such a centralized procurement approach or continue to procure on its own. The effect of this regulatory design has inter alia been the entrenchment of a decentralized paradigm and at times fierce autonomy in procurement approaches by individual public entities. Not surprisingly, the Special Investigating Unit report found that it appears that certain influential people within provincial government do not trust procurement processes undertaken by national government, 
for example, the procurement process undertaken by National Treasury to secure transversal contracts. This extreme form of decentralization in public procurement, and in particular the absence of any binding instrument to force public entities to into centralized procurement approaches, undercut much needed efforts to coordinate procurement during the pandemic. A fairly ambitious plan to implement a central emergency procurement strategy for PPEs that involved high levels of cooperation between a dedicated combined National Treasury and National Health procurement team, PPE suppliers, and private logistics service providers as implementing agents proved to be short-lived, no doubt because of the lack of any legal basis for such a scheme. And thirdly, the lack of transparency. The most general, this is perhaps the most general legal challenge to experience and procurement to the pandemic. And this was already evident in the early days of the pandemic, for example, procuring PPEs, but it continues to be a major cause for concern today, for example, in the procurement of vaccines. The issue of transparency is linked to the previous two challenges. The lack of a clear procurement method for emergency procurement means that there is also no specific rules that would facilitate transparency in such procurement as is routinely found in rules setting out procurement procedures. The high level of decentralization also undermines transparency, given that procurement takes uh, place at so many different sites, in such high numbers and in terms of varied systems. In fact, the Minister of Finance stated in that same budget speech that I noted earlier, that the result of the hundreds of thousands of transactions from a multitude of centers is that there's very little visibility of all those transactions. Despite the constitutional requirement that public contracting must be done in terms of a system that is amongst others transparent, public procurement law is currently failing to secure such transparency. Part of the problem is certainly systemic. For example, uh, the underdeveloped use of ICTs in South African public procurement and the unreliability of those systems that are indeed used. For example, um, both the uh, government tender bulletin and the e-tender portal digital platforms crashed earlier this year and remain offline. While these are the two mandatory publication platforms for bid invitations and award uh, publication. National Treasury has had to issue a temporary instruction for public entities to use alternative ad hoc publication outlets. The procurement of vaccines to combat the pandemic has also been shrouded in secrecy. Government has indicated that the nego negotiations to procure the vaccines, as well as the contracts that have already been signed, are subject to non-disclosure provisions. However, it is doubtful whether the South African government can legally hide behind such NDAs in respect of public procurement, given the constitutional requirement that public contracting be transparent. It remains to be seen whether more details of these procurements will be made known in due course. Already, there are serious questions about the prices being paid by the South African government compared to those paid by other countries for the same vaccines, as well as liability terms, which all calls for greater transparency. So to conclude, what are the reforms needed? The challenges in public procurement experienced during the pandemic calls for some urgent reforms. And it is an opportune time to consider the lessons learned during the pandemic Given that South Africa was already in the process of a complete overhaul of its public procurement law regime when the pandemic struck. In early 2020, National Treasury published a draft public procurement law for public comment. The challenges that I've highlighted suggest a number of specific reforms that are needed. Firstly, more attention must be given to procurement methods, including specific attention to appropriate methods during emergencies but more generally when standard methods are for whatever reason impractical. The pandemic has shown that simply regulating the decision to deviate from prescribed methods is inadequate. The subsequent procedures followed in such deviation must also be regulated in greater detail. Secondly, an appropriate mechanism must be found to allow for a balance between central coordination of procurement where appropriate and the decentralized paradigm of the South African public finance management system. Since it is unlikely that this basic paradigm will change anytime soon, it is important to carefully consider options for cooperation between procurement entities and how such cooperation can be coordinated. A blunt instrument 
that would attempt to force participation in centralized procurement would not work within the system and is not the answer. And finally, much higher levels of transparency must be established. This includes incorporating open data and open contracting principles into the regulatory regime, making it mandatory across the system to publish such data. This is the area where the pandemic has already generated some positive reform. In response to the patent abuse of the procurement system in 2020, especially relating to procurement of PPEs, national government has introduced publication protocols and systems that publicly report procurement data at levels that we've not seen before and made reporting in terms of these mechanisms mandatory for all national and provincial entities. Also, at least one provincial government has introduced a very comprehensive annual procurement disclosure report, providing detailed information at transactional level on all COVID-19 spending by the province. One hopes that these reforms will not remain restricted to spending for the pandemic, what, but will become the standard post the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, of course, we definitely agree that uh, the pandemic has its own positive moments. Uh, according the the new digital services included in most of public procurement. So uh, how would you describe right now the situation with the pandemic and its effect on um, economic right now at the moment as we see for the second year? Because we expected the the face-to-face -face conference this year and as you see, we're going online once again. So what's your uh, opinion right now? Yeah, it's, it's been devastating in South Africa, and, and we've seen, for example, now going into the third wave, whereas last year in South Africa, government ins, um, instituted quite significant lockdowns and restrictions, the economic situation has now made that impossible because there's just too much economic loss on the back of those kind of restrictions, which, of course, makes managing the pandemic really difficult. Um, so it's been, it's been really severe in South Africa. We continue to live under severe restrictions, things like unemployment, um, uh, closure of business has really gone through the roof. Um, and it's been a little bit disappointing that we've not seen uh, public procurement, for example, being more effectively used to stimulate economic development during these times. Because we have seen in other countries, for example, during the 2008-2009 financial crisis, procurement being very effectively used. Um, and the South African government's unfortunately not been very effective in, um, in, in using procurement uh, for that purpose. And just to give you a very brief, quick example, just in rolling out our vaccination program, which is now only starting to go online, um, there's really only been use of big major companies. Now, one can understand that in, in the, the drive to get it out as quickly as possible. But at the same time, I think smaller enterprises could have played a bigger role in helping with, with that kind of process to um, uh, support economic development. But unfortunately, we're not seeing that. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for your time. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, as, as usual, every conference is getting delayed because of no problem. the circumstances. Uh, not, no not problem. Not possible to be affected. So thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank and, you. Uh, thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. We know that uh, your students are waiting for you right now. Uh, please send uh, them uh, our regards. And uh, we hope to see you in Moscow next year, of course. Yes, thank absolutely. Bye-bye. Thank you, Guy. My dear study. colleagues, and we are gradually coming to the next speaker's report. Allow me to give the floor to the representative of uh, Nepal, uh, the lecturer, Kathmandu University School of Nepal, Professor Santosh. Uh, he is here with us for the first time. The floor is yours. Please. Are you with us, Dr. Santosh? Dr. Santos, did, did I hear Prosper? <laughs> we can hear you, but we, we, we cannot no. see you. We can hear Prosper because Prosper <laughs> is it, he is not Santos. <laughs> it is oh, uh, sorry, it is sorry. it is saying that um, I can't uh, uh, have my video on because uh, it says here there's an instruction. Oh, now I, I'm allowed. Ah, there it oh, is. Okay. 
Yes, okay. uh, good morning, everyone. I, I hope it's morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, yeah, I'm really thrilled to... Uh, well, one second, well, one second, Prosper. I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I introduced uh, Professor Santos from Nepal, not you. <laughs> ah! <laughs> one second. Professor yeah, Santos, I also, I also misunderstood this. Well, one second, misunderstood. Uh, Prosper. <laughs> right. Professor Santos, are you here? Thank you, thank you. Uh, but I'm having a problem with my video. Ah, you have a problem with the video. Do, do you have a presentation or not? Yeah, I have a presentation, but I'm having some problem with my video. Uh, can I go without my video? We can wait. We can uh, hear the presentation of uh, Professor Prosper uh, if you have opportunity to decide this question. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. I will do um, after uh, his presentation. Yeah, you'll uh, just after, have time. After his presentation, yes. And by the time I will fix my problem. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, you'll have 15 minutes. Okay, Prosper. Prosper, yeah. Prosper please. Your turn. So, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly. I hope Prosper didn't leave. Prosper, we can't hear you. Where are you? Oh, okay. Now let me start again. So, well, technology. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. There we go. I share my screen. So allow me to share my screen and then we get started. Yeah. We can see your screen. All good. Okay, that's fantastic then. All right, so yeah, uh, yeah. So my name is Prosper Maguchu, and I'm a Zimbabwean lawyer, uh, currently uh, teaching at Free University in Amsterdam. And today, uh, within probably the next twenty minutes, I'm going to go through the legal regulation uh, of public procurement and disposal of public assets uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, so we have a fairly new uh, public procurement legislation that was passed about two years ago. Uh, so what I'll do today is basically stock taking uh, or an audit of the test uh, of the of the act to see whether it has managed to withstand, uh, you know, emergence procurement. Uh, during the COVID-19 uh, period. So allow me to just share with you quickly uh, the overview, the content of uh, my presentation. So just a bed's eye or warm's eye view. What I'll do is I'll just give you uh, some introduction and to the legal framework, uh, the Zimbabwean legal uh, framework. Then I'll go into the history a bit of history of public procurement in Zimbabwe prior to 1999 when we had our first uh, public procurement standalone act. And then I will also talk briefly about the period when we had discussions with the World Bank that led eventually to a new dawn. And we uh, eventually adopted the public procurement and disposal of assets uh, act uh, uh, about two and a half years ago. And I will conclude uh, by highlighting some challenges that still uh, remains. Okay, so maybe uh, I... Before the introduction, let me just start with a little bit of background uh, for those who are initiated, for those who are not familiar with Zimbabwe. Let me just say, so Zimbabwe is a country uh, in the southern cone of uh, Africa, uh, so between South Africa and, and Zambia. And uh, public procurement in Zimbabwe is a billion dollar industry. Zimbabwe has a very small budget of about $4 billion and public procurement uh, consumes or accounts to uh, about 20 to 25%. Uh, of Zimbabwe's annual budget. So that's basically about a billion dollars uh, each year. So you see how it is very relevant uh, in, in the context of Zimbabwe. Uh, so I want to show some of the highlights, you know, the things that are very common in Zimbabwe. I was listening to previous uh, speakers, uh, Ari uh, from um, uh, Indonesia. I was also listening to the advocates, uh, Advocate Manas and Advocate uh, Ibad from India. Also, they were talking about corruption and uh, Professor uh, Kinnot, uh, Gio from uh, Stellenbosch, he was also talking about corruption and public procurement. Zimbabwe is no special exception. So this is something that you expect to see every time you open uh, you, the papers in Zimbabwe, you are reading the newspaper, you see statements or headlines like Zimbabwe buys snow graders, 
Uh, Zimbabwe does not have, uh, we never had snow in Zimbabwe, so there's really no need for us to have snow graders. But you hear that uh, we have bought some snow graders uh, for, you know, highly uh, overpriced, $8 million uh, from a government official. Uh, another example that just caught my eye, Zimbabwe bought an outside broadcasting van for, for the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. The van originally cost $100,000, but then the minister in uh, or the government official in question bills the government $1 million. So instead of buying it, instead of billing the government for $100,000, he demands $1 million. So that's 10 times the actual price. So this is something very common. Another some interesting, you might find this comical or unbelievable. A mayor buys a council house or so, a, a, a sold a council house to himself for just 48 cents. So this is also some public procurement and dispose of assets. And more recently with the COVID-19, uh, I hope you can see these pictures. What you can see here in the first invoice is a, a private company called Judge Investments, which was uh, which had a tender to supply government with uh, um, equipment that was needed to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. So it bought equipment. So in, in this case, it bought diagnostic test paper so the paper that are used to test whether somebody has COVID or not. It bought, it bought these uh, papers from um, Namibia at uh, six cents a piece. So 5,000 pieces were $300. The same company billed the government of Zimbabwe $66,000 uh, uh, selling this uh, same papers that it bought for six cents a piece selling uh, it to the government at 14 US dollars, almost 15, 14 dollars 75 a piece. And here, the government of Zimbabwe, the final report receipt here is the government of Zimbabwe paying the company, judge investments, $66,000 for something that the company has bought only at US $300. So you can see these are the impact of, uh, of uh, uh, bad uh, procurement in Zimbabwe. So this is procurement during the COVID-19 uh, period. All right, so enough of these uh, examples. Now I want to get into the introduction. So by way of introduction, let me just start with the colonial history. So Zimbabwe, like uh, many other African countries, sub-Saharan African countries, uh, we have a plural or hybrid uh, legal system. Uh, this basically means that we have laws that were adopted from foreign jurisdictions. In fact, they were imposed on Zimbabwe by settlers during the colonial era. In our case in Zimbabwe, we have a combination of Roman and Roman Dutch law that was applicable at the time in Cape Town because then Zimbabwe was colonized by a company owned by uh, Sisu John Rhodes. Uh, that's why it's called Rhodesia, who was based in Cape Town at the time. So we simply adopted, you simply adopted all the laws that were applicable as of 10th June 19, 1891, when the charter was signed uh, by the Queen of England then uh, for the company to colonize Zimbabwe. So we just simply uh, adopted law that was applicable uh, in South Africa, which at the time was Rome, a mixture of Roman Dutch and English law. So we have now this combination, we have now a mixture of uh, borrowed laws, laws that were imposed on us, and our own traditional laws. But our own traditional or African customary law mainly applies uh, in matters involving personal law, personal issues, marriage, divorces, etc. So it's not applicable in terms of uh, a procurement. Uh, all these laws are under the constitution. So what we have, we have the constitution is the main law, and then we have an act of parliament that is an enabling legislation you know, putting in effect uh, the provisions of the constitution. And uh, just below the act, we also have some regulations and regulations now they flesh out the operational substance of an act of parliament. So they are more detailed, uh, much more detailed than an act of parliament. But whether it's a regulation or an act of parliament, it still has to be constitutional. So the constitution is uh, the supreme law in Zimbabwe. Uh, so you understand why I'm giving you all these details because public procurement now is, uh, we now have an act of law, uh, the public procurement act, we also now have, we, we now also have uh, regulations that are passed uh, under this uh, public uh, procurement act. Uh, so before 1999, 
uh, Zimbabwe adopted its first legislation, uh, standalone legislation on public procurement in 1999. So before that, uh, what was the legal framework? Let me just quickly go through this. So before 1999, I want to begin from 1890 when Zimbabwe was colonized. So like in other African country, uh, Zimbabwe was uh, just colonized to make sure that, you know, it serves as a source of cheap uh, resources. So cheap resources manufactured uh, good from uh, England or from Great Britain were sold to Zimbabwe and raw materials uh, was moving from uh, in Zimbabwe to, to the Great Britain. And uh, during that time, during the colonial period from 1890 up to 1965, uh, the procurement was mainly through handled by a, a, a private firm uh, that was based in, in London. Uh, so that was the company that was responsible for drafting the contracts uh, on uh, public procurement. And something then happened. Uh, let me, how do you reduce, uh, do you remove this? Okay, something then happened around 1965, uh, the white minority rule in Zimbabwe declared independent from Great Britain, but nonetheless, uh, Britain did not uh, accept that uh, Rhodesia was now independent because they, at that time, probably they were tired of looting Zimbabwean resources, but they had now a policy which, which was called uh, the no independence before majority rule. So they refused to accept uh, the declaration of independence uh, that was unilaterally uh, announced by the colonial or the settler government. So what happened is that they declined uh, to enforce it uh, and instead they uh, imposed some economic sanctions on Rhodesia. Uh, at the same time, the United Nations also imposed uh, economic sanctions. Uh, this was the first time the United Nations imposed uh, economic sanctions on any other state. So it was against the state of Rhodesia. Uh, Zimbabwe as it was then. So everything just dropped. So public procurement during that period between um, the UDI period 1965 to 1979 was done in, it was shrouded in secrecy because uh, Rhodesia was under sanctions. So mostly it was through the support of South Africa and Portugal. Portugal, there was a loose Rhodesian relationship. So Portugal became a very close ally uh, of uh, Rhodesia because it was uh, Portugal was again uh, the colonial master neighboring Rhodesia in Mozambique. So they, it had a very good, it had good relations uh, with, the, with the settler government in Zimbabwe, in Rhodesia then. So they were now assisting them with procurement of international goods. For example, arms that were used by these uh, Rhodesian forces, they were arms from uh, European countries such as Belgium, for example. Uh, and these arms were purchased uh, via as, as uh, Portuguese uh, goods and Rhodesian um, tobacco, for instance, was being sold in Europe as uh, Mozambican uh, uh, tobacco uh, because of the uh, relationship that was there between the colonial uh, the settler government and uh, Mozambique uh, and Portugal as well as South Africa. So in, during that period, uh, all public procurement uh, was just done in, in secrecy. And then Zimbabwe attained uh, independent in 1918. So now between 1980 to 1999, uh, before we had our own standalone act, so uh, the government maintained almost everything, uh, all the structures that were applicable uh, during the colonial period. So Zimbabwe attained independent, but it didn't change much. So there were very marginal changes. Uh, for example, what was happening now is that uh, the, everything was now being handled by the treasurer. Uh, through seculars, but there was no legislation in place. There was no strategy, strategy on uh, public procurement that was in place. So it was just clandestine. It was just a haphazard manner. Uh, this uh, setup had many uh, flaws, uh, among others, corruption and abuse of public funds. So then what happened is that uh, around the same time, the World Bank also started uh, engaging the government on how to reform its uh, public procurement legal framework. So we had, for example, around um, 99, uh, just prior to that, Zimbabwe was then helped by, through the World Bank, adopted the model law, uh, the Public Procurement Act, which was Act Number 1. You can see that was the first act uh, on public procurement in 1999. 
uh, it established among others, you know, how to conduct uh, procurement on behalf of uh, public entities, uh, supervis supervision of the act, and also how to initiate investigations, let's say, in, in, in cases of corruption. But again, this act wasn't really uh, is strong enough to deal with issues of transparency. And then another major political event that also influenced public uh, uh, procurement uh, uh, legal framework in Zimbabwe was the 2013 uh, constitution. So in 2013, uh, Zimbabwe adopted uh, its first homegrown constitution. Uh, prior to that, uh, since 1980, when we had our independence, we were using a transitional constitution that was granted to Zimbabwe uh, by Britain. So the constitution was drafted in Lancaster House in the United Kingdom. It was called the Lancaster House Constitution that the constitution Zimbabwe was using uh, for about uh, for more than 30 years. Up until 2013, we had our own new constitution, uh, which also had a special provision, section 315 uh, on public procurement, which required as its cornerstone, it required that uh, principles of fairness, equitability, transparency, and competitiveness and cost effectiveness uh, be the uh, main principles in uh, public procurement. So these were all states organs were required to make sure that they adhere to these principles when uh, securing public um, and when making public contracts or securing public goods. So the uh, constitution, because in Zimbabwe, as I said, Zimbabwe is a constitutional um, supremacy. The constitution is the primary, is the, the most significant law. It means that then we had to amend also that 1999 act. So uh, through some engagements uh, with uh, the World Bank again, uh, it took a few years from 2010 up to 2015, a draft bill was uh, uh, on public procurement was met. And uh, this again was just um, borrowed from uh, the model laws that were supplied. And up to 2017, we had uh, then by 2017, uh, this was uh, then tabled and it became law. So I'll just skip through some of them, some of these things. So people were consulted, for example, stakeholders, public sector, private sector, including the civil society and other parliamentarians, they were also consulted, uh, even though the bill was, uh, as I said, it was just a draft bill. You know, those bills that are, you just have to contextualize, but they still had to get a buy-in from various stakeholders. That's how we eventually had our own uh, standalone uh, second uh, act on uh, public uh, procurement by way of um, just this table shows you how we you know, the evolution of public procurement in Zimbabwe from 1980 up to 2017. So we came all this way from just a tender board that was ad hoc, chaired usually by the treasury, uh, some instructions that were coming from the treasury to the mid 90s when we had a central purchasing authority that was established uh, up to 99 when we had our first bill and then some negotiations between 2012 up to 2017 when we eventually adopted a new public uh, uh, procurement and disposal of public assets act. So, there is a new dawn for public procurement. Uh, so what is the act, uh, what does the new act introduce? Uh, but may, perhaps before I go into the, just uh, a, an overview of the new act, let me say that strictly speaking, what we have in Zimbabwe, this new act that I just called the new act or the new dawn is uh, nothing really new. There's nothing new under the sun anyway, but this is uh, based on a model law, as I said, that was just provided, uh, that was recommended by the World Bank. So, it's a, it's a harmonization and a unification of the law, you know, the World Trade Organization, the International Trade Law, uh, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law rather, uh, proposes this uh, model laws so that it ensures, uh, I will just read through some of the mandate, it says that it's convinced that the revised model law will significantly assist all states in particular developing countries, countries with economies in transition uh, in, in enhancing their existing procurement laws and formulating procurement laws where none presently exist and will lead to the development of harmonious international economic relations and increased economic development. Not very much different uh, from the time we had also our first, uh, you know, I mean, Zimbabwe when it was under colonial rule. So it's it's basically there to serve the interest of the globalized world for, for yeah, other countries. So, but anyway, nonetheless, the new act uh, has changed a few things in terms of scope. It applies to all public entities at all levels. 
and it establishes uh, um, the public procurement authority. It also establishes a board. It is also decentralized public procurement. So decision-making is no longer centralized as it was in the mid eighties. So it has now been decentralized. Also they thought this was another way of uh, curbing corruption. Uh, more importantly, it has also led to the professionalization uh, and modernization of uh, the public procurement system in Zimbabwe. It is a rationalized uh, system of appeal. So you can have, you can appeal, for example, uh, if you feel that something was uh, not done accordingly or under the books, then there's a way of appealing a decision by the procurement board. And it also, in this regard, also offers uh, sanctions uh, for procurement officers and, uh, and suppliers, so sanctions for those who violate uh, the act. So it is at some some teeth, so, so to speak. Uh, nonetheless, some challenges remain, and I'll just highlight two of them. For example, the first one is dealing with emergent situations. So for instance, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there were no rules that has been issued regarding the public tendering uh, process uh, in general. Uh, and also in regards to uh, emergent situations such as the COVID-19. So because of this, uh, there was actually some, as I, I've shown some cases of massive corruption in securing um, necessary equipment that was needed to uh, keep uh, COVID-19 at bay. Then there's also the issue of corruption itself. So the act relies on other legislation in terms of fighting corruption. And the legal framework of fighting corruption in Zimbabwe is basically uh, inadequate. For example, it still refers to corruption as a criminal as, as criminal abuse of power. And we have seen say, in Zimbabwe several cases where corruption can also be administrative abuse of power, for example, or corruption can be even a constitutional uh, uh, abuse of power. Uh, it also restricts uh, uh, the fight against corruption or the definition of corruption at the moment uh, only applies to public officials. But in the area of public uh, uh, um, uh, procurement, you can see that there are also private players who are involved and uh, the act in Zimbabwe only targets public officials. So it means it is not, in, uh, it is not adequate uh, to deal with private players who may also be working hand in hand uh, with public officials uh, in uh, um, embezzling funds or paying bribes or, you know, involved in other nefarious activities uh, that are causing the government to lose uh, important financial resources uh, during the public procurement uh, processes. So in a nutshell, this is uh, an overview of the uh, legal framework in Zimbabwe. I don't know if we have time for discussion, uh, but otherwise I want to thank you everybody for your attentive listening and uh, thank you once again and uh, colleagues for having me here today. Thank you very much, Prosper. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we have no time <laughs> for questions. Yeah, we'll have to move on. Thank you. Yes. Even. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you uh, in Moscow next year, of course. Oh, yes, sure. Uh, I do really hope so. Sorry, my video was off and I couldn't go to my messages, but yeah. Uh, I hope that yeah, you even um, find the chapter more informative. Thank you. Thank you. Kuzma, you said the same thing last year. See what happened. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, very well, dear colleagues, uh, we have the next speaker. And uh, uh, this will be Santos, uh, lecturer at Kathmandu University School of Law, Nepal. Please, uh, Santosh, Mr. Santosh, you are welcome. So, okay, can you please give me the permission to start my video? Yes, you can start, of course. Yes, please uh, turn on your presentation. Yeah, still, uh, you are not permitting me to uh, share my video. Is that so? Mm. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. I got this message. Uh, you can just share your presentation at the moment. Yeah. That should be fine. The presentation then. Yeah. I hope you can see my presentation then. It's loading. Yeah. yeah. We can see it now. 
Okay, thank you. Bye. Yes. Uh, I think a good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to give some brief on the procurement law in Nepal. Uh, I will be discussing on the Procurement Act of Nepal 2007 in brief in my presentation today. So without making any delay, let me uh, move with me with my presentation. So before starting my presentation, I would like to give some uh, picture about my country because I think uh, this is my uh, first time in this conference and I think from Nepal, this is the first time to join this conference, even if the conference has 10 versions already. Yeah. So you can see uh, the Nepal at a glance here. I have provided some information about it. I don't want to uh, describe it more. You can see in the screen. So with this information, I would like to move on to the procurement law of Nepal. Okay. So yes, um, whenever we talk about this procurement law in Nepal, we need to see some uh, reforms initiatives in Nepal. So um, talking about our initiatives uh, for the public procurement. So that starts uh, basically in 2002. Before that, we had a laws, but in a scattered form. Uh, the uh, single laws was not there, but the scattered laws was there to regulate the public procurement. So yes, in 2002, uh, our country um, started the assessment on the public procurement. What is the real situation about it and what we need to do? And uh, that study uh, went on, went on, and 2007 and 2008, the Nepal enacted the Public Procurement Act. And in 2008, uh, Nepal enacted the Public Procurement Regulations. So, so these two are the basic laws that regulates the public procurement in our country. Okay. And uh, this law also established some institutional um, mechanism for the regulation of the public procurement uh, that is public procurement monitoring office and it also established the um, public procurement review committee so both these uh, institutions are there and which looks after the public procurement issues basically this public procurement monitoring office look after the uh, promotion and the facilitation of this public procurement in nepal and this public procurement review committee generally uh, hears uh, the issues raised by the parties under the public procurement that is sometimes uh, procurer and sometimes the bidder. And uh, again in 2007 and 2008 uh, we uh, also assess uh, some of the uh, possibilities on this EGP that is electronic government procurement and we um, uh, try to find out some of the possibilities on this uh, system and moving forward to 2009 and 10. Uh, yes, uh, we again try to institute uh, the e-procurement system and uh, we also formulated the national procurement uh, strategic framework of phase one. Uh, that is the helping hand for this uh, legal mechanism for regulating and promoting the public procurement in Nepal. And talking about this 2011 and 13, we started developing the national EGV phase one. That means uh, we are in the implementation phase of this electronic government procurement system and uh, again we uh, formulated the uh, national public uh, procurement uh, strategic framework uh, that is uh, phase two yes and uh, ultimately um, in 2013 and 2017 uh, we we, uh, we have been able to uh, introduce the full fledged uh, national EGP system with its uh, own um, websites and there you can be a member of this uh, uh, a procurement as a bidder, yes, uh, there is a portal and you can simply visit that and I have uh, stated, I've mentioned uh, the website over here and uh, for that sake, uh, the memorandum of understanding was signed with the central bank and all other commercial banks for the EGP process and again at that time, the amendment was made in the uh, act and the regulation as per the necessity of the time. So these are the uh, some uh, reforms initiatives in Nepal for the public uh, procurement laws. So by basic topic is the um, Public Procurement Act 2007. So I will be giving some brief of this act 
Okay. So yes, uh, talking about the objective, why this come, why this law comes to an existence? Uh, what is the objective behind it? We can uh, summarize this objective into three categories. That is, uh, to make the procurement uh, procedure and process transparent, objective, and reliable. Since the public fund is used in this public procurement, that should be transparent, objective, and reliable. So the objective behind uh, introducing this act is to make this process and procedure transparent and objective and reliable. And again, it tried to promote the competition, fairness, honesty, accountability, and reliability in the public procurement, which is a very essential part of this public procurement, as we all know that. And ultimately, this, uh, this uh, the, uh, the act tried to ensure the good governance in every part of the government activities. So these were the objective for introducing the Public Procurement Act in Nepal. And talking about some provision regarding the responsibility and process for public procurement. So what act says about it? So yes, uh, the chief of the public entity is primarily responsible for the procurement activities. So uh, this act is applicable for all the public entities and the chief of the public entity is primarily responsible to look after all these procurement activities within that office, within that entity. Uh, and the, the, the uh, chief can form one separate unit under its office and that uh, unit will be responsible for preparing all the descriptions of the public procurement, what it needs, what kind of procurement uh, so far we will have to do in the future. All these descriptions need to be prepared by this unit. And again, it has to prepare the cost estimation for that procurement. What will be the cost? So, so that uh, there will be a easy a process for uh, calling for the bid, tendering the bid. And again, uh, this unit is responsible for the determination of procurement method. So what procurement method will be appropriate for a particular procurement, this unit will look after and it will uh, get approval from the chief of the public entity. So this is the responsibility and process of the public procurement under the act. And so far, the methods prescribed by the Public Procurement Act 2007 is concerned. So it has provided uh, various methods for the public procurement and it has categorized the uh, areas for um, public procurement methods. Okay, And they're talking about these procurements of goods, constructions, and other services, the procurer can use, can go for the different kind of methods, including uh, inviting open bids from the bidders, inviting sealed quotations, and procuring directly through participations of the user committee or beneficiary groups, uh, limited tendering sometime, and through catalog shoppings. So these are the uh, methods so far provided to the procurers as a methods for the public procurement. Talking about this consultancy service, which also falls under the public procurement, which will be the subject of this public procurement. So uh, the procurer will request uh, for the competitive proposals from the proponent. And uh, after getting that uh, proposal, the uh, procurer will shortlist all the proponents and then the uh, procurer will uh, do some direct negotiation and conclude the purchase agreement. So these are the methods provided by the act for the public procurement for these public entities. And um, cost and methods of the procurement. So this might be some um, unique features of this act. And uh, uh, I hope uh, this will uh, give you a clear picture of our act. So uh, you can see three categories of these um, cost and the methods of procurement. So what the public entity need to consider while going for certain type of certain methods of procurement. So if the public entity is going for the procurement that cost the um, more than 1 million Nepalese rupees, then it should go for the open bid as act says. And uh, if that uh, procurement is uh, uh, only uh, cost uh, 1 million or less, then uh, sealed quotation can be one method for the procurement. You don't need to go for open bid. You can simply call for the sale quotation and you can do the procurement agreement with the bidder. And uh, yes, uh, uh, you can directly procure, you can directly purchase the um, goods and services or the consultancy, but that should be uh, 
zero point fifteen million in a cost or less, and in some other conditions, the public entity can go for the uh, direct procurement. That is, purchase by one public entity from another public entity, purchase of goods or services from the inter uh, international governmental entities at the price rate prescribed by such entity. So, in these conditions, uh, the public entity do not need to go for some open bid and seal quotation. The public entity can procure directly, and one more is the purchase required to be made in special circumstances. That special circumstances, as you know, the um, natural calamities and the situation which is beyond the uh, our control. So in that case, uh, the public entity can go for the uh, direct procurement. You can you, you don't uh, have to go for other type of uh, procurement methods. So that relaxation is provided by the Procurement Act for the public entities. And um, yes, uh, talking about this beat, beat for goods, uh, constructions, work, or other services. So what are the procedure, how it goes? So first, uh, if a public entity thinks that it is necessary to get the pre-qualification standard, then the entity will, after all the preparations, whatever it needs to do, it will call for the plea qualifications report from the bidder if necessary and after getting that pre qualification standard from the bidder it invites for bid it provides the invitation for the bid and uh, whenever uh, uh, it thinks that it is necessary for uh, going uh, for uh, um, it, it, it is necessary to go for the international bid, then again, it, it will go for the international bid and some circumstances has been mentioned for the international bid that are, let's say, if uh, there are no national product, uh, uh, national um, uh, goods, national um, services, we cannot easily find that goods or national services around our country, then obviously we need to go for the international level. At that time, we have to go for the international bid. Sometime uh, the agreement with the some donor and the agency may um, compel us to go for the international bid. At that time, yes, obviously the public entity need to go for the international bid. Yes, and uh, whenever there is the invitation for the bid, and bidder will obviously uh, submit the bids, and uh, there is a provision regarding the withdrawal of the bids, and uh, uh, up to what time the bids will be valid that provision are there in the uh, act and uh, simply after the completion of all these process getting a bid from the bidder there will be the opening and examination and evaluation of the bid and at the end uh, there will be the procurement contract with the selected bidder in case of a bid for goods constructions works and other services so this is the process so far mentioned in our act public procurement act of nepal 2007 Talking about this consultancy service, this is slightly different than the uh, procurement for the goods services and the construction service. Yes, so uh, it goes with the asking for expression of the interest and preparing cert, uh, the shortlisted um, list. Yes, so yes, um, uh, whenever the public entity asks for the expression of interest for providing consultancy service, uh, they will. Uh, ask for the proposals after shortlisting all the um, bidders those who want to provide the service the public entity will uh, ask for the proposals and after getting all the proposals from the qualified shortlisted bidders the proposals will be opened and that proposal will be evaluated by some methods prescribed in the law by the public entities and that methods includes both type of evaluations that is technical and financial evaluations so there will be two type of evaluation of the proposal first uh, the public entity the uh, procurer will see the technical qualifications technical <clears throat> part of this proposal and then it goes for the financial proposal so yes uh, when a public entity finds that a particular uh, proposal is uh, appropriate for uh, to to go for then it will invite for the negotiation with the proponent and if the um, tuning is messed up then there will be the conclusion of the contract for providing consultancy service. And uh, yes, uh, uh, for getting the uh, uh, 
this uh, procurement the uh, bidder the uh, the provider of this service uh, need to uh, provide some security that uh, has two circumstances that is while providing the bid itself our laws require the bidder to uh, provide the bid security of 2.5% uh, of the bid amount let's say if i have provided the 1 million bid amount then i have to deposit 2.5% uh, of that 1 million as a bid amount and that can be confiscated by the public in that in certain circumstances and that will be returned for the uh, bidders in in certain circumstances okay and uh, yes, um, if that bidder is selected and the uh, contract is going to be uh, concluded with that bidder, then the bidder has to deposit 5% of the procurement amount. Yes. And then only there will be the conclusion of the uh, procurement contract and uh, the uh, work will be started. So this is the uh, performance security that should be deposited by the bidder to get the contract. And uh, yes, if the um, bidder proponent is not satisfied with the decision of the public entity who is offering the uh, procurement service, then uh, that bidder can file an application in front of chief of the public entity who is responsible to look after the uh, public procurement. So uh, that uh, the um, bidder can uh, make an application. And uh, if the bidder is again not satisfied with the decision made by the chief uh, public uh, and ID, then it can again go to the three members review committee to review the decision made by this chief of the public and ID. And this review committee, as I already mentioned, uh, comprise a three person, three members, uh, including a presiding or the retired judge from the high court level. So this is the uh, remedial mechanism provided by the act to the bidder. And uh, some issues, uh, if we talk about the procurement agreement, then the agreement must include the all essential um, elements for these uh, procurement services. The list of the content that should be mentioned in the uh, agreement is prescribed in the act. And uh, we have also the variation order in our act. The act provides the variation order clauses. That means if the certain, uh, certain circumstances happen, which cannot be foreseen at the time of signing of the procurement contract, arise in the course of implementation of the procurement contract, then the uh, concerned authority can give some variation order. Um, and I will discuss uh, the problem with this variation order later on, but this provision is there in the uh, act. And uh, again, there is the provision of price adjustment. Sometimes the uh, contract can be adjusted and uh, the price can also be adjusted to certain label. And uh, yes, um, sometimes the uh, if there is the uh, occurrence of the force majeure, uh, then there, there could be an extension of contract period. Again, the contractual party with the mutual consent, there will be the uh, extension of the contract uh, to, to period, uh, but that should be based on the force majeure. The, um, applicants should establish that uh, there is the situation of force measure as a result of the um, period of contract should be extended. And again, uh, the agreement must include the dispute uh, settlement mechanism. The, lo the law itself says that uh, whenever there uh, is the conclusion of the procurement agreement between the parties, that agreement must include the dispute settlement mechanism. And it has given two types of uh, settlement mechanism that is the parties need to settle their dispute with mutual consent if not then they must go for the arbitration process to settle the dispute and uh, again this agreement must include the termination of the procurement agreement that means it the, the, the law itself requires that how procurement agreement will be terminated that should be mentioned in the agreement itself yes so yes uh, when the bidder can terminate the procurement agreement when the procurer can terminate the uh, uh, procurement agreement that uh, situation should be mentioned clearly in the procurement agreement that is the requirement made by the procurement act and um, in in later part of the act we can see the conduct of the parties uh, that uh, basically requires the parties to the procurement agreement to show the honest conduct the party should ensure the impartiality, fair competition, and honesty, which is again the objective of the Public Procurement Act. 
So it uh, requires a parties who are involved in the procurement uh, should ensure the impartiality. There is no any um, fraud, any misrepresentation at all. And if there is the uh, fraud, misrepresentation, or some kind of a partiality, yes, then some then uh, yes, obviously that uh, bidder or proponent may be blacklisted by the public entity. The public entity can recommend to blacklist that particular person who cannot enjoy such uh, rights uh, in the days to come later on. Yes, and uh, from the side of procurer, if there is any fraud, if there is any uh, other uh, unwanted things, then the procurer may charge for the corruption. So the conduct of the parties uh, must be uh, uh, impartial, fair, and honest uh, to, to uh, ensure the good governance itself. And the institutional arrangement we can find in the uh, act again, and that institution that is established by this act is public procurement monitoring office this monit this, this monitoring office has this kind of uh, uh, functions uh, you can see that uh, uh, prepare public procurement policy and recommend measures of the implementation to the government it, it basically uh, uh, made the um, procurement policy and recommend some measures to implement uh, that policy to the government how it can be implemented it will make the plan of action again and it also monitor the implementation status of the laws some directives made by it and uh, it also establish it can establish the public procurement management system that it has already established that is electronic government procurement and we have developed some separate kind of uh, portal for it and uh, develop and issue standard bidding document so yes the documentary part is also the functions of these uh, office it develops all the uh, formatted document for public procurement, which will facilitate for the uh, public entity to go for the particular public uh, procurement. And yes, obviously, the human resource, developing the human resource and professionalism development plan for the public procurement, among others, are the functions of these uh, uh, public procurement monitoring office. So this is the institutional mechanism to look after the uh, public procurement in Nepal. Uh, uh, established by this procurement act so when this act is not applicable some of these situations that is prescribed by this law are if the government of nepal decide that the act will not be applicable in these circumstances then at that time the act is not applicable and if certain procurement is not is to be made in accordance with the procurement guidelines of the donor sometimes yes with while doing the agreement with the donor and it uh, uh, basically uh, wants to buy out, uh, buy out this uh, act, then at that time it is not applicable. And uh, if uh, any public entity is engaged in the aviation business and it has to go for the public procurement internationally, then this law is not applicable at that time. So uh, with this uh, uh, last slide, I would uh, conclude my presentation. So some problems and the challenges we can see in the public procurement sector in Nepal, that is uh, the selection of low bidding. If we see the provision of entire laws of the public procurement of Nepal, then the essence of that law says that uh, always select the low bidding. So that low bidding may sometimes um, make some problems. It may cause the question of quality and sometimes compel to go with the variation in the contract. That is, see, uh, um, sometimes, uh, if there are low bidding, then uh, the uh, uh, completion of the work may be um, uh, affected neg negatively so that the uh, public entity has to go for the variations. Uh, Sometimes there may, may be questions about the quality of the uh, work. So selecting the low uh, bidding is uh, at one point of at one point of time is good, but at the same time it might cause the negative impact in the uh, procurement. And another is complexity on the cost estimation. See, um, the uh, units under the public entity need to prepare this uh, cost estimation, but uh, due to some long process, much complex process, it takes much time and difficult to come up with the real picture. So whether that cost estimation gives the real picture or not, uh, that uh, question is always there uh, in the public procurement sector. And uh, another problem so, so far we are facing for the public procurement is when uh, the uh, bidder is getting uh, 
contract from the public entity and they are getting the advance amount then they generally run away uh, without doing anything what they have to do under the agreement so uh, they use the advance in other areas and they um, generally wants to um, escape from the responsibility and they want to talk with the big political leaders to escape from the all liabilities and uh, making one interpretation of the laws and complex court procedure again is uh, creating some problem for this public procurement and the development as well and uh, we have one law for all the procurement including minor procurement to the major procurement and it doesn't looks better because we have to follow uh, this uh, procurement law for the tiny type of procurement as well and uh, obviously corruption and cartelling problem is again there uh, co corruption from the public entity side and the cartelling from the bidder side are some of the problems so far we are facing in the uh, public procurement and with these i come to the end of my presentation i'm happy to uh, have a question if you have to answer i will try to uh, answer the question if you have any and thank you so much for giving this opportunity for me thank you there are some thank questions you but we have no time unfortunately yes so yes thank unfortunately we have no time thank you for your presentation uh, we are very glad for starting our cooperation with uh, you and with our partners from nepal and we hope to see you in moscow in next year too of course Thank you, thank you, Professor Santos. Thank you, see you. Уважаемые коллеги, итак, мы закончили сейчас. Dear colleagues, we have completed two big blocks. First block, the Africa, Eastern and Southern Asia. Now we gradually come to Russia, and we have Philip Martinovich with us. And we will see you somewhat later. And allow me to give the floor uh, to uh, Olga Yurievna uh, Veronik. She is the uh, vice rector uh, of the Lomonosov State University. Good afternoon. Hello. <coughs> So, in continuation of uh, the previous part, um, uh, so I will speak uh, about, about uh, uh, Moscow State University uh, because we will speak about public procurement specialities in, in, the, in the Russian Federation. And we have a unique structure. It's a huge um, university which has a lot of specialities uh, and uh, also uh, we have a lot of um, acts uh, regulating and procurement. From the point of my practice, my experience, vast experience, I can speak about all this, about this direction. What is Moscow University? Uh, it has 80 in the Russian Federation and um, abroad. Uh, they can be separated in the different categories. Um, our study subdivisions, uh, which uh, train students um, and also uh, make different practices, uh, scientific experimental practices. And uh, we have, um, uh, this is quite a big one, even bigger than studies, um, uh, mostly, uh, so mostly theoretical and experimental, as I've said. Also, we have enlightening museums, uh, botanical uh, gardens, uh, and so on. And also, uh, we uh, also have uh, uh, production equipment, uh, uh, different um, catering and um, dormitories, um, as a resort areas, a plant uh, production, and um, others. Also, we have medical subdivisions, uh, uh, hospital um, and um, healthcare clinic, and our household uh, subdivisions. Uh, these are our premises uh, for uh, serving our infrastructure. And we buy uh, everything in all directions. So uh, the um, 
objects of our procurement mostly are uh, household um, to support our infrastructure. Also, we uh, purchase unique things, uh, books, uh, scientific equipment, and uh, alive um, systems, experimental. Alive, I mean uh, di different microorganisms, for example. Also, uh, different experimental um, uh, devices and organizational services. And besides uh, scientific research, uh, we uh, conduct uh, a lot of um, uh, cultural events, um, scientific conferences. Uh, for this, we uh, buy uh, some um, so some appropriate services. Uh, we continuously uh, provide um, food, medical um, devices. Uh, uh, medical um, uh, treatments um, and so on. Uh, so we provide uh, for all our employers, employees, and uh, other uh, uh, in, in, uh, rather uh, things. So now let's speak about Russian Federation. We have two uh, major laws, 44 and 223. Uh, which speak about different types of financing. They define rules in accordance with which we have to select uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, uh, Moscow University is a big structure and we have different type, types of financing and uh, everything what is going to the budget. Uh, uh, we work um, in accordance with other uh, regulations uh, and uh, different grants. Um, uh, then the subsidies partially. Uh, we um, here use another legislation for this, uh, uh, and uh, it was uh, it, 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 it uh, contains um, a certain list of rules and regulations. Um, and within this uh, framework, uh, we have uh, major basic principles. Uh, uh, this is fair competitiveness, um, transparency, and so on. Uh, during uh, last years, uh, we have a lot of changes um, uh, and uh, in this direction, uh, we regulate procurement activities. Uh, so um, practically, uh, we replaced uh, here a lot of procedures, um, not always uh, legislation supports us in this area uh, to be um, efficient, very efficient. Uh, so, so life is life. And um, uh, we have uh, procurement, which we finance of other resources uh, and uh, some are regulated uh, by uh, budget means. Uh, okay, so uh, we have to work uh, on a different with different types of procurement, and uh, 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 on the whole, we uh, uh, we uh, uh, divide our procurement uh, for trade procurements, um, and uh, 223 we. Mm, refuse uh, practically from all uh, procedures, uh, uh, you know, competitions now, mostly we uh, get from uh, funds from tradings. Uh, this is um, uh, receiving of um, different tender proposals from participants uh, and the legislation allows us to do this. Also in any procurement, we have a list of procurements uh, there is practically no competition in such uh, procurements and uh, um, in accordance with 44 uh, law, federal law, uh, this list is defined uh, and uh, this law is indicated. Uh, and again, uh, uh, here we mostly speak um, about uh, the um, goods and services. We don't have uh, competitiveness. Now, order, it's not... Uh, feasible there uh, to um, conduct tradings in such markets uh, uh, and um, uh, so this is uh, the law for 44. Also it concerns of our uh, you know other procurement uh, which uh, uh, cannot be competitive 
uh, but uh, we conduct this procurement uh, with different uh, ways uh, and um, these are mostly competitive for us and that that's uh, competitive uh, these are separate trading procedures which allow you to choose an appropriate uh, supplier and also it's like uh, uh, you know um, a grounding for the contract of only one supplier uh, so it plays um, uh, two main major roles what is um, what regarding organizational approaches in our university we have a contract service uh, which uh, uh, is um, centralized and uh, here uh, we uh, provide control uh, for fulfilling of each uh, transaction from the legal point of view and uh, uh, checking um, on uh, on uh, compliance with the legislation uh, and uh, besides uh, you know uh, here uh, we have um, achievements of maximum uh, economizing of this uh, procurement and um, uh, here we can see uh, that um, uh, this uh, control is fulfilled uh, and also uh, we uh, we consider the needs uh, of our um, our participants uh, this is uh, centralized plus decentralized control of counter regions quality and then we have a result and uh, that uh, competitive procedure itself if it's conducted it's uh, uh, conducted uh, uh, with one uh, committee uh, which defines uh, uh, suppliers uh, on uh, tenders uh, it, it's, it is defined by uh, procurement uh, uh, department uh, it's a, a certain group of people who uh, only uh, do this and they define winners in accordance with the rules which were defined uh, by the end users and uh, the solution the resolution of this committee can be um, appealed in accordance uh, with anti-monopoly uh, body and uh, we have uh, independent co uh, commission on defining of suppliers on tradings uh, and uh, there is an absence of the connection between the end uh, customer and choice of the end uh, uh, supplier if it's uh, done on tradings all this system works on the principle of double uh, uh, um, so, uh, of double uh, submission on employees and we have double uh, uh, reporting uh, here uh, and uh, uh, managing of uh, uh, contract service uh, so we try uh, uh, to uh, uh, work uh, in this way and this is quite efficient now, once again i can say that and with this mechanism uh, we provide for 100 percent of each uh, transaction uh, and uh, uh, we um, uh, check uh, all transactions and all suppliers and then um, it gives us um, uh, a right to fulfill it we control all procurement uh, so we compare all procurements on price and on economic conditions and if we have uh, some other requirements, um, um, uh, for example, if they're common for different subdivisions, so they are uh, centralized. Um, and uh, that uh, we uh, here work uh, uh, through distributed uh, uh, delivery and um, also through decentralized. So there are two you know, major ways um, of uh, deliveries. And besides, uh, this uh, is uh, more or less uh, centralized. That's why for our unique uh, uh, procurement and expensive equipment, uh, we have a separate uh, uh, control efficiency of uh, further uh, functioning of this equipment during the whole life cycle of this expensive equipment. And we uh, control um, its work, how efficient, how, how efficiently this equipment is uh, uh, 
used. Um, so if we have some problems, um, um, for example, transfer of equipment to other employees um, uh, or to other sorry customers. Uh, uh, so here we um, uh, check efficiency of the equipment and we're sure in its efficiency. Uh, speaking about counter regions uh, with whom we work, uh, who fulfill our contracts, um, uh, this is about uh, 12, 15,000 uh, uh, transactions per year uh, for small amount of transactions. Uh, uh, we uh, we also uh, work with even smaller um, uh, transactions and large transactions are, um, are conducted by a quality control agency and um, any deviations uh, from uh, execution of contracts are considered at the central level and uh, um, appropriate measures, response measures uh, are applied uh, if uh, there is uh, some breach. Uh, and we impose duties uh, and the fees uh, with the uh, uh, counter agents uh, who um, fail to do something. And this is also centralized. Uh, through this uh, centralization, we uh, manage also uh, uh, given quotes uh, and planning. Uh, and we uh, have to uh, support uh, uh, small and medium uh, enterpri enterprises. Um, uh, so uh, we have quarters um, uh, for uh, such um, enterprises. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, we first distribute these quarters uh, uh, to reach all necessary in indicators. And then we uh, um, decide um, who has this quarter. Since this year, we have a new uh, norms um, on domestic uh, uh, producers uh, and uh, we now we have different norms for them uh, so not uh, uh, so we, we have um, quite uh, big volumes uh, and we provide uh, for these uh, things uh, and also uh, we regulate limits of procurement procurement uh, uh, which um, are uh, ex uh, ex uh, which are possible with if there is uh, not a big volume of transaction uh, and uh, so subdivisions uh, also uh, try uh, to do this. Uh, thanks uh, to such organizational uh, scheme uh, which I mentioned about, we have. Uh, uh, unified methodological approaches and instruments. We have an appropriate uh, system database, uh, which uh, work uh, uh, work uh, quite smoothly and well. So we don't not only have normative requirements, uh, but also we have um, uh, basic uh, tasks. Um, and uh, it's clear that if we have a lot of different subdivisions. Uh, and uh, uh, they um, uh, have something in common. So we have uh, one tactics for them and we apply these tactics. Uh, also, uh, we have um, um, single criteria, unified criteria, synchronized criteria for them. Uh, and um, we develop and implement uh, uh, unified, unified methods of uh, price, gro of price uh, uh, grounding uh, so uh, this year we expanded this uh, grounds for this um, uh, the price forming or pricing, uh, and uh, here we uh, should uh, uh, ground uh, uh, this in contracts. Uh, Moscow State University always did this, so always grounded the pricing, uh, but now um, uh, this uh, uh, is more expanded uh, in uh, our documents. And uh, thanks to such uh, a system, uh, we um, have uh, interests uh, um, at, in anti-monopoly uh, bodies uh, and in the central uh, body. And we uh, save uh, our resources and specialists uh, who can do this uh, for the whole university. Uh, and also uh, we, uh, so I spoke already about uh, competitive mechanisms and anti-corruption mechanisms we have also. We have problems as many customers have in Russia. 
uh, we have with different aspects um, regarding not sufficient uh, quality of supplies. Uh, we have problems um, at the legislation level, uh, and don't always we check our, our um, supply. Sometimes uh, uh, it's a too short period to do this. Uh, uh, we have 23 a law for this, and we sometimes are restricted only by one day uh, for considering these uh, requests. Uh, last time we had the procedure uh, where uh, we had only one day. Uh, so to define whether uh, this uh, could co go supply or not, uh, it's uh, quite problematic within a short period of time. Uh, but um, Still, uh, we try to solve this issue, but it's done mostly for suppliers um, um, who uh, could uh, get contracts uh, quickly if they win and uh, if they lose. So in this case, uh, uh, this mechanism works mostly for unfair competitors uh, who reduce their price uh, or uh, think about their application uh, not to the full, and then they don't fulfill their contracts and to the end, we don't have the results in time, uh, or we get these results at, at later uh, periods of time. Uh, and um, in this case, uh, we should control it uh, to always uh, have um, fulfilling of the contracts. Uh, and um, uh, these are uh, the problems which can really prevent us from um, doing our business well. And um, uh, so uh, uh, Russian, the Russian Federation uh, participates uh, in procurement for many years and we always have something new uh, because uh, we have changes each uh, two, three months uh, and uh, maybe soon uh, we'll uh, have this all strictly um, written in re uh, regulations and legislation and we enhance the mechanisms not only regarding economizing of um, uh, means, but also quality of results without some additional expenses and the resources. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, this uh, message. It was presentation. It was very interesting for us. Um, and now I would like to give um, uh, the floor uh, to Anna Katamadze, uh, Deputy Head of the Federal Treasury. Uh, thank you very much uh, that you that you uh, may, that you. Um, give the presentation at this conference. I think uh, that uh, now it's one of not many uh, international conferences where you can exchange opinions. I think it's very important uh, uh, to develop ourselves and to share you know, opinions with colleagues um, uh, in spite of all these uh, difficult uh, conditions. I will uh, uh, bri be brief uh, uh, because my colleagues uh, practically spoke a lot about procurement. Uh, uh, so I will speak about an uh, Just two days ago, uh, we uh, actually had uh, the 400 pages of the text adopted by the State Duma. And for us, it was a very serious adjustment for the system of uh, public uh, procu procurement for the coming five years. I should say that uh, this is the uh, most uh, significant uh, resurrection of the system. Actually, uh, we, it relies on the optimization of the competitive uh, procedures so that they should comply uh, with the principle of competition. Actually, the bureaucratization and facilitation of the procedures uh, were acquired and also we are supposed to, to universally uh, qualify the uh, bidders and uh, they have to be measured, digitized, and quite a number of things uh, were necessitated, like the qualification assessment, the ability of the company uh, to uh, somehow um, implement the orders and other things were assessed and uh, actually all these matters had to be verified by the numerous uh, contracts. Everything needs to be digitized and uh, all these aspects could be checked uh, with no preference uh, to any other 
leaders and any controller and supervisor and other supervisory bodies uh, could easily check and detect uh, how the procurement system is uh, uh, operating. So thus we try to optimize this system at maximum. And so we de-bureaucratize the system and optimize it at maximum. Uh, thus uh, giving a balance uh, to the customer and uh, to the uh, bidder and uh, and to, to the purchaser and uh, actually uh, we also have to avoid uh, certain abuses uh, from the part of the uh, procurement uh, entities. So we worked uh, very closely with the State Duma with a number of ministries in order to uh, streamline this process. And one of the key uh, focal points of this uh, bylaw, on draft law, is not just to uh, have the bids measured uh and uh, it should be not done at the level of the uh, initial phase but it should be uh, the entire process checked and audited and if it is done electronically so online we already have the entire picture and how the contracts are being implemented and uh, certain things are still on the paper and if everything is scanned, uh, it could be placed in our registers. But uh, as of the 1st of January, uh, we're supposed to have the radical change of this business process. No, not a single scan uh, will be here with us. Uh, it will be the structured electronic contract, smart contract, in other words and all the data are going to migrate from one document to another uh, for the sake of the business control. And uh, actually, uh, all the amendments uh, to the law are to be taken into account and all the contracts, all the termination of the contracts, invoices, uh, absolutely all documents uh, conjugated to that contract will be uh, digitized and it will be the sole uh, platform for electronic purchase. And operator of the universal uh, information system keeps track uh, of this document transmission. And a special uh, digital platform has all these documents pulled together. And we have the entire picture from Kaliningrad uh, to the Far East. And uh, that is all due to the amendments uh, to 144 law. It is the um, optimizational draft law. And we are aimed at optimization and uh, uh, digitalization, the entire system of payments. I would like uh, to identify three mainstreams, uh, three trends, and that is the electronic uh, uh, structure, the contract, and it is the real revolution. And uh, we are dealing here with the uh, specific amount of the analytical data, uh, which becomes indispensable for all the customers. And it will allow us uh, uh, to bring this type of uh, work at another level. And also the service uh, quality will uh, grow significantly and uh, we are no longer dealing with the paper and no longer we will be um, uh, sharing information via papers. No, everything will be um, provided in the electronic format due to the new law. And the second trend to identify or the uh, basis of this uh, draft law is that we get the transfer to the automated payments and it allows us to keep track of the entire treasury system and it will be also the auto payment uh, uh, treasury format we are not a standard bank we do not uh, uh, act as a standard bank and sometimes the bank is not in charge 
of where the payment should go. They just provide their services to the physical persons and legal entities, and they do not take the burden of responsibility that one businessman gave some erroneous amount to another businessman. And the Treasury keeps track of the multitude of transactions, and they are fully in charge of some supervisory um, operations. And uh, actually, um, these limits uh, are also identified at this level. And we do control uh, the series of national projects. And indeed, uh, we have to keep track as uh, to uh, the result of the, that uh, public procurement. And the contract should, for example, of um, uh, ch children's apparel should not contain any provision about the motor vehicle uh, procurement. That is some kind of a mix of services. And we exercise a very complicated uh, level of control, but it is embedded into this uh, draft law that seven or 10 working days are necessitated instead of 30 to exercise all the payment uh, um, uh, control and uh, supervision operations. And uh, these data will be checked on the automated basis. Uh, we will be guided by one algorithm of the universal information system. And that is another breakthrough of our system of payments, um, I mean uh, uh, public payments and all the attendees uh, to that particular process will pretty soon bear fruit and uh, it will save our time and uh, actually make a system smart and innovations will be introduced and uh, really it incurs the serious changes and modifications and billions of transactions are being processed by our system. And the third trend is the uh, supervisory system will be brought to the system of compliance. And uh, we are supposed to get very tangible results due to that new innovation. And we will have the structured big data. And thus, um, our controllers do analyze that system and they may shape up that, that type of uh, reports uh, for the analytical base, uh, for the analytical purposes. But uh, we are guided by a specific algorithm thus processing big data. And it allows us uh, to uh, just shape up the profile of risk per customer. And in order to avoid all these risks, so we may use the online information and uh, Actually, we may start cooperating with our counter agents. And if they do something wrong, uh, so we may impose sanctions. No, we may say that we see a real potential for violation in your transactions. And we try to warn you that your contract uh, incurs a certain risk. And so if you do not avoid that risks, uh, you will be subject by sanctions in position. And this is a part of the auditing support. And we are supposed to have uh, about uh, 3 million uh, participants uh, to that process. And it only could be done through the uh, digital alg algorithm of the system, assessing the risk profile and uh, forming some uh, uh, potential infringements, identifying some potential infringements. And I would like to show it on a slide. My slide is visible, yes. And so our colleagues should have a clear understanding of the digital platform for our uh, public procurement. So we have uh, 70 billion transactions a year, and that's the federal uh, treasury data. And we see the protocols here, uh, we see special receipts here, 
uh, for blocking the funds uh, uh, for the sake of limits, uh, limitation, and uh, actually the market participants uh, do not uh, find themselves in the situation when something is not paid for. Uh, big data from procurement is 1139 terabyte, ter terabyte of information, and it's about uh, uh, 30 thousand digitized Russian libraries and uh, also the bulk of the information will be very well structured and it is subject to a high quality analysis. Uh, 24 million of the lines of code uh, will be provided uh, and this is uh, the largest information system um, in Europe and we have uh, quite an infrastructure for supporting and maintaining the system. We have a serious uh, team of uh, specialists and they are fully in charge of the infrastructure support and IT support, which is substantial for business. And uh, we also have about 70 million electronically, uh, legally significant electronic documents. And we are abiding by the law number 44 and 223. And uh, the laws um, and on the contracts, and they are all related to the public procurement. And they are subject uh, to the regulation by the government. And we also tried uh, to somehow assess how much we managed to save due to this new system of the e-document uh, flow. And already these savings may constitute about 25 billion rubles. And also we save um, uh, the, um, the uh, technology, uh, notary office, then the paper, and the quite, uh, then um, stationary, etc. And uh, 25 billion is a very, very striking number. And uh, our colleagues already gave us some information on that score. And also they take into account the B2B sector. And uh, also the majority of them use the universal digital platform. And that is one of the key trends for us to identify. And uh, I would like to switch off my presentation. Um, I actually wanted very briefly uh, to say a few words about how we work. And I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. And uh, there were no specific uh, questions addressed to you and you are too busy and uh, probably uh, you have to run uh, uh, away now. And um, thank you for coming and uh, uh, from the perspective of IT companies who would like uh, to wish uh, that your technical implementation part uh, will be uh, successful in all the aspects. Uh, dear colleagues, we proceed with our deliberations and uh, let me give the floor to uh, Mr. Uh, Vasala Filip, Vasala Filip Artemich. He is the head of the Department for Normative Work of the Electronic Platform, RTS Tender. He is, uh, has a, a PhD in law. Is going to develop on judicial practice of recovery of losses in the contract system. Dear friends, dear colleagues, at and is to the ninth international conference, and thank you for the opportunity to have a say. And we do hope that sooner or later uh, we will uh, get together at the offline mode and not online. These are the key terms for us. And just the last speaker uh, shared. Uh, very interesting information with us on their um, daily practice on the procurement at the level of the Moscow State University and also the news shared uh, about the new law uh, adopted by the State Duma. And the focal point of my uh, presentation is how to avoid losses and how to recover uh, losses and indemnify uh, within the contract system. 
and uh, we uh, the, by the way this part uh, of the law hasn't been amended the representative of the federal treasury dwelt upon other aspects of that system but i do realize that uh, what we are talking now indemnification in the contract system uh, is uh, uh, should be analyzed and some recommendations are required and we have a translation in youtube and we have quite a number of comments and specifically uh, to the role of the companies uh, who take part in the procurement process within the law number 44 FESA and 223 FESA. And we uh, put together a very professional audience, uh, which becomes indispensable for us. And uh, the legal faculty of the Moscow State University is the organizer of that conference. And you should be proud of that. And already such community has been uh, uh, established things to the Moscow State University efforts. Let me say a few words about the indemnification and uh, when the contract is performed and when uh, uh, something is done unilaterally. And uh, as of 2013, uh, this uh, provision uh, was enacted and the second uh, package of amendments uh, didn't change this particular norm and uh, the essence of that norm is that uh, some agent uh, at the level of the contract unilaterally decided to terminate the contract and they uh, try to recover the losses uh, due to some decisions made uh, by uh, the other party. And we have quite a number of questions to arise uh, in that sphere. And uh, pretty often our um, customers are municipal or government bodies and they may come across uh, uh, some goods and services provided uh, in bad faith and uh, the customer may say no to such services. And so uh, economically, the logics of the law uh, is not visible uh, when we speak about the bad faith. And uh, the legislation may give uh, some kind of uh, limited options for indemnification. Nevertheless, uh, um, the law uh, gives the right uh, and gives an opportunity for losses to be recovered. And uh, we say that there are quite a number uh, of losses which are incurred as a part of the public procure procurement. But so far, we do not have uh, too many court cases on that score. Nevertheless, I, I'll try to say a few words about uh, one case. Uh, which was brought to the level of the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation as of the 23rd of December 2020. And the customer unilaterally terminated the law and then the information had to be forwarded to the anti-monopoly service as to the in indemnification procedure. And the situation uh, was uh, quite a paradoxical one. And uh, the uh, um, the customer couldn't give any argumentation why they waived the contract. And uh, thus, the anti monopoly service decided to take a decision that, uh, that the company uh, will not be included in the register of uh, the unfaithful suppliers, but uh, there should be some uh, losses recovered and indemnified at the level of the services cost. And that should be done at the level of the commission of uh, anti-monopoly service. So we can see that these damages are subject to recovery. Uh, and in this dispute, you can see the amount because uh, the court um, indicated uh, that there is uh, uh, the um, cause um, and the reason um, between um, uh, the activities which were uh, done uh, by uh, the customer and also the necessity uh, to attract legal uh, uh, aid um, for the company to protect its interests uh, when um, it uh, 
considered uh, this dispute in at anti-monopoly uh, service. Uh, so you can see uh, that um, damages uh, uh, for, uh, you know, um, payment of lawyers uh, were recovered. And uh, another case, um, very similar, uh, the contract uh, for uh, delivery uh, was uh, concluded uh, in accordance um, uh, with uh, the federal law 5740. And uh, there were some faults uh, in the uh, good, goods delivered. Uh, customer refused um, uh, to um, pay for this uh, and uh, unfair um, activities uh, uh, in accordance with the federal anti-monopoly service uh, were absent here and the company could not be registered as unfair. Uh, here, the position of the court um, is very similar to the Supreme Court position. We can see uh, that in, uh, in our um, court uh, practice, speaking about arbitrary courts, uh, they look at positions of Supreme Court. And um, as uh, in the previous uh, case, these damages uh, um, in the volume of um, um, expenses uh, for lawyers, uh, for legal uh, help uh, were recovered. And our um, uh, court practice uh, is not always uh, um, one and the same, and there are very uh, different contradictory uh, uh, court uh, solutions. I uh, analyzed uh, the practice of courts uh, during the last uh, six um, months, and you can see that here uh, there are some similarities when contract was concluded and uh, our customer made the decision about refusal. Uh, the company did not get into RMP. Uh, we don't know uh, what um, they had, why. Uh, and uh, then the company applied to the arbitrary court uh, uh, with the request to recover 100,000 uh, 100, rubles. Um, and in this uh, dispute, uh, the concession court, not uh, the first instance, but concession court refused to recover damages uh, because it indicated uh, on the absence uh, of uh, um, uh, this, uh, the recall cause and reason connection. And uh, also um, uh, we can see uh, that there is no um, uh, continuous uh, practice, court practice. Uh, and uh, the position of the Supreme Court uh, uh, is not um, uh, uh, here. Uh, the, the main thing here is not the legal practice. Uh, the um, obligation uh, of uh, customer is uh, to send information um, uh, to anti-monopoly service to exclude or even or not to include uh, the company into this list. And then uh, anti-monopoly uh, service uh, can have two different uh, uh, solutions. But in this, in the disputes which we consider now, uh, it was not spoken about the company application to arbitrary court uh, that it was uh, invalid. Now the company uh, indicate, indicated here uh, that uh, the sufficient uh, ground for uh, recovery of damages uh, of um, for legal um, services is the fact uh, of refusal of anti-monopoly service. And there are two cases uh, which uh, uh, were um, uh, done not many years ago, and our courts uh, interpreted uh, these cases very differently. Pay attention to another slide. Uh, what happened here? Both parties of the contract decided to refuse for it. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, as a result uh, of um, court disputes, uh, uh, the um, um, uh, the uh, so the refuse uh, of a customer was uh, considered to be illegal, uh, and uh, uh, they said uh, that uh, uh, they spoke about lost profit, uh, potential lost profit, uh, and uh, the courts. Uh, uh, put here not uh, a clear position. They refused uh, uh, in satisfaction of this uh, uh, claim, uh, referring, referring uh, to uh, uh, the part 23 of the article 95 of the law 44. So this uh, provision of the law uh, is not, does not regulate such cases. 
uh, we um, in the law of the contract system it's written about something else and we can see the decision of the court the court of uh, um, uh, different institutions. Now, when we consider disputes linked with damage recoveries, uh, not always uh, uh, this, um, uh, this uh, our judges uh, uh, don't have this uh, um, uh, damages recovery because they understand that these uh, um, damages will be compensated uh, uh, through the budget. And uh, maybe that's why we receive such strange solutions. And uh, this uh, solution uh, is done by courts of concession uh, instance. Uh, but uh, we have another position. Uh, and uh, on the next slide, you can see uh, this about one side refusal from the contract uh, and uh, the executor of um, um, the services did not refuse and it uh, uh, asked uh, for a recovery of uh, lost uh, profit. And here you can see uh, that uh, uh, part 23 uh, so um, does not uh, resolve this issue uh, when the refusal of the from the contract is not illegal. Uh, and uh, I hear uh, we can see that the realization of this uh, uh, profit uh, is not clear. You, I can see that the position of the court is right here because this part 23, article 95, does not give an answer to the question what to do in such cases. And if it's so, we uh, should um, use uh, the article 15 of the civil law if uh, these um, uh, damages are proved in the court, the court can um, only um, um, make uh, one decision to recover these damages. And of course, um, our practice, court practice, um, is linked with uh, uh, damages in contract um, system is only being formed uh, during recent years. But if we uh, speak about work practice, uh, damage recovery, it's uh, one of the most widely spread uh, protection of civil rights. Uh, and uh, that's why um, uh, I think uh, uh, we can see that courts uh, um, can face uh, not very clear regulation. I speak about now part 23, and also they have to um, uh, resolve uh, these uh, things, uh, as we can see on the slide. Uh, when uh, the law doesn't give any answer uh, and uh, it is um, decided uh, through another article 15 article uh, the first part of civil code uh, that is why um, of course uh, now uh, during uh, last years um, in russia uh, the main trend is uh, digitalization and we uh, have we always speak about it this is good and this is right uh, but on the other side, um, on the other part, uh, these um, uh, civil uh, legal relationships, they also need attention, not only legislators, but also uh, companies um, uh, who in, in where our companies work. And that's why um, I think that um, short term prospect, uh, uh, we need uh, to change uh, uh, this uh, uh, regulation uh, linked uh, with uh, recovery of damages uh, um, uh, <clears throat> in our law in the contract system it leaves much to be desired to tell the truth uh, and that's why um, we uh, receive different uh, uh, solutions court solutions and different uh, uh, court practice but maybe this practice uh, maybe will be a stop factor uh, when um, uh, our uh, customers uh, used uh, this right uh, for uh, this refusal at the some stages of contract fulfillment. Uh, so this one uh, part uh, refuse, it's a powerful instrument uh, uh, in uh, uh, the um, uh, in the in the hands of our um, a customer, I would not recommend it uh, all, all the time to do because we can see that uh, sometimes companies uh, have uh, 
uh, uh, the right to uh, require uh, the uh, uh, needs uh, and uh, when the contract uh, um, uh, you know, terminates the contract one way, he uh, says that the result of procurement is zero. And all our um, activities starting uh, from planning to receiving uh, is aimed um, uh, to, um, to fulfill the contracts uh, in time and well, uh, without any um, things. Uh, I would like to invite you all to our Telegram uh, channel. Uh, uh, procurement and state uh, procurement. This is public channel, and I can't but say that in April I um, published the book Digitalization of Civil uh, Turnover. Uh, this is um, the first volume, and uh, soon I will have for the second volume. We'll have huge plans for 2021, uh, and I will be glad if you read our books as well. Uh, uh, that is all what I wanted to say. Um, I switched off uh, the demonstration. I hope that I fit uh, uh, this uh, my time limit. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you were great uh, regarding fitting the schedule. Uh, you like you are like German guy practically. We have Austrian guys today. I think after lunch, uh, as if uh, you just. Uh, um, you're very punctual today. It was very interesting. So this conference, this uh, presentation was uh, very interesting for us. Uh, dear colleagues, we proceed. Let's uh, go to another speaker. Uh, and uh, let's um, go to the central um, uh, uh, section of uh, the anti-monopoly surface. Um, uh, so uh, um, uh, this is uh, Azaur Tanasuf, deputy head of uh, uh, control um, uh, uh, procurement uh, of energy monopoly service. Hello. Uh, uh, spoke a lot um, about the very interesting things. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think um, uh, his presentation was very practical for me, and uh, maybe we'll uh, have some corrections uh, <laughs> on uh, the results uh, of today's meeting. And um, what can I say uh, regarding uh, this issue and share useful information? We already discussed uh, the draft law. Uh, which um, uh, was adopted. I hope it will be going soon. Uh, so uh, we uh, have the change of appearance system. We can uh, uh, give um, uh, the appearance uh, through the functionality of the United Information System. But uh, since uh, the July of this year, anti-monopoly service and the uh, treasury uh, decided to um, uh, uh, think about this um, uh, submission and uh, give an opportunity uh, uh, for participants to appeal through one system, uh, through one unified system. And uh, but still, uh, they can also um, uh, make appeals um, uh, through other uh, things. Um, in uh, uh, our uh, plan, uh, it's written that um, appeal, 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 appeals uh, can be done um, uh, in a written form and on the electronic um, platform. Uh, we can have signed uh, and submitted uh, uh, submitted appeal. Uh, maybe there can be electronic digital signature as well. But with this, uh, in order to uh, a given opportunity to, uh, to try technical things and to understand how this procedure uh, will work. Um, I can uh, repeat myself that we'll give an opportunity uh, for the participant to appeal uh, through the unified single uh, information system. Only those um, uh, can appeal who are registered in uh, the single register of participants. And here I would like um, uh, to say about one more thing. Uh, the administrative regulation today uh, does not contain some special regulations uh, of uh, uh, document submission through one system, uh, but uh, 
uh, still um, we have an opportunity um, uh, also to do this in electronic way. Some changes uh, will uh, uh, be um, entered um, in uh, our instructions and will give recommendations to our partners and um, also appeals um, done uh, through the this uh, system will be considered to be uh, that uh, these uh, appeals are uh, submitted uh, through uh, our uh, NC monopoly service. Um, so uh, this law will be adopted uh, and uh, uh, we have different, we are preparing different acts and there will be some changes done in this act. Uh, what are advantages uh, of uh, appeal submission uh, uh, through this United system, unified system. We can use uh, this opportunity since July. Uh, this um, is uh, a formal, um, uh, this should be quite formal. And now um, uh, we'll uh, have uh, uh, some grounds for appeal return. Uh, so um, the functionality will form uh, uh, this, uh, uh, and you can uh, you can even make an appeal if there are not some small elements uh, which uh, are considered uh, sh which should be here. Uh, so um, automatically you will have a form and you will submit this appeal. Uh, and you can hope that still will have uh, will have this uh, done when you appeal uh, this uh, automatically uh, uh, so you can um, conclude the agreement with customers and i think uh, it will have an impact uh, uh, so if we have such a tool uh, to the participant uh, maybe um, you can i uh, see here uh, uh, some uh, advantages um, and custom for customers it will be easier to work uh, because appeal uh, consideration uh, um, will become even more interactive uh, and if uh, we um, immediately receive this appeal uh, we can um, uh, consider this not within five days for example uh, but uh, on the second third day uh, uh, and uh, then uh, it will be automatic. Uh, such changes uh, are, wait, are waiting for us in July, and we'll see how it works. Uh, we'll look at the response of professional uh, um, society, com community, and then uh, maybe we'll recommend uh, it. Uh, and uh, maybe and that is all that I wanted to say. If you, if you want to ask questions, please ask. Uh, thank you very much. So our participants, uh, the, the conference participants uh, <clears throat> uh, have um, some uh, restricted time limit. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, we ask so many questions uh, to the representatives of federal anti-monopoly service. We don't uh, have any precise uh, um, questions, uh, but if we have them out of a sudden, out of the blue, we'll ask them, okay? But right now we don't have them. Uh, we hope that uh, we'll, uh, we'll have them in the future and, and we'll send them to you. Dear colleagues, now I'd like to give the floor to uh, Deputy Head uh, uh, of um, uh, the Federal Anti Monopoly Service. Uh, uh, Gorbachev, Olga Viktorovna, uh, Deputy Head of the State Defense Order Control Department of the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. Uh, hello, I, uh, you did not switch on my video, that's why you can't see me. Okay, sorry, just a moment. Organizers will do this right now. Попробуйте сейчас. Сейчас попробуем. Здравствуйте. Вот, отлично. Ну, отлично. 
Рада вас приветствовать. Спасибо большое. I'm happy to see you all here. Thank you for invitation to participate in this conference. Um, yesterday, uh, it was a very important uh, event uh, regarding uh, uh, procurement. Uh, uh, and uh, we uh, uh, adopted uh, the draft law. Uh, so, and um, it was uh, all about uh, those painstaking issues and challenges in our sphere. And this uh, law will become very handy. So, the modifications uh, are. Uh, yet to come, and uh, the legal regulatory framework uh, will uh, somehow be modified, uh, but the bylaws will be changed, and the code on, on the, of the Russian Federation on the administrative law will be adjusted as well, and. Uh, Actually, uh, there could be some violations uh, incurred uh, in uh, uh, providing the documentation in the wrong way. But uh, if in the indemnification is necessitated, uh, well, we cannot uh, somehow formulate how responsibility could be assessed. And uh, the Ministry of Finance and the Treasury uh, will become a part of this process. That's how to take it into account. Uh, and the code of the Russian Federation, the administrative code, uh, needs to be modified as well on that score. Uh, in the sphere of uh, uh, forty four. Uh, law enforcement, the administrative responsibility is uh, provisioned uh, and it is related to all the stages uh, of the uh, procurement and at the level of the contracts implementation. And originally we thought about uh, 45 uh, uh, amendments uh, to the uh, substance of the law and actually this uh, list was shrinked and uh, uh, has shrunk and actually uh, we now talk about the collective responsibility and uh, thus we have to define as to the supplier's fault, it's uh, within the amount of 20,000, 50,000 rubles. But with your regard to the new concept on the law offense, the minimum uh, amount to be paid is 5,000 and maximum is 50,000 and maximum level is retained. And uh, actually, we have to think of the uh, penalties and uh, fines level. And we have uh, uh, colleagues from other countries here. And it is about $800 equivalent. That's a maximum fine. But the uh, uh, government officials uh, uh, should not be fined more than $800. But as to the new law, uh, with your regard to, to the documentation which we issue and the customer uh, hereby has to indicate all the requirements for, for the procurement and uh, to the potential suppliers. And uh, this list should be clear cut. And uh, with due regard to the new norm, uh, the uh, customer, while presenting 
a notification should define the uh, method and a person who uh, uh, well is submitting an application uh, should be a part of the uh, um, follow-up procedures and he should be aware of the provisions and norms of the federal law number 44 and he bears an administrative responsibility uh, to this end and it becomes just natural that each customer has a contract service and if it's uh, just uh, 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 mid-level uh, customer they are not supposed to have such a branch or division but uh, certain organizations are supposed to have a unit uh, to prepare the documentation uh, for public procurements and therefore there should be a person in charge of this particular unit and he will be fully in charge of all the documents submission notification application and they had to abide by the ruling of the law number 44 and uh, the application uh, should be provided um, in a clear-cut wording and uh, everything should be done perfect uh, what about the fines and penalties the amount nowadays of a penalty is differentiated. It should not be necessarily only 30,000 or 50,000. It may vary from 5,000 up to 50,000 rubles. What about the form of notification? If uh, the, there are some uh, abnormal requirements provided uh, to the application, to the list of participants, to the structure. Everything of that sort will be qualified as the infringement of the requirements envisaged by the law, uh, meaning the documents, uh, formalization uh, procedure. And if uh, the number of parties uh, to that procedure will be uh, somehow limited, uh, that will be another infringement and uh, hereby the fine will be not that high. It could be like 10,000 rubles or so. But uh, the uh, some severe circumstances may bring about a higher uh, fine. Uh, so if, this, uh, if there is a limited number of uh, participants, it could be the imposition uh, of a fine within the amount of 30,000 up to 50,000. And thus we may somehow address this issue. There's no sound, sorry. Someone uh, turned off my sound. Uh, looks like I am talking about uh, some unpleasant things. No, it's okay. So today uh, we are guided by a specific procedure. If we have uh, some specific uh, requirements for the documentation, and if we do not abide by the ruling, a special commission uh, is liable uh, for that particular infringement. And uh, everyone will be fined. Those uh, who uh, took part in this uh, type of activity. Uh, the new law presupposes that if the documentation is uh, compiled uh, in such a form that uh, the application was rejected. Uh, uh, the person uh, responsible for documentation is liable for that. And uh, actually, uh, we may have uh, some provisions uh, for decision making uh, in terms of application 
Uh, and uh, but there are some exceptions which I have just described. If uh, the documentation is compiled uh, not in a proper way. And in this case, uh, the Commission will not uh, have uh, any claims in that case. And uh, let me remind you that uh, a special measure of uh, uh, liability is imposed uh, uh, that a person uh, should be uh, warned, should be warned uh, as he potentially uh, could become liable for the law infringement. That uh, when that is uh, just applicable to the first time, to the first era. Uh, we have such mechanism in place nowadays, but uh, in the special contract documents, this particular provision is not yet well defined. And uh, the uh, public uh, funds uh, are specifically protected. And uh, therefore, uh, we uh, interpret this particular violation as um, exercised in the sphere of the specially protected interests. And uh, each uh, uh, aspect of uh, public procurement uh, presupposes uh, uh, to apply the uh, provisions of the law uh, and have uh, those irresponsible people Ill Ill uh, to become liable for the infringement of the law. And, and nowadays we are guided by a specific uh, criteria and if the offense is substantial, it will be a high fine but if a person says uh, yes and he actually agrees with his violation or it was done for the first time, uh, so the fine will be not very high. Uh, and uh, the uh, officials committing an error uh, may not necessarily even be fined. They could. Uh, uh, be uh, just uh, uh, orally warned about their uh, wrong actions. And uh, that is uh, how we act nowadays uh, within that field. And by that, I'm going to wrap up. I think I haven't yet exceeded my time limit. And I would like to give the floor to the moderator. Thank you, Olga Viktorovna. Olga Viktorovna, uh, we have a question to you. No, oh no, not a single one. A couple of questions on uh, on the YouTube. Uh, could you please follow uh, what is visible there? Uh, what about the conditions uh, of the fixed uh, price uh, for the contract? Could you please copy it and send it to the chart, the, the Zoom chart? They come from the YouTube. Uh, I may uh, answer the first question. And there should be no price minimization in the contract. Uh, yeah, that becomes quite uh, obvious. And the second question, who is liable for the partial uh, payment uh, for the contract? Uh, the head of the entity signing the document or the performance. I can't hear you very well, sorry. I have a good mic here. No, I hear you pretty well. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yes, and the second question should be you. Uh, Olga Viktorovna. Uh, so, I do not have anything in the chat. Uh, 
I do not have any uh, uh, question here in the chat. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. Uh, it was uh, quite uh, useful and you haven't exceeded the time limit. Thank you so much. Uh, Olga Victorina, dear colleagues, allow me to give the floor to our next speaker. Uh, the deputy head of the Federal Treasury Department for the Tver region, Yelena Ravilina, is going to dwell upon force majeure circumstances in procurement in accordance with the provisions of the contract system law. And, uh, I uh, promised uh, uh, to our South uh, Korean uh, colleagues uh, to have a similar presentation dedicated to that uh, topic. So, uh, force majeure, uh, the extra circumstances uh, with regard to the contract system law. As of today, uh, this uh, particular subject is a topical one and it is mostly related to COVID-19 and to other aspects. And uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, entails serious uh, problems uh, with the um, state contract implementation. At the territory of the Russian Federation last year, in April 2020, uh, the uh, uh, joint uh, statement uh, uh, with uh, MRCOM and the Ministry of Finance, uh, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service was assigned uh, and uh, it uh, recognizes that the prevalence of the coronavirus uh, is a force uh, majeure circumstance. And uh, if we analyze uh, the judicial practice, uh, there are quite a number of cases of that sort uh, related to the coronavirus. And uh, force majeure circumstances are conjugated with corona virus, uh, and uh, sometimes they uh, just give a, put an extra burden on the contract uh, to the both parties uh, to the contract. And thus, I would like to say a few words about the force majeure circumstances from the perspective of the law and how it could be viewed from the perspective of the judicial practice and the federal law. And uh, I would like uh, to get attributed uh, to the civil law uh, and if somebody fails uh, to comply with his or her obligations, uh, they uh, are not uh, freed uh, from the liability. And it should be done on the basis of uh, the personal responsibility. Article 401 uh, provisions that the person fails to comply with uh, his obligations uh, uh, in the sphere of uh, business uh, bear responsibility, but uh, he could be liberated from his obligations in uh, so the circumstances of force majeure. And uh, the civil code uh, in uh, this pertinent article is not attributed uh, to the force majeure circumstances. And thus, uh, we uh, uh, actually may come across the situation when a borrower doesn't have extra funding uh, to cover uh, his debt. And uh, COVID is attributed uh, to the circumstances of force majeure, but the law doesn't give a clear understanding of uh, the uh, emergency situation or urgent circumstances. And in order to understand clearly what force majeure is all about, uh, uh, we have uh, to get uh, to the level of the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, 24th of March 2018, and the Supreme Court formulates uh, force majeure or urgent uh, situations uh, when uh, we come across some uh, 
uh, circumstances uh, which uh, could hardly be overcome. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Supreme Court also gives uh, some kind of explanation as uh, to what a force majeure uh, circumstances uh, may uh, mean. And if, for example, the borrower doesn't have any funding uh, due to the acts of the counter agents. And actually, uh, we have to describe uh, the new provision of the Russian, uh, uh, Russian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so regarding the uh, circumstances uh, which are uh, unavoidable, inevitable, so this can terminate contracts, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so then uh, we uh, uh, can't control uh, these um, events. Besides, in the same provision, um, uh, the um, uh, trade of commerce, industry of commerce, uh, gives a list uh, of uh, events uh, unavoidable events, uh, these are disasters, earth, uh, floodings, fires, and the uh, pandemic, and others. And uh, wh why uh, is it interesting to have this formulation for us, uh, which uh, was given uh, by the uh, Chamber of uh, in, uh, Commerce and uh, Trade. Uh, here, we have identification of this uh, circumstances uh, and uh, this uh, can give a certificates so appropriate certificates these certificates uh, are given in accordance uh, with uh, the conditions uh, of international contracts uh, so when we consider uh, practice code practice uh, uh, the measures uh, of uh, uh, contradiction counteracting of this pandemic, the Supreme Court uh, confirmed this list uh, uh, from the 21st of April 2020, in which uh, it was indicated that uh, for consideration of the issues uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for getting rid of responsibility, uh, it is possible to uh, give uh, certificates uh, to the court uh, which uh, uh, prove um, uh, these circumstances, unavoidable circumstances, uh, are given uh, by the appropriate bodies. So these uh, certificates uh, from this uh, chamber can be considered as a document uh, proving um, uh, appearance of these uh, circumstances. Uh, and um, I think uh, uh, from uh, provision three, uh, Article 24 of the Civil Code and uh, explanations uh, which is uh, given by the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation. Uh, we can say that uh, uh, this um, uh, force majeure circumstances uh, uh, can include uh, unavoidable uh, circumstances which uh, uh, could not uh, lead uh, to fulfillment of obligations. Uh, then uh, another question is raised. Uh, who uh, can um, be responsible here? And um, uh, again, we have uh, different uh, clarifications of the Supreme Court, the burden of proof uh, uh, of appearance of such uh, uh, circumstances, uh, which can be ground for, um, um, for uh, religion from responsibility, uh, can be uh, seen at the debtors. Um, and uh, another, in which uh, uh, can uh, be uh, uh, considered here what uh, um, uh, can uh, be seen here. Uh, so we need uh, uh, to give the, the evidence that the circumstances were really emergent and unavoidable. Uh, and the Supreme Court, in its um, overview from the 21st of April 2020, also gave a certain uh, clarifications uh, and uh, registered proofs uh, which should be given uh, uh, to the court to exclude uh, uh, to 
uh, to have the responsibility. So first of all, uh, uh, the um, uh, cause and effect uh, connection, impossibility to fulfill these uh, circumstances, um, and not to be a, a part of the of creation of these circumstances and the creation of reasonable measures to avoid these circumstances. So we can say uh, that such in such circumstances, uh, that is, uh, should uh, say this, uh, that uh, uh, he can take measures uh, to minimize possible risks. What uh, are the uh, consequences? Uh, what uh, what con consequences can be here for debtors and creditors? What will happen to the contract, uh, to liabilities, in case uh, if we have such circumstances? And in this case, um, uh, the legislation uh, does not uh, give any clarifications here. Uh, and um, uh, um, again, uh, the Supreme Court uh, uh, gives uh, uh, different um, clarifications here, uh, which uh, clarified. Um, and then uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, uh, circumstances, uh, enforced measure circumstances, uh, do not terminate uh, uh, fulfillment uh, of uh, responsibilities uh, of that and the credit uh, um, also uh, should not cannot uh, refuse uh, from uh, the contract and that that uh, that is not responsible for credit uh, uh, when uh, there are some delays uh, if there are force majeure circumstances and in such a way uh, we uh, realized uh, that uh, party data uh, can not, should not, cannot be responsible, cannot be held responsible if it's proved uh, that uh, the reasons uh, are uh, the uh, uh, force majeure circumstances. Regarding the federal law 44, federal law, it also contains some provisions uh, which um, envisage uh, grounding for uh, um, releasing responsibility, uh, part two, article 36 of the federal law 44, uh, when uh, so um, there is uh, uh, till um, till of concluding the contract, uh, uh, customer uh, can um, uh, refuse from uh, fulfilling of his obligations only if there are force majeure circumstances. The Article ninety three also indicates uh, the provision where a customer can proc have procurement from one. Uh, uh, supply if there is emergency medical aid uh, or um, accidents uh, circumstances um, to liquidate uh, uh, some uh, emergency force majeure situations and also to render um, some help. Uh, in 39 article um, uh, 43, the, fe the federal law 43 indicates that the parties um, uh, also um, are not responsible uh, for some uh, obligations um, if uh, uh, some uh, uh, unavoidable circumstances took place. And also the provision in part uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of excluding of um, responsibility uh, envisaged by the contract um, uh, the changes of the conditions, uh, 95 article, uh, part 234, in, in uh, case if uh, the contract is concluded uh, for the period of not less than three years, uh, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, there are some changes uh, because of force majeure circumstances, um, you can make amendments uh, besides uh, the article 95, part 29, also, we have a possibility to make amendments uh, in state um, contracts if uh, contracts um, in these parts of this law. It says uh, about uh, contracts, the subject of which uh, uh, is fulfilling of construction, capital repair works, uh, and uh, preservation of cultural heritage. Uh, and considering, considering of this uh, uh, force majeure circumstances, uh, pricing and uh, the dance can change in this case. And now um, I would like um, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, another question. What uh, can we do if um, uh, there are um, 
uh, if uh, so legislation uh, does not uh, uh, say what uh, data has to um, uh, to do in this case and um, uh, the supreme uh, court also regulates uh, this issue and the supreme court indicates that a data has uh, um, undertake reasonable measures uh, to minimize damage for creditor uh, uh, to inform first of all credit about this uh, um, this circumstances and to recover damages and um, accordingly, um, this notice uh, uh, should be sent uh, within reasonable deadlines uh, regarding um, uh, period time, timeline uh, here. Now, timelines are indicated um, in part of um, signing of state procurement uh, uh, with a reference of force measure circumstances. Uh, uh, this is um, in... Um, uh, several laws and several articles and there it's indicated so that in case of uh, uh, having a uh, uh, circumstance uh, force measure circumstances um, one party by one party has to inform another party about such circumstances within one day and at that uh, uh, then um, uh, it is a delay not more than for 30 days. Uh, if uh, such circumstances are terminated, appropriate party has to inform another party about it um, uh, on uh, the day after the day of termination of the circumstances. In the cases uh, when uh, uh, the uh, force majeure circumstances stay, Assist, uh, the federal law doesn't have this uh, law answer for this um, if they stay. And uh, here again, uh, we have to refer to clarifications uh, from the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, and uh, we see uh, uh, that if uh, uh, these circumstances, um, which are not responsible by parties, uh, uh, if they, if they led to a full uh, or partial uh, objective unfulfillment of these uh, uh, obligations, uh, so this uh, uh, contract should be terminated fully in accordance with the civil law of the Russian Federation. And this is uh, all uh, what I wanted to uh, say about uh, the uh, force majeure circumstances, but also start speaking about the court. In our practice, I would like to say that we can uh, um, state uh, that uh, uh, the force major circumstances are quite uh, uh, relative. Um, and if um, a data considers uh, or understands uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, circumstance um, can be referred to force major, uh, in this case, so we can recommend to. Um, uh, get familiar with the court practice because it's very variable and courts always interpret differently these uh, circumstances when uh, they uh, consider different cases. And uh, also I would like uh, to recommend legislators uh, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, formulate uh, these force measure circumstances uh, at the legislation level for the parties uh, to understand uh, clearly what consequences uh, it could have for them and what uh, do they need to do to avoid responsibility uh, if state procurement uh, is not fulfilled. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Eugenia. Uh, I think it's very actual to speak about force major circumstances during uh, uh, COVID-19 and, um, and I, I, I think that our foreign speakers also will speak a lot about it today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Colleagues, um, uh, okay, okay, I would like to give the floor to our next uh, speaker who will finalize the presentations uh, um, of uh, uh, speakers from Russia, and this will be Kazantsev, uh, Dmitry Alexandrovich, um, uh, the uh, candidate of legal uh, science, uh, the topic of uh, uh, initiative packet on uh, the federal uh, law, risks and prospects. Uh,
Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, to finalize uh, this Russian section at the Russian at the international conference. It's not surprising uh, that today uh, uh, that today I'll speak about this topic. Um, Anna already mentioned this uh, things. Um, uh, we can see um, uh, that um, uh, the second um, optimization packet was adopted, uh, and today I will speak not only about uh, uh, the optimization packet, um, but uh, uh, still we hope that uh, this announced uh, uh, changes uh, in the part of heritage uh, or in the part of um, automatic payments. Uh, from uh, the contracts will work, but today I will speak about some uh, key uh, novelties uh, which uh, have global meaning uh, for regulation of procurement in Russia and uh, go on outside of the framework of the state procurement. Colleagues can ask me why uh, do we speak about uh, the Article 2 to 3 if we speak about optimization packet. Uh, in uh, the law about contract system, uh, and uh, we uh, can uh, uh, here uh, uh, speak about two uh, laws, but it's not like this. Now uh, we can look um, not only at the opinions uh, of separate uh, uh, of, se of separate uh, regulators. Uh, uh, who uh, say this is like one law uh, and uh, uh, they speak about the subject of the law two to three and they speak about different supplies uh, but um, however in order it's it's uh, uh, only important not uh, uh, to speak about uh, different individuals but also courts so now uh, I stick to the same uh, logics, uh, not maybe precedented cases, but um, are two. I can set examples of two cases um, of uh, the arbitrage court of Moscow district. Uh, uh, suppliers were refused to be paid in both cases uh, uh, in accordance with the contract, in spite of the fact uh, that the contract was signed uh, in accordance with the court uh, two to three. Uh, but uh, uh, the refuse um, in uh, payment was done in accordance with the law 44, federal law 44. The first case happened on the 9th of July. And um, here uh, the court uh, uh, supported uh, uh, the customer who said that uh, he uh, accidentally uh, mistake, mis was mistaken in uh, how to do uh, procurement. Uh, like uh, this uh, supplier, 100% uh, was responsible 100% financially uh, for, uh, for, for uh, fulfilled contracts. So he fulfilled contracts, uh, but he did not uh, uh, get um, uh, finances for this. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he, he was considered to be some kind of altruist uh, in the absence of uh, contract obligations. Uh, he fulfilled some obligations or services for uh, the uh, uh, customer. Uh, and I uh, give you uh, the quote uh, here. You can see uh, the terms uh, uh, which I used here. A contract between parties uh, was not uh, concluded, uh, but uh, here we sp speak about contracts, uh, about agreement, not contract. Uh, uh, and uh, here we speak about quite um, tough measures uh, regarding uh, our customer. And the second case, um, next, next day, uh, I uh, can see, uh, you can see this on the slide, um, a supplier did not get his money. Uh, in spite of the fact um, uh, that he fulfilled uh, these works uh, uh, on draft documentations, uh, the works were uh, accepted, uh, but the customer refused to sign uh, the expertise results on these works. Uh, and uh, 
In this case, uh, a customer uh, got advantage of this uh, right of legalized, legalized uh, non-payment, uh, which um, the euro uh, exists only in non-contractual system. Uh, and uh, uh, it uh, is uh, uh, here in the uh, court system, uh, but um, for both uh, activities, the Supreme Court uh, clearly formed its uh, uh, opinion, its position uh, on uh, this negative additional consequences uh, uh, of uh, separate uh, situations uh, on supply about contract system. Uh, contract two, three are, are not applied, but still uh, courts uh, uh, use it. Uh, so uh, what should we be ready for? Uh, and uh, we uh, can see this here. I don't uh, I think uh, that uh, this packet creates only problems. Uh, there are some norms. Uh, uh, very good norms. Uh, for example, we spoke, uh, we have spoken today about digitalization and it becomes a real tool um, uh, which um, um, makes it possible uh, to do this. Um, uh, and uh, it's uh, key. So that is a norm that finally the foreign participants uh, of uh, the procurement in the framework of 44 federal law and uh, 223 can use their electric signature not to buy it as a qualified one, the Russian one. So there is no any special permission uh, there. So this is uh, due to the legal, let's say sub-legal regulation for the major suppliers, foreign suppliers. So the Russian qualified signature is now for them is not affordable but so because they're not let's say russian subjects so this is uh, the task so this problem have been resolved and now there are new opportunities appear to widen the let's say the bidders and for the suppliers for the customers, the additional expenses, hiring a Russian intermediate that used to be, of course, was in the cost in the price of the contract till today. But of course, here it's important, let's say, to reduce the optimism with an amendment that, with a quote, that these potential opportunities have uh, very subjective features due to the fact that we know uh, quite strict norms about quoting of the domestic procurements due to the protectionism regime in the contract and two to three federal law make the customer refuse the real nice bid for uh, the fact of uh, taking out all the quotes, we need to understand finally what is the priority and what is the aim in this way. Let's say, uh, de not depending on the quality, uh, let's say, give preferences to the local place or focus on the quality and the right contest, right bid. So mentioning that the quotes can be better. While well, these targets right now exist simultaneously these days and in the fourth four federal law and two to three federal law, the volumes of procurements are like similar like the ANOVA. This is uh, two cells, minor, minor one. This is according to the law. 44 and the other cell is let's say in the framework of two to three happen so they, they actually this is the non-competitive regime that we have in this way these are that laws formally not competitive but the factor yes 
so customers have all rights. The fact uh, to make the regime non not competent. And uh, this is kind of making uh, these uh, laws and uh, the situation very interesting due to the optimization, the strange one, due to the amendments in the federal law 223. So next thing that touches to 123 federal law is to strengthen the auction. With time, we'll probably follow the Kazakh example that, let's say, the doctrine and theory has been started, that, let's say, of the country that is, uh, in, let's say, is in front of us. We are falling behind. Speaking about the roads, individual solutions, let's say our law doesn't suit the current situation, the current needs. So the federal law 223 is very different in this way from federal law 44. The first one, this is the raw materials, materials, the not finished products in the description that we can find. As a rule of auction, that uh, used to be strengthened in the federal law. 44 is even strengthened more now. If we see the 22nd article review, the auction, let's say, consider as the customer need the priority, as the priority, except as the kids, let's say, rest and uh, holidays, I would say it was written with blood. We wanted to have a look, of course, how it happened, but it should be excluded as we have it now. So what are the risks in the federal law 223 in this regard? What we can find there? The obvious risk is, of course, not impossible to, to attach the quality the criteria. If you follow the analog from the federal law 223 by the customers, we probably in this way should order the cheapest things. For example, the cheapest laptop that we need to buy, or this is the complex decision that auction here is not workable for the other product. Auction is not a bad option, but the sphere of its application lays in the dimension of uh, pr procuring the products that simultaneously, let's say, follow two rules. First, opportunity to have full description of all the qualitative requirements, and second, elasticity of the price formation. If it follows both the rules, it's effective. Uh, otherwise, our uh, auction is not. So if, let's say, uh, all the auctions Follow both the rules, let's say it is kind of uh, harmful or what. Second, this is the second consequence that is due to the federal law 223 compliant. If the customer, for example, cannot apply competitive terms of procurement in this way, it can reduce it, let's say. We shouldn't think that the customers to refuse the competition or this is kind of agreements let's say internal agreements no this is no not like this let's not point with a finger at someone there are a lot of people who are honest so the quality of products is the aim of all the laws this is the profit of uh, this customer, the future one, if the product uh, that uh, he procure uh, is bad, so it will be not the right decision. There will be no profit, there will be costs, there will be expensive, there will be risks. Let's say honest customer refuses according to the law 223, the specific, let's say, competitive procedures that are set in the above mentioned law to the competitive uh, opportunities. We have all the advantages of the competence 
and competition and doesn't have any artificial limits. The next nuance that we also uh, mentioned today, this is the universal price qualification. So then you think about the contract system law, federal law, and let's say for normal procurement, for commercial procurement, it has been recognized as ineffective. So if this model of pre-qualification will be returned to the federal law 223, if it will be, it will be better than nothing, than the paradoxal uh, formulations that we have from the anti-monopoly service, the participants, cannot influence the quality of execution of the agreement. This is like this, probably, you know, all this, this is absurd. So to medical services, actually, we apply not to the, let's say, uh, yesterday student with bad diploma marks notes, and we go to the right doctor, we find recommendations and everything. So of course, qualification, influences the quality. So it's even more dramatic in the procurement, you know. So the pre-qualification is better than nothing. So what could be the nuances? And what do we have in the second part of 31st article of the federal law or in this bill? So first of all, uh, in the pre-qualification, in the federal law 223, that could be only the talk about price. No portfolio of uh, the candidates will not be, let's say, influencing. Only the agreement and uh, state contract will influence. So in this model of pre-qualification that is reflected in the new uh, bill, uh, the let's say segment, uh, the field of the market is not reflected, being there, for example, supplier fulfilling the nice order or for example, a rubber shoes for the state customer. Next time, maybe I can, let's say, be the first priority uh, in medical devices. Of course, there are not any kind of uh, tie in uh, the medical, let's say, this kind of medical devices, let's say this is not the issue. Next time that will be the first context from zero, yes, from the greenfield. Of course, there will be no any kind of privileges. And I have this not, I will not have any kind of uh, advantages. Of course, next time, this is good. This is the competition next time that will happen even, and uh, I will have the same rights as all the other participants, even if I had some successful supply. No, this is uh, maybe also lead uh, to the limit of uh, the participants of the procurement itself. The fact that we can have it, this is kind of classic paradox that we have. So a lot of uh, sales of masks, let's say, are being sold uh, to the clients of, uh, with masks. So the person should find first the masks to buy the other ones. So let's say I understand how it happens. Let's say uh, you can uh, go from level to level, being higher, being bigger. So this accumulation effect probably will probably influence decreasing the number of participants. That is not about the quality, I think, but that will be kind of indirect influence. And the next point, I will probably finish my presentation with this. This is the rating of uh, the business reputation. Well, the fate of it is quite uh, indeterminate. And in the framework of uh, the application of the law and in our discussions, what we had in the first readings, so rating doesn't give any opportunities to take into consideration the specificity of the field well, this is not about the public procurements at all, speaking about construction services or some kind of machines, equipment. So let's say if I show myself very good in this kind of public procurements, next time I'll have privileges. So maybe 
the additional burdens that right now have the participants of the public procurements. With this kind of rating, let's say we could increase the opportunities to simplify the preparations and uh, application submission that could be the right step to the right direction together with uh, the heriting the data and authorization of preparing the documents that today Anna Tamarazovna mentioned about modernization and upgrade in this sphere. And second, this is reduction of financial burden for the supply in this way, which happens now due to the procedure itself set in the federal law about the contract system. We all know that in order to just to be, uh, to take part in the procurement, public procurement, not being uh, in the list, any supplier should get a lot of money out of business up to one third of the future cost of the contract or, uh, or if it's advanced payment even more and give the customer not uh, getting anything. So this is other problems of the supply, of course, but it leads to the increase of the contracts in price, I mean, and indirectly, this is direct and indirectly makes the normal situation when any price of the state contract, public contract is higher than the market price for the same product. This is not a top secret, you know? You all know it. This is not about the public procurement of uh, the snow machines, equipment. We all know it. Uh, not only of uh, Mr. Raguchi Zimbabwe uh, report. In order to, let's say, regulate the situation in the procurements, public procurements, be more qualitative and we have level we should have a nice more uh, let's say better calculation in uh, different fields the potential should be and should go out of the requirements of the economy of the market but not the needs of regulations thank you very much thank you so i have one comment here for five years i've been working in this kind of direction so non-residents can work with their own signature, electronic signature, and uh, participate in the state public procurements. This is not the right one. Uh, the authors of the federal law 44 uh, and 223, let's say right now, uh, let's say for this, they do not forbid this, but we have federal law 63, according to which, let's say, there is the step forward being done. So this is the world service, I think you all know it. This is affordable now, but uh, there were some limitations uh, with the trust of the third party, let's say the signature can be recognized only from the country, customer of the country that uh, the Russia, Russia can have uh, the agreement so, of course, it doesn't forbid, Russia doesn't forbid this kind of participants, but uh, this is kind of limitation, of course, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Dmitry Alexandrovich, dear colleagues. We are finishing uh, this section, uh, the Russian section, and uh, we move forward uh, abroad, let's say, once again, and... So we start our fourth section out of six, which we call Eastern Europe and Panama. Panama asked, let's say, to present to do presentation during this time. Of course, if Panama hasn't forgotten about us, let me start with the closest country. This is probably hard to say that it is they are separate, let's say, from us. This is Belarus, of course. And give the floor to 
uh, Lisa Kowski Grigor, Associate Professor, Department of Management, Economics, Information Technologies, Minsk Institute of Qualification Improvement and Retraining of Managers and Specialists of the Industry, PhD in Law. Grigory Antonovich, please. Good day. Good day. Please uh, switch on uh, video, please. So we have the pause right now. I want to tell you that uh, we used a very, in a very nice way all our coffee breaks. I think, dear colleagues, uh, you paid attention that, let's say, we get rid of all our coffee breaks to be in time. I think that those who want, they can pour the coffee, pour their coffee uh, during the presentations. Grigory Antonovich, how are you doing? We can hear you, but so far we don't see the video. I can't understand what's happening. Just some technical pause, please. So what's happening really? Okay, we can't hear anything. Uh, Grigory Antonovich, we may give you the floor. And our colleagues from Donetsk will probably join us as they are prepared to be with us. Okay. Let's ask Любовь Ильинична Черкасская, Елена Викторовна. Okay. Will you please uh, include them in our list of speakers? Uh, dear colleagues, dear colleagues uh, good afternoon. You are very close to us as well as Minsk. We are very much appreciative of that. Thank you. I may get started. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, attendees to the conference. Uh, we really appreciate that we may uh, have a say uh, at this conference and highlight uh, the issues related uh, to the, the legislation of our Republic in the sphere of public procurement. Over the past time, we've been witnessing a change and modification in our legislation pertinent to the law on procurement. And we really give you some bullet points as to how it works. Unfortunately, the above mentioned uh, modifications uh, do not uh, address the existing challenges, but on the contrary, they bring about some specific complications. Uh, what are those challenges and those uh, modifications? Instead of the temporary order for procurement adopted back in 2016 by self -Mil, and instead of another law which was supposed to be developed uh, further, as well as other projects uh, to be developed by us on the 23rd of April, the new order or procedure was adopted on the uh, procurement of goods and services from the budget. And uh, such a new procedure and uh, such a law doesn't streamline the entire situation. On the contrary, it has a destructive nature. And actually, uh, on very briefly, I will present those new documents. Uh, first of all, the special law could not be formed. Uh, smoothly and any lawyer no, knows that 
the law uh, becomes a core of the new system and uh, the law making is by the way a, a support procedure but the bylaws will be the continuation of this procedure and the law may uh, sometimes have uh, uh, less legal force but the details uh, are visible in other uh, legal documents. Let me draw your attention to the very start of this process. And uh, unanimously, the uh, law uh, bodies decided to have a specific um, document, uh, and it should be a legislation. And five years uh, have been suffice in order to offer the legal regulatory framework instead of the temporary order. And once again, let me remind you that this law has been adopted in terms of the procurement procedure with a whole code of various rules and regulations. And we didn't approve the law, but we made a step back. That's the first thing to mention. The second thing is that the core of this legal act has become the federal law on the contract system, that is of the Russian Federation as well as the regulations of various subjects of the Federation. Alongside this, the contents of that law uh, on the one hand is, uh, still has some bottlenecks as we used to have in the Russian law. And we are talking about it uh, at every conference of ours. And they didn't take into account the key provisions of the Russian law, which should have been defined in that temporary order. And uh, we haven't yet streamlined the principles of procurement, or social control, and other provisions which are indispensable, but they uh, never were included there. Uh, it will be really a painstaking uh, effort uh, to do it on a full-fledged basis. That's why everyone uh, and everything was minimized. And the new order doesn't take into account the positive expertise as to the regulation of the uh, relationship within the framework of the temporary order and uh, the process uh, for procurement becomes more complicated and not at all simplified. And uh, the centralized uh, uh, purchasing is excluded there. And, and it means that the, uh, of the budgetary bodies uh, and other bodies apart from the uh, government uh, uh, entities uh, may do the job uh, and uh, also territorial and structural divisions may do the same thing as uh, to the procedure for temporary order in the republic uh, so this uh, 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 order uh, actually has under uh, its uh, auspices and under its umbrella uh, social uh, services, public uh, services uh, and other entities. And it was real hard uh, for a number of bodies uh, and organizations to take part uh, in this uh, uh, procurement process. Some people do know how to handle that law professionally, and some do not. And on the other hand, 
Uh, so it means that there is uh, time consuming effort for a number of offices and for a number of persons. But only uh, when the uh, temporary order was uh, uh, somehow uh, modified, uh, the uh, first persons of certain uh, companies managed to do their job. And uh, consequently, uh, with regard to the new order, uh, these particular provisions may negatively affect uh, the activity of all the above-mentioned entities. And it will affect not only their performance and activity, but the quality of all the purchasing procedures will be very low. And thus, we may draw a conclusion that in the course of the legislation development in our republic, uh, so we uh, haven't uh, attained uh, uh, the objective uh, to improve this particular law. That's what I wanted to tell you at the beginning, and then Natalia will uh, follow up. Uh, dear colleagues, I would like uh, to thank everybody for inviting us to this conference and thank you for sharing uh, your expertise. And also we may put forward our proposals as well. And let me uh, just uh, draw your attention uh, to the novelties which uh, uh, have been just recently introduced. The key trend is a digital approach to the public purchase the procurement. And it has been done imperatively as of the 1st of July, 2021. Everything uh, will be digitized and special digital platform uh, will uh, be, um, become uh, the key venue. And the only operator uh, at this uh, trading site uh, and also the proprietor of the analytical system uh, is the holder of this digital platform. And uh, what are those uh, characteristic features of this new law? There are six of them. And uh, the procurement process in the Dominion Republic uh, will be exercised at the electronic uh, uh, trading site with the exception of uh, certain uh, uh, organizations uh, who are not subject uh, to such a format. And uh, this presents some exemptions uh, for defense, for the security bodies, and uh, for some management bodies, for the bodies of justice and law and for the civil defense and for uh, emergency situations, the response and also natural calamities uh, bodies. Uh, and uh, the rest may take part in this particular uh, process, procurement process. Then uh, there, there's a special methodology as how to act in uh, this specific situation. And uh, we had uh, three methods prior to that, but uh, uh, now we have five, but uh, they are all done at the competitive basis uh, in the electronic uh, platform, um, with the exception of the direct uh, uh, procurement of goods and services. And it's worthy to mention that the procedure, the selection of uh, uh, and the method uh, is being detected by an operator automatically. And much depends on the conditions. Of course, it's uh, the bid price and the uh, object of the procurement. And therefore, the electronic uh, platform offers uh, to use the method and the customer has to define uh, which method would be applicable. And thus, uh, we do not have to justify this particular method. The next trend, introduction of the definition, the electronic form of procurement. And the actions 
are undertaken as to the procurement of goods and services uh, have to be somehow modified uh, with due regard to this new uh, digital approach. An analytical system has to accumulate the data first and foremost, and then the special uh, information and data uh, are to be submitted electronically, and it should be all processed by the analytical database. Uh, we have 11 uh, specific uh, aspects of this information to be provided, starting from the uh, procurement plan and the limitation of uh, access exceptions and then the procedure of procurement uh, contract implementation uh, the list of contracts and that's we should note that uh, uh, this um, list is formed uh, on the automated basis the contract is an automatic one and uh, also the list of bidders is prepared they should be registered accordingly at the venue and an operator uh, accredits them and registers them and uh, it is all uh, put onto one sole analytical and information system they also identify uh, those that face uh, clients and also they uh, form uh, some regulation to the appeal and to the complaint, uh, and also some planned and non-planned information for procurement is embedded and the catalog uh, for goods and services is provided. Uh, and it's a direct uh, procurement process. And uh, also there is a chance even to have an inter uh, internet store. Uh, and the document placed in the electronic forum uh, has the same legal force as uh, well as a document uh, submitted in the paper form. And also, it's uh, worthy to mention that uh, uh, the sole operator is uh, operating uh, is uh, performing the system and the process uh, becomes visible uh, due to the information in the analytical system and the sixth uh, trend is uh, that the interaction is exercised by an operator at the level of the uh, purchaser and a client and so the information exchange, uh, inquiries, claims, they all go through the operator at the electronic site. And uh, this is an absolute novelty, which will come into effect as of the 1st of July, uh, 2021. And I should say that uh, this document is not uh, very appropriate. It needs to be enhanced. And of course, definitely, it will uh, have some bottlenecks and some challenges. And the entire analytical information system belongs to the government. And the same is true of the Russian Federation. Uh, but uh, uh, practically, in case of uh, our Republic, it's the non government analytical information. And operation is not a, a public body as well. And I don't know how government is going to use this system, what would be the access, and how the information will be shared, and how cooperation uh, will be organized. And uh, uh, the system uh, may give on a free of charge basis uh, some information to the public bodies and budget organizations, uh, but other entities uh, will have to pay for this information. And uh, I should say that the operator is uh, a non-government organization and they uh, somehow institute this level of um, a price. 
and who is responsible for what is going on? What should be the liability of an operator? And uh, how uh, the budget uh, uh, funds are going to be allocated? And actually, uh, they have uh, to uh, follow the law and who is going to check whether they are abiding by the law. And the majority of the documents, uh, as opposed to the uh, contract, uh, are uh, actually going uh, to the system and that should be a standard document further processed and uh, so a human being is involved in that process, which is a risky business. And uh, we have uh, to uh, provide an application, the document of the procedures, uh, uh, sign contracts, uh, then they are automatically formed and then uh, submitted uh, to the parties, then they have to be printed out, uh, signed, uh, sealed, uh, and only then, the document is placed in the system. So then uh, we uh, can um, uh, have um, different bodies uh, who are responsible for this uh, and uh, everything is scanned. Uh, all issues uh, linked uh, uh, with the notifications, uh, return of uh, claims uh, and also issues um, uh, concerning reporting. Uh, all of this in uh, scanned uh, uh, format. Uh, the fifth uh, disadvantage, uh, the service um, of uh, requirements uh, uh, who um, uh, uh, the operators, uh, uh, they define themselves uh, uh, how to do uh, the uh, list of contracts uh, uh, and uh, the list uh, of uh, participants of procurement and possible risks linked uh, with uh, corruption um, and uh, limitations uh, and barriers uh, regarding these procedures. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues, uh, uh, for attention. If you have questions, uh, please, I'm ready to answer them. Uh, I think, yes, so you will have some other questions. So uh, maybe you will have uh, it uh, a little bit later. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, uh, your presentation was very um, interesting. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now from Donetsk, uh, uh, we go to Grigory Antonovich uh, Lasakovsky. Uh, so this is Minsk. I would like to give uh, the floor uh, to uh, um, uh, Grigory uh, Lasakovsky um, and uh, his associate professor, Department of Management, Economics and Information Technologies, Minsk Institute of Qualification Improvement and the uh, retraining of managers and specialists and uh, of the industry PhD in law, Belarus. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Moscow State University moderators, professors, uh, Kichuk uh, Nikonov, uh, Unfortunately, I've um, heard a lot of uh, presentations of the colleagues um, and I can see that many problems which exist now uh, during the whole cycle of uh, legislation about procurement, uh, public procurement are still un unsolved. And uh, uh, in the sphere of uh, procurement, I have been working since uh, 2003. Uh, I was at the beginning of my career uh, the Ministry of um, Economics of Belarus. We had uh, the first decree from the uh, Council of Ministers um, and we uh, regulated uh, these um, uh, companies with the state share. And these problems which we had, uh, which we encountered uh, at that time, uh, during decades, uh, they seem to shift a little bit. Uh, and maybe uh, it seemed to us that we, we could find some effective mechanisms to solve them. It was uh, very interesting for me to listen uh, to Donetsk People's Republic uh, presentation. They are only in the beginning of their journey and the moderator noticed right uh, that soon uh, everything will be all uh, electronics uh, and uh, electronic platforms. Of course, uh, we know that uh, it will be like this. So. Uh, but uh, the problems uh, 
maybe won't be solved uh, here. When um, in 2003 we started this work on the digital economy, only started to build up, uh, and um, uh, the first uh, uh, the legal regulation uh, of information uh, was uh, uh, regulated. Uh, uh, so. Uh, we understood uh, that we uh, shift uh, and transit to digital formats uh, of uh, trading and documentation. And now uh, we have uh, already tokens, uh, contractual uh, ele electronic token formats, other formats. Uh, so there was um, uh, the question. Will uh, the digital economy provide for efficiency on some uh, procurement, uh, on some types of procurement where we cannot, uh, with the help of some advanced, uh, algorithm or tool, which we thought about advanced, uh, to uh, buy complicated services and goods and make it efficient for customers? And uh, it seemed to us that we would have such algorithms and some other algorithms will be invented, um, uh, programs. And uh, why uh, do we have to um, discuss the problem which uh, in the future uh, would be solved? But 20 years passed, and these problems which were, uh, which were predicted, uh, they now became real. Thank you, Dmitry Alexandrovich, and the previous, the previous speaker, uh, who highlighted uh, the prospects um, uh, of uh, electronic um, uh, formats, uh, for example, such procurements which uh, are, are conducted in construction sphere, good services of, of in, in the construction area. Uh, it's uh, difficult to speak about the Russian Federation now. I don't know specifics here, but I know that all um, countries of Eurasian Economic uh, Union uh, are, uh, have some uh, common responsibilities because, because we signed an agreement uh, about establishment of European uh, Union and there is an application uh, which indicates uh, the um, United Rules. Uh, and the main thing of this agreement is uh, that all um, procurement uh, uh, procedures should be conducted um, uh, with the help of electronic documentation and on electronic uh, uh, platforms. And um, also uh, they uh, fixate a possible number of uh, procurement. Uh, the Russian Federation uh, have the requests uh, for electronic options uh, and uh, in Russia uh, there, they, there is procurement from one source uh, and uh, the uh, national legislation uh, you know is limited by this agreement so um, we developed our own Belarus uh, legislation we have our state year laws and we uh, bear responsibilities um, uh, that uh, uh, for this. Uh, and uh, sometimes colleagues uh, say uh, that uh, this uh, uh, this project um, is not in compliance with the agreement signed so within the agreement of European uh, uh, Union. So we have quite a unique situation here. We have uh, the law about state procurement uh, uh, and uh, we uh, corrected this uh, from the 1st of July 2019 and uh, here we um, adopted and developed the responsibilities uh, based uh, on uh, uh, agreements of European Union, of Eurasian Union, sorry, uh, but um, uh, always uh, at the level of uh, uh, so when the law doesn't work for example we don't uh, uh, adopt a special new law uh, we have some um, uh, uh, we still have decrees of president of the president and very often um, uh, we have some uh, special uh, regulations in construction 
and in this case um, it has been it's continued it has been continued for decade for one decade our construction sphere is always uh, uh, so always um, restore the, the order of uh, procurement in the construction why is it so like this uh, because in construction we have special uh, subject for regulation uh, and it's very difficult to predict um, at the point of uh, procurement um, theory, for example the volume of um, um, services because we um, can predict something and but we never know what um, uh, really are constructed uh, uh, so the volume of services uh, uh, because the construction um, is quite specific and it's uh, not different um, by um, uh, so by so some little things uh, but uh, sometimes so there is a far cry uh, between uh, the initial uh, prediction and uh, the real life so pricing in the construction is a real problem also is um, a separate problem if we uh, take electronic auction when we have the price uh, and uh, um, those who give uh, less price win uh, so reduction of price is not grounded here can a subcontract organization fulfill this work uh, and the render services um, maybe actually um, it's uh, uh, temporal damping and uh, it can lead uh, uh, to um, uh, different outcomes for example uh, the organization uh, can be go bankrupt uh, uh, or um, uh, it can be um, uh, difficulties of operators already uh, they um, recruit uh, subcontract organizations which save uh, on uh, procurement of uh, assets uh, given salaries and so on and uh, we asked uh, this question uh, or, or several times uh, um, so do we uh, um, can this electronic uh, uh, platforms uh, lead to bankruptcy of construction area and uh, it seems that it is so because in construction it's important uh, not only to receive uh, a low uh, price it's important to receive fair price for subcontract organizations which fulfill services uh, and uh, work uh, uh, to get a fair, uh, fair salary uh, and uh, to uh, pay workers and also maintain technical material uh, base. But uh, the legislation about procurement, um, about price reduction uh, will result in um, awards of uh, uh, subcontract organizations with cheaper prices. Uh, some large construction um, uh, companies survived, uh, uh, but uh, regarding uh, organizations of uh, mi middle, of average organizations, uh, they uh, uh, now uh, only um, uh, work uh, at different uh, sites. Uh, uh, they paid salary minimum salary to workers uh, under the legislation officially and the rest of the salary is unofficial the official uh, uh, so they don't uh, register their equipment so the level of construction industry and uh, thanks uh, to this economic policy uh, uh, came to the effect uh, earlier it was very strong and developed uh, came to um, um, uh, is go is uh, came to uh, you know um, bad outcome. That's why uh, it's important to finance scientific research and uh, economic uh, analysis uh, of further improvement uh, of uh, legal regulations in different uh, separate. Uh, areas um, and uh, here we can see maybe we need special rules uh, for procurement of goods uh, and services uh, in, con in construction area uh, to uh, make these procedures uh, more transparent uh, and this uh, procedure of course can have digitalization and electronic uh, platform 
But uh, the result uh, of these procedures, uh, electronic, should lead also uh, to economic um, upheaval uh, of the um, uh, industry, but not uh, uh, to, um, find a, to um, depression. You know, uh, regarding post-Soviet uh, um, um, countries, we have uh, a very strange connection between practice regarding economic uh, realities uh, and legislation. It's uh, always uh, a little bit delayed. You know, legislation it shows behind the, the real life. Uh, and uh, we don't have, um, uh, you know, legislative uh, initiatives to solve this uh, things uh, and uh, to make some special legislation um, or not temporal but permanent uh, which could um, consider all specialties of uh, industry-wise regulation. I think this will stay relevant uh, because this, um, this competition procedures of procurement on electronic platforms uh, uh, shows, uh, if, uh, sh shows, uh, shows that it's not always, always efficient. And we should um, change uh, current legislation in this aspect and to use those mechanisms of uh, economic activity, which uh, could not uh, just declare uh, in accordance with the statistics uh, that uh, in the Republic of Belarus uh, and in the Russian Federation, we uh, decreased um, prices uh, for procurement uh, uh, regarding um, uh, the uh, procurement, uh, public procurement, but uh, let us analyze what happened uh, to the other participants. Can they uh, develop in, under such conditions of economy? Uh, can uh, these uh, companies uh, render services uh, for few works at the same level uh, as uh, they had, uh, as, is ne as it's needed for customers? Or maybe we temporarily reduce prices, uh, the whole industry became bankrupt, uh, and now we don't have any participant who really can fulfill the works well. And uh, this situation, uh, uh, so our, um, speaking about economy, um, uh, we feel well now, but if we look at utilities, uh, uh, repair works so gradually, you know, the uh, works of, um, uh, the works, uh, the qualification, the good quality companies uh, uh, practically um, uh, now uh, uh, feel much worse at the market also because of this uh, uh, procedures. Then when we develop any legislation changes, you should pay attention to influence uh, of um, the mechanism uh, uh, of uh, procurement on the industry on the whole. And uh, it's important to see whether this mechanism is valid or not. And uh, we uh, here should indicate maybe some special legal mechanisms different from uh, general rules. It's constant work, constant analysis and monitoring because um, economically, economic relations uh, are developing rapidly and uh, the economic situation changes also rapidly. The mechanism always should be under control. But for today, the same as uh, uh, regarding the Russian colleagues, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, can be seen that um, we have some changes in the law. Uh, they, we only discuss whether we digitalize the economy, uh, and, but we don't have a feedback how it, uh, what impact uh, it had uh, on the different industries of the economy. And that's why uh, there should be a more um, comprehensive analysis of what is going on in the economy and in the countries. Uh, legislators should um, uh, consider all this. Uh, it's not uh, simple, especially in our post-Soviet uh, countries. Um, it's also fashionable uh, in our country to speak about uh, digitalization, electronic contracts, electronic platforms, but you should be a little bit uh, um, down to earth uh, and um, to be more objective regarding this uh, since, uh, new things. Um, so, um, uh, here uh, we uh, should always think how this procedure influences on the industry. 
but the general uh, changes of the legislation are thanks God not so dramatic but uh, we uh, we had our economic situation uh, uh, supposes uh, protection of domestic market of goods and services so we have uh, uh, the regulation uh, which regulates uh, a procurement uh, uh, of goods and services on the account of uh, um, and entrepreneurs um, uh, but uh, uh, you know the order of procurement uh, should also be in compliance with some certain rules uh, which uh, are in the decree of the council of ministers of belarus uh, for, uh, from 2012 and uh, there is a necessity uh, to apply uh, some amendments uh, to compare Belarus and foreign participants and for uh, those uh, who offer goods um, from the countries uh, where Belarus uh, has international uh, contracts uh, which uh, have national regime of origin of goods and services. Uh, so um, it concerns some um, goods uh, coming from all CIS countries and uh, um, European uh, uh, Eurasian Economic Union uh, and uh, some other republics. So I would like to repeat my time. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I have a lot of other things to say, of course, but. Um, uh, please uh, pay attention uh, that uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we um, uh, need uh, to look at the efficiency of also traditional procedures, uh, and uh, we have to try not uh, uh, to uh, see them out of our field. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to wish us all. Uh, I would like we could uh, see a very good future, uh, both in Belarus and in Russia, especially regarding our legislation. Yes, this is very uh, painful for us. Uh, so I hope that uh, uh, digitalization won't have a negative impact uh, here, and we know uh, that uh, it uh, really uh, sometimes uh, influences on construction. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, now let's uh, continue. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, let's move forward. There have been a lot of presentations in Russian. Right now we have maybe uh, in uh, English. Let me give the floor right now uh, to a uh, lecturer at the Faculty of Law and Political Science, University of Sejekt, Hungary, Agnes Herzheg. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I try to share my screen. Should not be a problem. Yep. Okay, maybe. Uh, can you see me? Yeah, 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 you can hear me. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the op uh, opportunity to participate in this uh, conference. As a new participant, I would like to briefly present the Hungarian uh, public procurement legislation. In Hungary, uh, sorry. in Hungary, public procurement is primarily regulated by Act 143 of 2015 on public procurement in accordance with the relevant European Union directives. This act comprehensively regulates the basic rules on public procurement. This law determines which entities are obliged to conduct public procurement procedures for which procurements and also when the type of the public procurement procedure can be used. The legislation also contains provisions on the control of public procurement, the right of appeal, 
the functions and powers of the public procurement authority and the performance and modification of contracts, concluding the following the public procurement procedure. This statutory regulation is supplemented by several implementing regulations, which contain the detailed rules of the Public Procurement Act and the special procurement rules. The Hungarian public procurement legislation is structurally divided into two large sections based on two sets of procedures, depending on the estimated value of the public procurement. On the one hand, we are talking about the European Union rules of procedure, which contains the rules for public procurement with an estimated value above the threshold set by the European Union and the so-called national procedure for procurement below these thresholds, but above the so-called national threshold. The European Union thresholds are set by the Commission of the European Union, both in euros and in the currencies of all member states. The national thresholds are set by the Hungarian Budget Act each year for the following year. At the heart of the Act is the concept of a public contract, which is a contract for pecuniary interest uh, concluded in writing by a contracting authority within the meaning of the act for the supply of goods, the provision of services or construction investments. If a transaction or acquisition by an entity defined as a contracting authority uh, is a public contract or works or service concession, and does not fall within the scope of the exception, and its estimated value reaches a certain threshold, the contracting authority is obliged to carry out the procedure under the Public Procurement Act in order to conclude such a contract or concession. In practice, therefore, whether a public procurement procedure must be carried out before the conclusion of a given contract is examined according to the following criteria. The party wishing to conclude the contract is a contracting authority. The party wishing to conclude a contract for pecuniary interest. The subject of the procurement falls within the scope of the Public Procurement Act. The value of the procurement is such that the contract is a public procurement obligation. If the answer to all four questions is yes, it can be said that the conclusion of the subject contract must be preceded by a public procurement procedure. Uh, in the Hungarian public procurement legislation, cases not covered by the Act can be basically divided into two groups. There are the so-called general exceptions, which if they apply, exclude procurement from the scope of the act, even if no other conditions apply. In addition to the general exceptions, the law also regulates other acquisitions that qualify as exceptions depending on their value. The exceptions listed here only exempt the contracting authority from the obligation to carry out a public procurement procedure if the estimated value of the procurement is below the European Union thresholds. The exceptions typically cover situations and cases where, although the contract in question is a public contract, the contracting authority does not have to carry out a procurement procedure. The list is defined in the Hungarian law in accordance with the rules of the European Union directives. General exceptions, uh, for example, are defense and security procurement, arbitration, mediation, use of legal services, uh, further exceptions uh, below the European Union thresholds are hotel and restaurant services, library services, international development, acquisition of cultural goods, or architectural design procurement. The Hungarian Public Procurement Act distinguishes four groups of contracting authorities. The first group is the uh, classical contracting authorities. They include ministries, the central purchasing body design designated by the government, the state, all budgetary bodies, public foundations, local governments, local and the national minority governments, 
associations of local and national minority governments. The second group is the group of liable contracting authorities. This category includes entities which are not classical contracting authorities, but whose purchases are directly supported by a classical contracting authority. The third group is a public service contracting entities, which carry out a public service activity and procure for the purpose of providing that public service. Public service contracting entities are typically organizations that are classic contracting entities operating in the water, energy, transport, and postal services sectors. The fourth group includes organizations that voluntarily or contractually undertake to carry out the procurement procedure. The law defines the grounds for exclusion in two groups, uh, one listing the cases where they are mandatory and the other listing optional grounds for exclusion, depending on the contracting authority's choice. The mandatory grounds for exclusion include certain criminal offenses, non-compliance with tax, customs or social security obligations, winding up bankruptcy, liquidation, force declarations, tax evasion, undeclared work, and certain practices that are contrary to the prohibition of unfair competition. Depending on the contracting authority's decision, the grounds for exclusion may include serious breaches of environmental, social, professional, and labor law requirements, or serious breaches of contractual obligations arising from a previous procurement procedure. Any person or entity, including the contracting entity and its employees, which is unable to exercise its functions impartially and objectively for any reason, in particular because of an economic or other interest or because of any other interest in common with the economic operator participating in the procedure, shall be incompatible with and shall not participate in the preparation and conduct of the procedure on behalf of the contracting entity. Any person or body involved by the contracting authority in an activity connected with the procedure or its preparation shall be incompatible with the contract and may not participate in the procedure. And in addition, the law names persons, for example, the president of the Republic or ministers who are incompatible by virtue of their status. To ensure that the objectives set out in the PPE are met, the Public Procurement Authority operates under the authority of the parliament. The Public Procurement Authority is a central budgetary body operating as an autonomous state administration body under the supervision of the Parliament, which has general competence in the area of its duties and defined in the PPA, and its jurisdiction extends the whole territory of the country. Its seat is in Budapest. The Public Procurement Authority has a council and the Public Procurement Arbitration Committee. The type of the procedure to be used is determined by the subject and estimated value of the procurement. The procurement procedure can be open, restricted, innovation partnership, negotiated procedure, competitive dialogue, or negotiated procedure with public, without publication of a contract notice. In the preparation phase, the choice of the type of the procedure to be used is made, taking into account several factors. The open and restricted procedures can be used freely, so it is up to the contracting authority and the circumstances of the procurement to decide whether to use this type of the procedure. Negotiated procedures, competitive dialogue and negotiated procedures without prior publication of a contract notice may be used only if the conditions laid down in the PPA are met.
specific procurement methods are not types of procedures, but procurement techniques and models that allow contracting authorities a greater flexibility and more creative procedural choices in the conduct of one or more of the type of the procedures. PPE defines four specific procurement methods, the framework, agreements, dynamic purchasing systems, electronic tendering, and electronic catalogs. One of the main legal objectives of the PPA as set out in the preamble of the Act is to ensure transparency and public scrutiny of the efficient use of public funds. To this end, a specific chapter of the law details with the rules on publication and publicity. Under the main rules ensuring publicity and transparency, contracting authorities are obliged to publish certain procedural acts by means of a contract notice. This, these include, depending on the type of the procedure, the publication of notices opening the procedure, the publication of a notice of the results of the public procurement procedures, carried out the publication of a notice uh, of the modification of contracts. In addition, for classical contracting authorities, the PPE requires them to draw up an annual aggregated public procurement plan by the end of March each year and publish it in the electronic public procurement system. A further rule in the law which ensures publicity is that the contracting authority is obliged to publish certain information in public procurement procedures. All these detailed rules are in addition to the general rule at the level of principle that public procurement procedures are open to the public and the economic operators may only declare certain information and business secrets in tenders submitted in the course of a public procurement procedure subject to strict rules. In principle, the legal consequences can be applied to public contracts that have been unlawfully concluded fall into three categories. There are public law, civil law, and mixed law remedies. The public law remedies are those that can be applied by the public procurement jury and the administrative courts in appeal procedures and administrative proceedings, while the civil law remedies include nullity and damages. In addition, there are also mixed remedies. These include cases where the arbitration committee or the administrative court may declare nullity. On the one hand, the PP stipulates the contract is null and void if it was concluded without following a public procurement procedure. It was concluded as a result of a public procurement procedure without prior publication of a contract notice without the conditions for the application of it, or the parties entered into the contract in breach of the rules on the moratorium. In appeal proceedings referred to the Public Procurement Arbitration Committee, the Arbitration Committee may take the following decisions, reject the unfounded application, establishes the absence of an infringement or imposes a fine or other legal penalty on the infiner or declare the contract null and void of its own motivation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Agnes. Uh, it's a great honor for us, uh, your participation at that conference because it is the first time uh, when uh, Hungarian a specialist on, on the field of public procurement to participation, take participation in our conference. Please uh, send our uh, best regards to Professor Christina Karzai. And you, we course. hope to see you and her <laughs> maybe in Moscow next year. Thank you. Thank it is you very, very interesting. Much. We will research uh, your report and your text uh, with our specialists uh, from our university in uh, near future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Уважаемые коллеги, и позвольте представить следующую страну. Colleagues, let me introduce the next country. We move forward to Greece, and let me give the floor to Professor Emmanuel Evelygrakis, public law doctor, 
and a PhD economics, so attorney in law before the Supreme Court of Greece, partner at KPV Legal and uh, public law doctor at University of Athens. Please, Emmanuel Navelegrakis, please take the floor. We're glad to see you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you. Um, 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 thank you for, first of all, for the invitation, for the kind invitation uh, to participate in this conference. Uh, and uh, it's the honor is, uh, is much bigger uh, uh, coming from the notorious Lomonosov uh, Moscow State University. So um, thanks again. Uh, thanks personally, uh, Mr. Professor Kishik. And I hope to uh, see, you, see you in person next year in, in Moscow. Um, uh, it, it, will be, it will be a real pleasure. Um, let me, let me uh, share the, uh, the presentation. Some, some, okay. Yeah, we can see that. Okay. You, you can see it, I suppose. Yes, yeah. yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. So, so, um, uh, so my, my, my topic uh, will be um, uh, uh, the administrative judicial review of the public recruitment process in Greece, according to the theme of the conference, uh, that is uh, law enforcement in, in uh, of the public procurement rules. Um, my task has been highly facilitated by the previous, uh, um, uh, the, the previous um, colleague uh, from Hungary. Um, uh, Hungary, as, as uh, Greece as well, are, are members, uh, members of the EU, so uh, they apply the, uh, the, same, the same basic rules coming from the EU directives. And, uh, and in particular, uh, in this time, from the third generation uh, uh, public procurement directives. So the substantial law is um, is uh, it's more or less uh, the same. It's more or less the same. And and um, I I saw that even the procedural rules are quite the same. Uh, I mean, concerning um, the uh, the review of the procurement process. Uh, so, um, law enforcement in, under the EU rules is a, is a fundamental aspect of public procurement legislation. Um, in general, um, um, EU, um, uh, EU lawyers know that the, in the uh, um, EC law, uh, law enforcement and the right to, of judicial review and judicial protection um, goes pair, pair to pair with, uh, with the substantial rules. Um, we will refer in, uh, with a few words on the constitutional setup of the administrative justice and uh, of the basic rules of the administrative contentious, contentious procedure um, that are essential for, um, for understanding the Greek, uh, the Greek system. And we will refer to the statutory bodies, uh, maybe too many in the Greek public procurement system, uh, I will refer to the independent authority for public recruitment, the authority for preliminary recourses, uh, and uh, there are also sp uh, for EU funded projects, specific units, uh, usually per, uh, per ministry. So uh, a few words about the constitutional setup of the administrative justice in Greece. Um, we have a system of separated judicial orders. Uh, administrative justice and uh, civil criminal justice separate, are separated judicial orders um, headed by uh, uh, different Supreme Courts, the Council of State uh, and the Supreme Court, uh, Arios Pagos is a, a national Greek word that we, we use uh, for the civil uh, um, Supreme Court. And, um, uh, uh, Concerning the contracts that we use, uh, we are much influenced by uh, the French uh, law and the French administrative law in this topic. Uh, we, the, the, the jurisdictions are in principle separated by, by and with the notion of administrative contract. Um, basically an administrative contract is, um, 
a contract signed by an administration, but uh, um, mm, the contract contains specific and um, uh, derogative clauses from a common law, from civil law. Um, let's say that under the influence of uh, the EU law um, um, that uh, does not uh, use the, 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 the term of administrative contract, which is a, mainly a, a term for uh, um, French influenced countries, uh, um, the term of public contract has practically replaced both for substantial and procedural law purposes the distinction between administrative and private contracts of the public sector. Um, let's make some, some, some uh, history. Um, um, the, we, we had some problems in, in the initial stages of implementation of the um, uh, law enforcement of, of the judicial review um, um, uh, uh, directives. And um, there, there was, in the 90s, there was an issue with uh, the, um, uh, 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 for interim protection, with interim protection granted by um, the uh, Council of State. Because, um, for, first of all, for um, applying a suspension of uh, unlawful act of the contracting authority, you had to apply also for, uh, um, to file um, an application for annulment, of, um, uh, namely an application for uh, um, uh, judicial protection. Uh, and um, and um, in addition, um, uh, the Council of State denied suspension of uh, uh, even unlawful acts um, uh, in case of material damage uh, um, to, to, to the applicant uh, on the basis of the consideration that um, uh, material damage is, in principle, um, uh, may be recovered by the uh, lawsuit for uh, lawsuit for uh, indemnity. So um, there was a uh, Greece was condemned by the um, at the time uh, the Europe the Court of Justice of the European Communities, and uh, we had to introduce a law uh, in uh, 1997 um, uh, that. That law um, um, gave us the schedule of the system, uh, still still applying with some some sub substantial material changes. But uh, the, so so there was uh, the, the the term of pre preliminary recourse. Uh, so uh, the um, the participant in the in the tender uh, who saw himself excluded unlawfully uh, had to. Be, uh, before seeking the uh, judicial review, you had to recourse before the contracting authority itself. Um, there was a right uh, for filing an application for suspension before filing uh, of the application for annulment. Um, but the competence, the competence was determined by virtue of the nature of the contract. So at the, at the time, I remember when I was, uh, was a, a, a young lawyer, um, um, you had administrative judges who were very familiar with uh, procedures, etc., and you had uh, uh, civil law judges uh, who were not very familiar and very uh, with with uh, judging the administration and uh, handling uh, terms and rules based of, of administrative nature. Uh, the system, the system uh, was. Um, um, uh, has changed with in uh, with the law of uh, 2010. Um, the preliminary recourse stayed. Uh, the application for suspension stayed. Um, the uh, um, the uh, defense to conclude the procurement process before the conclusion of the of the suspension uh, of, of the procedure before the competent court for the application for suspension. Um, uh, said, but but there was a um, there was a, um, a significant uh, change. All litigation concerning uh, the procurement process uh, was brought before the administrative justice. Uh, um, the uh, Greek uh, public law uh, public procurement uh, um, um, rules have changed, and they are codified now with uh, a law uh, dated from um, 2016, 
there was a major, a major uh, change. Uh, the recourses, uh, the, pre the, the administrative preliminary recourses were brought um, before an independent authority, uh, the authority for the examination of preliminary recourses. So it was not, uh, and same applies today, uh, till uh, uh, since since 2016 um, uh, the uh, so there was a, a distrust in fact uh, um, uh, from the legislator towards uh, uh, recourses before the the same contracting entity uh, who uh, issued uh, the unlawful act so let's say i said it's not it's not uh, it does not make sense to to recourse to before the contracting authority itself let's uh, let's make a, a a body an independent body um uh, who's handling the recourses and and actually the statistics say that uh, that was um that was um uh, uh, that was a good um uh, that worked and that works especially concerning the uh, low value and the, um, uh, the local government contracting authorities. So um, uh, it, it worked mainly. Uh, so the competence of the authority, of, um, uh, the, the recourse before the authority is uh, open for uh, tenders of an estimated value over 60,000 euros. Um, there are um, there is an operational, administrative, and financial independence of the authority. Uh, the authority is headed by a former administrative uh, judge by law. So uh, um, uh, it uh, it, um, it the authority has the right to um, uh, uh, try both legal and substantial material complaints by the participants. It is a preliminary recourse in the sense that it, it is a, a mandatory, uh, uh, mandatory stage before seeking uh, judicial protection. Um, it, seem, it means that uh, all complaints must first be brought before the authority, um, before the, the, the authority and the procedure before the authority is open for interventions by third parties who are affected by an eventual acceptance of the recourse. And um, as I said, I have a, I haven't, the, it is a quite a common, uh, uh, commonly accepted here at least by the legal, the legal profession, um, that um, there was a positive contribution by the, the uh, authority. Um, so the decision of the authority on preliminary course is the act to, to challenge before the courts. Uh, the remedies remain the same, application for suspension and application for annulment. Um, the competence, concerning the competence, the Council of State, so the Supreme Administrative Jurisdiction, is competent for disputes uh, under um, uh, directive, um, uh, under classic sector directive with an estimated value over uh, 50 million uh, euros and all disputes under a uh, utility directive. For all other litigation concerning the tendering procedure, administrative courts of appeals um, are competent depending on the seat of the contracting authority. Um, as it was mentioned by my Hungarian colleague, um, um, lawsuits for indemnity are open to uh, participants. Um, there is, a, there is um, uh, a condition that uh, uh, you can be indemnified uh, uh, in, even in, uh, uh, only in case that uh, you have won the application for annulment uh, process. So there, has, there must be um, uh, a decision uh, stating that uh, the, the uh, act uh, um, uh, the, uh, that um, caused the damage is unlawful. And uh, we have also we have also a uh, court of auditors. Uh, the court of auditors, as uh, many countries have court of, uh, court of auditors, court of audit, um, uh, is a financial court, and there is a, a pre-contractual review of the entire process, um, a general and ipso jure review, say, uh, ipso jure in the sense that uh, the, the the review may cover. Um, uh, not, not only complaints brought before the authority or before the contracting authority uh, 
uh, itself. But um, it is a, uh, the, 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 the financial judge um, um, uh, reviews the entire procurement process. Uh, the uh, um, the uh, financial, the court of auditors review, the print contractual review uh, as it is uh, known, um, is open for um, uh, contracts of an estimated value of over a million euros. Uh, um, we have recent amendments on the public procurement rules here in Greece um, um, with a law um, that appeared in the official uh, Gazette in March uh, 9, 2021. Uh, there was um, a unification of the remedies, so there will be application for annulment. Um, there will be because, I say there will be because uh, the, the new system starts from uh, September of this year. Um, and, um, um, and there was no objection, uh, there's no or more objection or administrative recourse for procurement of an estimated value lower than 60,000 euros. Um, so for, for, for conclusion, um, let, me, let, me, let me submit, uh, humbly submit some th themes for discussion. Um, uh, when and, and I said with uh, my uh, my uh, capacity, my past, I have been for some years uh, head of the legal uh, uh, service of uh, uh, the um, electricity distributor uh, here in Greece. So uh, um, uh, I I I live from from very closely the. the uh, the anxiousness and, um, and the issue that the guys of uh, procurement had to, to uh, get the things uh, done. So uh, when enforcement becomes too much, uh, too much enforcement, um, uh, maybe is um, uh, maybe an issue and not, not, not only in, in, in the sense that it delays uh, the procurement process, but also in the sense that there are many fora, so many considerations about the application of, uh, of the same rules. Uh, and everyone uh, recognizes his problem or himself in, in, in some thought of, or some consideration of uh, this or the other uh, um, panel uh, who is dealing with, official panel who is dealing with procurement process. So the issue is how to combine transparency Transparency and effective judicial review and adequate recourse right and complaint for participants with uh, the smooth functioning of supply chains of the public sector and public investment needs uh, so much needed in this uh, pandemic uh, times. I'll refer um, more, um, uh, you can refer for more information about Greek uh, and uh, law we, to my paper that um, I, I, I will present in, in due time. And uh, I thanks again, I thanks again uh, the Moscow State University for the opportunity of uh, intervening this, this afternoon. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you, thank Professor. You. Thank you very much. A answering your question, your question about the enforcement, uh, for business it's always too much, always too much. But uh, for the government, they should control the uh, especially when it comes down to the public procurement. Uh, there should be regulation, there should be the control, there should be the transparency. Uh, otherwise, there will be uh, lots of opportunities of uh, disruption of those supply chains, chains and uh, you know, uh, creating the opportunities for bad people to, to get involved. Yeah, I, I agree. But um, when you have three, four panels doing the same job, it's uh, one time I counted the 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 instances um, that um, 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 uh, are uh, incompetent for the uh, review of um, uh, a single procedure. Um, it, it was eleven. Those there were eleven guys uh, or ladies um, um, uh, controlling the the entire process. Uh, starting from the legal, internal legal service, internal audit, um, uh, passing by the authority, the courts, um, the court of auditors here in this, I, I mean. Uh, finally, maybe there is, uh, at the end of the road, maybe a prosecutor.
So who is the, who's the the most uh, the most uh, dangerous? <laughs> so um, that that's what I mean. That's uh, we, we can have one one guy, one full guy to dig, and uh, four or five or ten guys uh, uh, saying say him how to how to dig. For sure, for sure, that's true. But uh, it works differently sometimes, so uh, we have to we have to you know uh, find the balance, and that's the, the that's the main question for everyone, as I see during this uh, conference and uh, you know my expertise all over the world. It's just the same thing everywhere, almost. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Legret. Yes, I, I hope that you will have the opportunity to come to Moscow State University personally next year. Of course, of course, of course <laughs> please of course. come to Moscow, please. And we'll discuss everything else. <laughs> <laughs> and we will have more than fifteen minutes for sure. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Уважаемые коллеги, не могу не сказать связи с этим на русском языке. Dear colleagues, I'm going to speak Russian. And uh, Anton Pavlovich Chekhov mentioned that uh, everything is available in Greece. And in order to have everything at your disposal, you are supposed to have very good uh, legislation on the public uh, procurement. Okay, let's uh, uh, get uh, to another country and uh, to a very, uh, uh, very, very Western country, it's Panama, and we have 8, uh, uh, 8.23 in the morning, uh, and uh, our today's speaker uh, could uh, join us with uh, uh, pleasure, and uh, Christina Tyre uh, is the professor of Panama, and in 40 minutes time, she's supposed to, to have her new classes and she's an advocate of the legal company, Legistra Tech. Panama, the floor is yours. Spoken about. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Christina Fair. I'm a, I'm a lawyer from the law firm Legistrategy located in Panama, which is a tropical country. And I will start, I would like to start by thanking the business school department of the Lomasov Moscow State University for their kind invitation to present to this conference. I will present to you uh, our experience regarding e-procurement and the COVID year. Let me share the, the screen. We can see that. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Thank perfect. you. So. Let me start by giving you some context about my country. Panama is a Latin American country located in Southern Central America, which is here, it's a very small country here. It covers a territory of around 75,000 square kilometers and has a population of roughly 4.2 million inhabitants. Its social, political, and economic indicators place it among the, the top countries in the competitiveness in Latin America. The Republic of Panama is the site of the Panama Canal, an, artifi an artificial 82 kilometers waterway connecting the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean, and one of the largest and most difficult engineering projects ever undertaken. As a consequence to its privileged location, Panama has a strong and long-standing tradition as a logistics center for the Americas, including by being the home of the Americas, established by our national carrier, Copa Airlines, one of the leading airlines of the region. Nearly 75% of its GDP is based on the services sector, where construction services are one of its main drivers, and it relies strongly on government infrastructure projects and FDI to boost economic growth. 
If one would describe the Panamanian procurement system, one would say that it is complex due to the many components of a system that is far from being unified. Even though there is a general procurement law applied to most institutions and situations, which is Law 22 of 2006, there are additional frameworks that will be applicable for some situations. For example, there are different frameworks for procurement of the Panama Canal Authority, the Social Security Agency, the National Secretariat of Public-Private Partnerships recently created, the Panamanian Maritime Authority regarding port concessions, the International Document Airport related to airport concessions, the electric transmission co company called ETESA for PPA contracts, and also for the Water and Sewage Authority called IDAM. Panama has a hybrid system to conduct procurement and are some are paper-based, like the airport concessions framework, and some are uh, e-procurement based like Law 22 2006, the ACP framework, the Social Security framework, and the one for the National Secretariat for Public Private Partnership, which is to be established. Let me briefly explain some key aspects of Law 22 worth mentioning. First, there is no discrimination. Since in principle, foreign and local proponents have equal opportunities to participate. Also transparency, because all non-confidential documents pertaining to the bids are a matter of public record, including the request for proposal, any amendments thereof, proposals itself, and also the awards. Also, Law 22 leans towards e-procurement. Almost all stages of the process may be conducted through electronic means. Due process is also part of the equation, since the bid may be declared null and void if the process is not followed as stated in the law. Finally, one important aspect is the review of the awards, since contest, contested awards by, a, by unhappy bidders may be reviewed independently. Law 22 also provides for different kinds of bid procedures depending on the thresholds or characteristics of the contract. Minor contracts are contracts below the threshold of $50,000, which is here. Simple bids are contracts where a contract is awarded to the lowest bidder, usually in simple purchases of products and services. The best value bids for, are contracts over $100,000 with a high level of complexity, where the contract will be awarded to the bidder presenting the best combination of technical and economical offer, which is not necessarily the lowest bid. Framework agreements are contracts entered into by the government with one or more pre-qualified bidders for the acquisition of mass consumption products and services through, the, through a reverse auction mechanism with prices and conditions determined during a defined period of time. Then we find the exceptional and the special procedures where the contract is awarded directly to one bidder without the need of a bid when special circum circumstances occur and also the auction of public pro property for, for the sale of leases, for the sale or lease of government property. But let's review the stages of the Law 22 process to identify in which instances the process is e-based and when is paper-based. If we were to review the pre-COVID-19 regular procedure, we find here the first instance, which is the notice. In the notice, we will find uh, all the relevant information regarding the, the date of the, of the submission, when will be the prayer meeting uh, be held, and also all the documents and, and requirements of the, of the bid itself. Usually, there, there is a mandatory legal minimum for publication of the notice for contracts over $7 million is 30 working days, but uh, usually additional time is spent. In case of a prior open meeting, which is of also mandatory for contracts over $175,000, is usually held shortly after the, the bid is convened, and uh, it's held to, to, for the contracting entity to respond questions from the bidders, and in order 
to collectively agree on their terms of the request for proposal. It used to be personal. Now uh, that prior open meeting can be held online. Then in, uh, it's, it's important to state that in, in both instances, after the notice and the prior open meeting, challenges may be, may be submitted to the, the general director of uh, government procurement uh, trying to challenge the documents of the bid, the request for proposal, and those challenges may be submitted online. Then there is the stage of proposal submission. Proposal submissions has, has to now to be submitted online after, after January 1st, 2020. And also uh, at this time, the proposal bond that has to accompany every proposal over $500,000 can be submitted online. Before January 10th, to January, 1, January 1st, 2020, those submissions had to be, uh, the, the bond had to be submitted in person. However, the proposal could be submitted online um, separately from the bond. After the submission, there is a commission report uh, so, uh, which will analyze the, the documents and submissions presented uh, at the submission date. All the reports have different time frames to issue, all the commissions have different time frames to issue the report, and uh, those reports have to be submitted online. After the report is issued, the formal, uh, the formal award have to be entered into by the, uh, by the entity, and that formal award can be submitted, uh, has to be submitted online to the public, and can be challenged before the, the tribunal, uh, the, the government procurement tribunal. After the, so we can see that after the, the COVID era, some changes were made to the, to the Panamanian regulation. The prior open meeting now can be conducted online. The proposal bond can be submitted online and the claim action can now submit it online. If we see some, some statistics here, we can see that minor contracts, even though they are the most apl applied in the system, the, the ones that occupy the most amount of money are the best value uh, bids with separate evaluation and, and with $500,000 and also the simple best value bids. Some final remarks, just to make some context. Panama was deeply affected uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. Panama relies on some level on an e-procurement, which was luckily in place before COVID-19 put the country to a full stop for quite some time. But the e-journey is far more complete, and there's still a lot of work to do since most of our procedures need to be fully integrated into e-procurement system. As the gross rolls of the Americas, Panama experience had the highest number of COVID-19 cases per 100 inhabitants with significant consequence to, it, to our GDP. As we saw during the presentation, COVID did not cause many changes to the procurement system itself, but put enormous pressure to our annual budget and execution of projects. Now the government is increasing the use of direct contracts due to the emergency increasing also public awareness of possible corruption schemes, taking advantage of the crisis. The government is now stronger in relying on vaccination to reopen economy and is initiating and continuing development of strong and heavy infrastructure initiative to attract FDI and boost economic recovery. That's uh, our intervention for today. And I would like to say thank you again uh, the Lomosov University for this kind invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. It is a great honor for us <laughs> to see you. Thank you. And, uh, and we uh, understand that it is difficult uh, for you to have a presentation today because you have students <laughs> and it is early in the morning. It's not, it's not uh, like in Moscow right now at the moment, but um, uh, we can see very nice view 
Thank you. Yeah. Welcome Thank to you. Panama. I just, I just the background. I <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much, and uh, of course we hope to see you here in next year. If you will have. Thank some. you very much. I will be, I will be happy to assist. And I, I just have the one question. Uh, like when you talk about the e-procurement, is it all held at one platform, uh, and it belongs to government or just some commercial uh, providers? Actually, um, there are several platforms. Uh, the Panama Canal Authority has its own platform. There is the platform for the general law, Law 22 of 2006, which is also used for some instances by the Social Security Agency. But the, and this, we still don't know which is the platform to be used for the private uh, public partnerships uh, law, which is to be implemented soon. Uh, so there might be three. So it's it's a very uh, complex system, and and you also need you always need advice to know where to go, where to look at, because um, there is not a unified system. You know. uh, and is it free of charge to work there, to participate, to yes. the tenders? It's just free for everyone, yes. right? It, it, almost free. For some, in some cases, like in the airport concession contracts, you have to buy the request for proposal document. But in almost all of, all of the rest of the of the of the schemes, uh, there is no charge for participating. Of course, you have to spend some money to prepare in your bid, but uh, you don't have to pay anything to the government. But for the airport concession and oh, sorry, also the uh, the electric transmission company at Desa, you also have to buy the request for proposal documents. Thank you. Thank you for your answers and for your presentation. Really okay, appreciate thank it. you very much. Thank you. Thank here. you very much. Bye-bye. A wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, now on, uh, from Panama, we uh, come back to Europe. And um, now um, we uh, go to the Republic uh, uh, the North uh, Macedonia, Ilya Manasiev, uh, this is our uh, colleague and friend, um, and uh, he has been working with our Macedonian uh, friends for a lot of time. Uh, Skopik City, it's a capital of Macedonia, and uh, uh, please, Ilya, you're welcome. Could you continue? Uh, well, uh... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. No, спасибо за приглашение. Я очень рад. Thank you for invitation. Uh, I am very glad to hear you. Uh, that you are healthy in this uh, during this uh, very difficult time. I would like um, uh, to uh, thank Moscow, the Moscow State University, uh, Professor Gubin Professor and Kichik Professor, for the organization uh, and uh, of this conference and continuation of the tradition to conduct this conference, even at this, during this difficult time. Uh, about uh, public procurement. Today, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I learned a lot of things about this public no, procurement no, from different countries, but also язык. I uh, also tried to learn Russian language. No, and that is why uh, I uh, realized that I needed some more Russian language, uh, and that's why I will continue my presentation in English. Principles of the Macedonian uh, procurement law. Uh, most of them are based uh, in according with the Article 8 of the Constitution, which has the fundamental values of the Constitution, uh, based on the rule of law, uh, legal protection of property, and market freedom and entrepreneurship. On on the other, on the other hand, uh, we are we are heading towards the candidate status of uh, the in the European Union, so we we have to we have to follow the directives of the European Union. So our latest law from 2019 is based uh, also on these directives. The, the benefits of uh, the new law on public uh, procurement 
is that uh, it is completely electronic implementation of the technique of the whole technical dialogue which includes also the pre-market check uh, it, it is also an introduction to a single electronic record of public procurement procedures which include both evident book and uh, record sheet and also uh, we have introduction of new types of procedures which are based on adjustment of existing and introduction of new electronic modules. Uh, this makes, uh, this makes uh, enabling uh, the full electronic implementation of public procurement procedures that have been so far been conducted in paper form. Starting from the negotiating procedures and competitive dialogue also through the qualification system of the bidders. Uh, there are some new types of uh, notifications in accordance with the law, which includes notifications of uh, voluntary prior transparency and also notification for the change of contract, as well as notification for realized contract. Uh, also, electronically, we have uh, publications of every quarterly records for public uh, procurement. And uh, the, one of the benefits is that we introduced the electronic complaints. Uh, also, we introduced uh, some new models for, impl for implementation of administrative control through the process. And also, uh, modules of invoices of responsible bodies and uh, economic operators. So, uh, I will just uh, briefly concern on the principles of the uh, procurement uh, law in Macedonia, which is based on the principles of free movement of goods, uh, in the freedom in the freedom of establishment, freedom to provide services, and also the freedom of the economy of the basic of the basic economy. It is based also on efficiency and competition between the economic operators. Uh, the whole, the new law is based on transparency and equal treatment of uh, economic operators and proportionality. Each of, each of these principles is uh, accordingly realized in uh, the new law. And also, for example, the principles, the principle of economy, efficiency and effectiveness on the use of the public funds is conducted in a way that the public procurement in a manner ensures economical efficient and effective use of public funds and successful achievements of the objectives of its operations, which are determined in accordance with the regulation governing the use of the budget and the other public funds. Uh, the Macedonian law is, cons is concerned only by the public uh, by the public entities not the private entities it's uh, obligatory for the public but uh, the private companies also sometimes lose types of uh, public procurements also the public procurement is made in a manner that will ensure adequate quality of the subject of the procurement but having in mind the, the relations to its purpose and value. Uh, the public procurement within the, is made within the deadline and in a manner which is pre prescribed only by the law and our regulations adapted on the basis of the law, which, which are uh, in uh, the best uh, way in accordance with the minimal cost of public procurement procedures. Uh, the principle of competition between the economic operators is made where the contracting authority must not unjustifiably restrict the competition between the economic operators. Uh, it is supposed that the contracting authority shall conduct the public procurement procedure in accordance with the regulations for protection of competition and will not restrict the potential bidders by choosing the type of the procedures 
or by conducting it contrary to the law of procurement. Um, it is it is also uh, one of one of the of these principles is uh, made in accordance that the contracting authority may not request from the bidder to hire certain subcontractors for execution of the contract. And also we cannot uh, request from the bidder to perform any other activities such as, such as export or of certain goods or services. Uh, the principle of transparency is, is made by uh, the implementing of the public procurement procedures in a very transparent manner and in accordance with the provisions of the law and the regulations which are adopted of, on the basis of the law. Uh, also, it is ensured by publishing the public procurement plan, announcement and notifications from the law. Uh, the tender documentation and the public procurement contract and also their amendments, they're all publicly, uh, publicly announced. The principle of equal treatment and non-discrimination of economic operators is made uh, by ensuring equal treatment of the economic operators at all stages of the public procurement process and in relations to all the elements, elements of the bid, taking into account the mutual recognition and proportionality of the requirements related to the subject of every procurement. The principle of proportionality is uh, made uh, when the public procurement procedure is conducted in proportion to the subject of the procurement, especially in relation, in relation to the selection definition and the applications of the conditions, also the requirements, criteria, which must be logically related to the subject of the procurement. Uh, at this time of uh, the COVID pandemics, we had uh, many, many dilemmas if our procurement system was efficient. Uh, as you may know, uh, Macedonia was one of the countries that, that was uh, on the lowest uh, scale of the, of, the, of the countries which have their people vaccinated because we had problems with the procurement in having the vaccines. Um, so in, in this COVID-19, uh, we had the two principles, which are the principles of transparency and the principle of the, of the efficiency of the systems, which were put on test by the system. So uh, many of the Macedonian citizens, uh, when we didn't uh, have uh, vaccines, um, had to go to Serbia and to be vaccinated there. Also, we couldn't have uh, the first, uh, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, vaccines coming to Macedonia by 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 a procedure of public procurement. But we had to wait for donations. So uh, at first time, uh, there were some donations from Serbia. Then we had uh, Sputnik V as a donation, which I'm grateful to the Russian people as well. Uh, so uh, so uh, we had uh, these uh, complications at the beginning. Uh, nowadays, we don't have uh, the whole analysis of every public procurement concerning COVID-19. But in the first uh, six months, there are some main, main findings. For example, uh, there were 6.7 million euros, the, uh, the value of emergency public procurement contracts, which are made for coronavirus protection, which were concluded in the first six months of the crisis. Uh, it is very significant and strange that one third of the value of these contracts belongs to the Ministry of Interior, and also 43% uh, of the value of all tenders belong only to five companies. Although a total of 186 companies won a tender for public procurement related to the coronavirus. Uh, also, 68% 60, of the concluded agreement that were made, uh, institutions violated the legal obligation to publish the agreement within 10 days from signing. This, 
this were this was uh, very heavily uh, criticized by the opposition and by the and and by the legal and by the legal professionals and also one one of every three coronavirus related public procurement contracts were negotiated only with one bidder so uh, we at, at the end we we had uh, different prices of purchased masks and gloves uh, concerning the coronavirus so in order to make this uh, in more positive manner, we had to change the, we had to amend the public procurement law in uh, April of 18th, uh, 2021. And so the amendment was that the contracting, the contracting authority from the classical public sector may provide an advance greater than 20% of the value of the contract without obligation to provide a bank guarantee for advance payment by the holder of the procurement in public procurement procedures. Only if these products are dealt with uh, the COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so I, I hope, I hope uh, that uh, we will have in future many informations. One of the main concerns of the public was that uh, the contracts with the providers of the vaccines didn't allow uh, for the public to know the price of the vaccines. So we are still waiting for the for the the prices of, of uh, the vaccines so the people know how many from all our funds were given to the vaccines. So I will write much more in my detailed, uh, detailed, uh, detailed uh, report. Uh, and so I hope that uh, the next year we will see each other in Moscow. Yeah, but and I hope that we will also. Uh, I'm sure we will meet in Moscow next year, of course. Thank you very much, Ilya. Colleagues, can you hear me? Да, да, все Dear понятно. colleagues, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ilya. We will hope we we'll have a lot of other topics than COVID. Uh, everything get back and uh, let's say we'll have classic form of our cooperation uh, on, with our conferences. Ilya, we'll, we're looking forward to getting your report. Thank you very much. I'd like to remind all of you, dear participants, uh, during this summer, let's say we're issuing you, uh, let's say, a volume. It's a new year, 2021. Once we need to collect all the information, uh, gather new information, uh, include new authors uh, to these uh, guidelines, let's say. Let me give the floor to our next uh, speaker from the country that is not far from Macedonia, from Slovenia. So this is uh, the name of the person. Do you know Russian, maybe? No, <laughs> but you, un but you understood But you understand me. <laughs> my question, my, uh, uh, my request. Let me introduce Nadivis Prelognifat. She's attorney at law and the head of public procurement department of law from Slovenia. Please, we'll be very glad to hear your report. Yes, of course, I'm sending you uh, a warm greetings from Slovenia, from Ljubljana. Uh, my name is uh, Nivers Prelog Nefat, and I'm a lawyer uh, on the field of public procurement. And uh, today I want uh, talk about the organizational structure of public procurement in Slovenia because um, the main is similar as in Hungary, because Slovenia is um, the member of um, EU. So, you know, there is some similarity. So I decide that I will talk about the references and bad performance uh, of the contract because uh, the public procurement procedure 
is not just one step procedure. It has two stages. And the first stage is the award stage. And in the second stage is execution or performance of the contract. And in the both phases, the contract authority uh, has to comply with the main principles of uh, public procurement and th that are transparency, equal treatment and pr principle of uh, um, uh, competition among the, uh, the bidders. And usually in the public procurement procedure, the bidder to whom the contract is awarded have to, in the evaluation stage, this is the first stage, show the proof that it is uh, capable uh, uh, to perform the contract so that he's got the technical and human resources. And usually the proof is the references uh, uh, from the past contracts we, which was performed in, in the past. So um, when the contract authority requires uh, these references, usually requires references as, as generally. And of course, because of that, we have the problems in the public procurement procedure in the first stage, because the bidders are capable to furnish the proof that they have the references, because they were the contractual partner in the, in the past, uh, in the past uh, contracts. But, you know, actually, they didn't perform the contract, but they outsourced it, it to the subcontractors or JD partners. And because of that, some companies get the public procurement and they are not capable, you know, to perform in the second phase. So the contract authority has have a many problem how to uh, how to tackle with that kind of bidders and because of uh, uh, um, deficiency in the in the performing. So in Slovenia, uh, because you know this is a really major problem here, a contract authority usually requires uh, the actual references. So there is a question, what are the actual references? Uh, the actual references means that the bidder must furnish the proof that the bidder uh, have, uh, have performed the, con uh, perform, uh, the works according to contract with his own resources, human and technical resources. And of course, also uh, the contract authority uh, uh, want to obligate with the award contract that this bidder who shows its uh, capability also uh, perform the contract with these resources. You know, he showed before that he is capable, so this means that he must also take all works. So he cannot use the subcontractors or JV partners without allowance of the contract authority. Of course, there are here some, uh, you know, big projects where it is impossible uh, to require uh, the actual references. Uh, for example, that kind of project uh, uh, in Slovenia is the biggest uh, project. This is construction or railway uh, line track. You know, in that case, of course, uh, the one company couldn't uh, perform the, the whole contract, but it, it could be just performed by some consortium or, you know, there, there should be a cooperation with, with a lot of uh, uh, others, uh, so JV partners, subcontractors, and so on. So we have the same problem, what to do with, with uh, that kind of uh, uh, bidder uh, that in the second stage, when the contract authority has a problem, how, how to prevent uh, 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 some annexes because, because of that, you know, you have to stipulate uh, additional uh, annexes and uh, because of that uh, 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 is not so, it is also the problem uh, with, the, with the time. So we suggest to the contract authority to put in the contract uh, the review clause 
according to which you can substitute the provider. And uh, you can substitute the provider uh, only in the, in the case of the bad performance or in the case when the financial, financial standing of a provider is so bad that he's, that, uh, uh, public, uh, that the contract authority is for sure that he's not capable to uh, finish the works according to the contract. And you can substitute uh, the uh, provider with the new provider without starting in uh, without starting the new procedure, under uh, condition that this provider, the new provider, could be only be the bidder who participate in the first phase. And uh, this bidder, you know, was uh, the second uh, the second best according to the award criteria, and also this uh, new provider can only enter in the contractual relationship under the same condition as it was in the original contract. Only in that case, the contract authority can. Uh, avoid uh, a conducting a new procedure and that that is how you know it, some solutions uh, uh, that we can give to the contract authority to avoid uh, uh, some providers because of bad efficiency uh, I, I was very short <laughs> I, I prefer just that <laughs> um, you know, I, I thought that I would be longer when... <laughs> no, no, I think it's a very it's good uh, duration of your speech because, <laughs> as you can see, we have very strict regulament. I don't know, do you have the, the same word in Slovenian language, regulament? Uh, uh, it, it, yeah, it's easy for Slovenian uh, and all other languages that are close to the Russian language. You just, you know, uh, choose different words, and at some point you'll pick the right one, so they will understand us. So I'm pretty sure that uh, yeah, we're, we're we're actually going according to plan. So it is good that your presentation was not too long, so we'll have a chance to catch it up and um, try to keep on the timing. But still, we're still behind. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank for you the Jim, information yes, for the yes. presentation. Thank you, and uh, we hope to see you too next year at uh, the conference in Moscow. <laughs> we'll definitely have some more time. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you. Уважаемые коллеги, и в заключительной части. Dear colleagues, in the finishing part of our today's section, the conference devoted to the Eastern Europe section, let me move forward to Lugansk. LPR, give the floor to our colleagues Kutsurubova Shevchenka, Yelena Viktorovna, Associate Professor, Head of the Department of Business Law and Arbitration Process of Lugansk National University, named after Dal, PhD in Law, Irina Kutava, Associate Professor of the Department of the same department, Tatiana Kralkina, Senior Lecturer of the Department of Business Law and Arbitration Process of the same university, Natalia. Masha Lutchenko, head of the legal department of the university, and a lecturer of the Department of Business Law and Arbitration Process of Lugansk National University, named Amla Dal. Thank you very much. Can you hear us? Thank you for giving us the floor. Thank you that you invite us. And uh, we, due to your efforts, we are the participants the part of this uh, nice event international event of course we have something to share with you about public procurement bidding in Lugansk uh, Republic so I want to tell you the following the mechanism of legislation of public procurement was started in 2015 once we had at once to decree of the Board of Ministers. This is uh, the procedure of public procurement. And uh, the deals uh, procedures. 
with of the interested parties. Например, это произошло в Донецкой Народной Республике. У нас не планируется и принятие закона тоже не рассматривается. Этим порядком первоначально, скажу, было предусмотрено проведение процедуры закупки при условии, если стоимость товара равна или превышает 300. If it is a 300,000 contract and for performance it is over 3 million. And within these five years the government uh, actually uh, lowered the threshold uh, and nowadays we have another limit uh, and we define it via our tender bid. Uh, and uh, if we talk about the 200,000 uh, for the object um, and the work is over 1 million and that is our threshold. In 2018, uh, some new amendments uh, were introduced onto these uh, regulations. And if the threshold uh, is okay, so this uh, over threshold uh, um, procedure may be applied. And it is quite a stable process and uh, was a stable process and quite a reliable one, but there were some less, uh, some modifications uh, uh, were made in June 2020. Uh, and in order to provide uh, the procurement uh, procedure within the framework of the earmarked programs, uh, so uh, here we had to proceed uh, from the competition. And in September 2020, the regulation of the government uh, said that uh, the sole information system uh, uh, was to be set up and uh, the uniform order of registration was instituted in the sphere of uh, procurement. And uh, all the thresholds uh, were identified uh, for the budget and uh, the information system is the sole provider of these services. And it has been already established. It is a comprehensive automated system, which is designated to provide the automation of the budget allocations and also for the attendees to the procurement process. And all the information is placed at the level of this system. It contains information on the plans of procurement, procurement per se, the overview and analysis of procurement, and the register of um, tender bids, uh, the register of uh, participants, uh, the register of um, customers uh, in the blacklist to have a bad face, and legal no reg regulatory acts are enlisted there. And uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we um, almost all uh, also managed to automate the register for procurements for the list of participants and the results uh, of procurement. And the statistics says, uh, uh, and uh, Vitaly Alexeyevich Whiteman uh, also spelled out uh, some statistics uh, in Moscow and uh, the number of those registered in the uniform information system which is uh, for as mighty is hundreds and hundreds of thousands. But as of the 21st of March, 2021, uh, the system uh, registered uh, 1418 uh, customers. Yeah? And uh, 1434 the, uh, was the rest of the performance. performance. And uh, over the past six months, uh, the system has been already uh, simplified uh, with due regard uh, to the document flow and thus we avoided various infringements and various um, errors and uh, also it was done for the benefit of the uh, parties to that system and the management of the republic is fully in favor of uh, the introduction of the uniform uh, information system and they would like uh, to digitize the entire process uh, on a full-fledged basis. Nevertheless, uh, our uh, performers uh, bring their bids in the envelopes uh, on paper. 
And the cell information system, which is now in the pipeline, uh, is bearing fruit. And in, a, in the opinion of a customer, uh, these results testify to the fact that they may become very helpful to the government bodies in terms of the procurement system. And the cell uh, uniform information system uh, actually facilitated uh, the efforts uh, of the controlling and supervising body. So the Ministry for Economic Development, uh, the State Service for Fiscal and Financial Work and Treasury are fully in charge of uh, these work. But thanks to the uniform system, the controlling and supervisory bodies may keep track of all the procedures in terms of procurement. And as for the performers and customers, uh, this uh, is not uh, uh, such a simplified system, but I fully agree that of course, uh, uh, thanks to, to the availability of uh, the information system, the process has been eased. And uh, let me speak uh, about the trends uh, in the Lugansk Republic and in terms of the public procurement. And uh, operately uh, since last September, and uh, and uh, the customers were groups and the state-owned companies, uh, invariably uh, learned how to use the system and how to be registered in that uniform system. And as to the performers, uh, they are not very much interested to, to be registered as they use uh, those uh, resources uh, um, quite happily and uh, probably uh, we come across uh, the situation uh, when the university uh, came across the situation by the end of the year when we have some uh, vacancies uh, to be replaced and uh, the university came across the situation uh, that the civil information system which has been registered uh, is all alone. And uh, as to the non-government uh, system, yes, they put an announcement. And so we had to organize the free threshold uh, um, uh, purchases and look uh, for the second uh, performer. And uh, we haven't um, got an information on the performance uh, performance in bad faith, and uh, we offer this opportunity uh, to be uh, published uh, in a specific uh, newspaper uh, in the form of an article, uh, thus avoiding these problems. But uh, the competition has to be ensured at the state at the level of the government, but really much depends on the number of suppliers and the number of bidders. I discussed it already um, at the level of the such conferences, and we do not have too many attendees to that uh, system. But uh, nevertheless, our legislation is progressing, and there are some modifications that uh, included. And if the tender was not successful for two times, they may uh, have a direct contract included uh, with the supplier of service for goods. And the government will probably not pay much attention uh, to that particular uh, deal. But uh, um, as to FAS uh, anti monopoly service, uh, we do not have uh, anything of the kind in the Lugansk Republic. And um, uh, we uh, really have to mention that the number of uh, subjects uh, tend to be monopolists. And their uh, status uh, sometimes could not be confirmed. Uh, so we have monopolists and we have other organizations who might not confirm their status. And uh, we had one of the performers uh, 
uh, and uh, we resort uh, to his uh, services because only this provider uh, can do the job and that's it and in uh, well, last september the procedure uh, for procurement was changed with due regard to the affiliated organizations and uh, restricting the bids up to one from on the one hand we proceed from the stakeholders interest but on the other hand we do not have that much performers at the market and we cannot sometimes organize even a tender and uh, budget um, funds are allocated but uh, we might not find a performer to do the job and the uniform system already has the contact uh, on the affili affiliated persons but uh, the performance are supposed uh, to uh, put this information into the system and uh, the uh, uh, the client doesn't see the this information in the system and uh, really a, a special procedure needs to be added in order to check the state registration and uh, the next uh, problem to come is uh, the uh, proposals uh, from the subject of the Russian Federation. Uh, whenever some uh, large scale uh, purchases uh, are undertaken, on the one hand, uh, we already have a competition, which is good. And on the other hand, uh, the subjects of the Russian Federation uh, uh, just have another uh, pricing, another bid. Uh, we always have a low uh, price bid, and we could not always check the quality of goods and uh, their compliance. Sometimes uh, we purchase the low quality uh, commodity, uh, but uh, that's how it works. And uh, we do not have some testing labs uh, for specific goods. Uh, and uh, due to that particular uh, reason, we cannot attain our goal. Uh, the goods are purchased, uh, low quality goods. Uh, they were out uh, pretty fast. And again, uh, we have uh, to uh, procure the new batch of uh, spare parts, for example. and. Uh, and the plan is not uh, fulfilled. The budget funds are uh, used ineffectively. And let me mention another problem that I would like to highlight it once again uh, in the article, in the newspaper article. We should give a free hand to a customer to provide uh, the procurement without any monitoring. Uh, these uh, are some kind of uh, uh, very uh, low, like petty uh, cash, uh, and which may be used uh, for uh, minor purposes. And uh, the tender procedure is not necessitated here. And so uh, we may also offer another list of uh, criteria, and, uh, but it is real hard to explain uh, it all to our government bodies. And they tend to say that it is uh, inefficient and ineffective of budget funds. So thank you, um, the moderators. Uh, I would like to thank Moscow uh, to have a say. It's our honor and privilege uh, to be present here, and we're interested in the approaches of other countries and how it works this year and uh, how it worked last year. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Okay, and I would like uh, to say that Natalia Shulutinka is the head of the uh, legal department and she comes across uh, quite a number of actual problems. Next year, we will come with our greatest pleasure and uh, familiarize ourselves with your practices. And uh, will you uh, give uh, my best regards uh, from our very respected scientist. And we got together with him, with him at our conference, Mr. Lachnowski, and it was Mr. Razovsky and who wanted to talk to everybody. And it was real our honor and privilege to be heard from Lugansk. And it was done 
uh, by Mr. Rosowski. And uh, we are happy that uh, his articles are being printed and we go on cooperating with him. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words. And you touched upon uh, a criteria for defining a winner. And uh, quite a number of people talked about uh, the low bid price and it could be a panacea uh, from any uh, troubles and challenges. And a year ago, Mark Steiner, who is going to have a say today, and Professor Boyce, uh, who is going to talk now, uh, to, uh, will discuss the same problem at the, the level of our conference. And on the one hand, uh, the legislation of uh, various countries uh, on the uh, public procurement is based on the UNICETRAL and uh, the UN practices. But nevertheless, uh, we may come across some specificity and uh, in Japan, they have their own specificity and uh, in other countries as well. And uh, uh, in other countries of the world, uh, they might have some kind of a uniform approach, but uh, the problems uh, are more or less the same. And that's why it's very interesting how we face the challenges and address these challenges in various countries of the world. Uh, welcome to Moscow next year, uh, dear colleagues. We are uh, finishing up uh, the last but not the least block, and we are coming to the very last one, to the uh, Western Europe, and we're supposed to have two headliners, that's uh, the Azerbaijan and uh, uh, Dominicana. And uh, let's start from the Western Europe and give the floor to a renowned professor, British professor, or on the procurement, Christopher Bovis, uh, pro uh, Professor of International Business uh, Law at the University of Hull, uh, Great Britain. Professor Bovis, the floor is yours. Uh, will you please uh, plug in? Professor Bovis? Professor. Maybe we have to click something extra. Professor Boris, are you with us? Professor Boris, are you okay? Need any help? Maybe. Так, ну, пока профессор Бовис подключается, я так понимаю, что возможно. Uh, professor is preparing. Maybe uh, we will uh, pass the floor to the next uh, speaker. Uh, this is our great friend from uh, Switzerland, uh, uh, the Swiss Federal Administrative Court Judge Mark Steiner from Switzerland. And as far as I know, Mark uh, just uh, the stepped in. And let's uh, just uh, give him the floor. Mr. Steiner. Господин Steiner. Господин Steiner. Just yours. Такое ощущение, что какие-то технические проблемы у нас. Коллеги, организаторы, возможно, какие-то сложности там у спикеров. Хотя в вижу роли все необходимые стоят, технические сложности быть не должно. Are there any problems? Uh speakers because uh, there should not be any technical problems i think hmm. Странно, да. 
Все, нет, коллеги рапортуют, что все работает, все в порядке. Может быть... Просто не отошли временно. Офлайн. Давайте в таком случае... Let ask our Austrian colleague is he here? Maybe Austrian colleague is here. Philip Marbo, uh, the um, yeah, uh, counsel attorney speak. at law, yeah. of law from Wolf Size, Austria. Honestly, I say Swiss people are so reliable, and now it's Austria who has to save the party. So I could make a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much yes, for stepping in. Yeah, of course, no problem. I just wanted to give you a technical advice. I have a camera, in fact, so you could even see me if you would like to. They just informed me that I can connect my camera because the host is somehow blocking it. So maybe if you want to, because I don't see myself, I think you won't see me neither, do you? Yeah, we don't see you actually at the moment. So uh, uh, you, have, you have some technical problems uh, turning on the camera? No, I, I could switch it on, like I could unmute me and then I get an advice. Now it should work probably, I hope. Yeah. Because, yeah okay, great. We see the black screen though. Okay. So, now we can see. Oh, okay, yeah. great, great. So, We're all good. That's good. So first of all, I would like to um, thank everybody who has organized this conference. Um, Kuzma, with whom I have corresponded already and all the other people who have been involved. I'm very honored to participate in this conference. Um, probably I would have um, preferred to be there in person, but I think uh, under the current circumstances, it's good to have an interactive um, conference as well. What I want to present to you is a short um, overview on public procurement regime in Austria. Um, we have 10 to 15 minutes, so I will try to stick to the time. And for this reason, I have selected some um, topics which are in fact, only three topics. The first one would be a short introduction uh, regarding Austria, a uh, short introduction on history, how the, 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 the Republic is structured. And then um, I'd come to the legal framework of public procurement and finally to law enforcement, which is the theme of this conference as I have seen from the title. Um, to start with uh, Austria, uh, many of you uh, will know the country, others maybe not so much. Uh, it's in the heart of um, Europe. It has been formerly the Habsburg Empire uh, until 1918. Um, after the Second World War, it has been occupied um, until 1955. Um, and with the State Treaty, Austria was liberated. And then uh, in 1995, there was the accession to the European Union. To give you a short um, um, uh, idea of the size, there are almost 9 million inhabitants and the surface is about 380,000 uh, 380, uh, square kilometers. Um, another indicator, economic side from the gross uh, domestic product in 2020, according to the International Monetary Fund, Austria um, had a product of 432 US million dollars, which was the 28th worldwide, and per capita, it was the 13th worldwide rank. So you have a certain idea about the economic power of Austria. With um, this introduction, I come to the legal framework, as has been mentioned uh, previously as well by, by the Slovenian colleague. We all follow the regime given by the European Union. So um, the legal framework of the public procurement in Austria is basically based on the three main directives from the European Union, which are the directive 2014-24 on public procurement and repealing directive 2004-18. Then it's the directive on procurement by entities operating in the water, energy, transport and postal services sectors. This is commonly referred to the utilities directive. And finally, the concessions directive, which is new compared to the other ones, which has been published as well back in 2014. When we come to the national framework, it's important to know that Austria is a federal um, 
republic. This means that there are nine federal states. Uh, they are called Bundesländer in German. You will know it probably from Germany where they are called Länder. So we have nine smaller entities. On the constitutional level, there is Article 14b of the Austrian Constitution, which stipulates that the legislation in the matters of public procurement is principally attributed to the national state, whereas the execution of the matters of public procurement is divided between the national state and the federal state. On the statutory law level, um, we have the Public Procurement Act, which is called Bundesvergabegesetz in, in German, if somebody is, uh, knows the German language. Then we have the Public Procurement Act concessions, the Public Procurement Act defense and security. So this is transposing the Defense Directive 2009-81 EC. And in addition to this, given the federal structure of Austria have nine public procurement laws for each of the nine federal states. So this is sometimes in practice a bit complicated. Uh, you just have to bear in mind that you have two laws in fact for each federal state. Materially speaking, they are quite similar, but there are some differences as well. For example, from a formal point of view in some federal states, for example, there is a pre a procedure before you enter the real procedure. So these are some details you always have to bear in mind. With this, I already reached the third theme of my short presentation, which is law enforcement, um, according to the theme of the today's conference. In order to enforce your legal position in public procurement procedures, there are two main procedures, procedures uh, that can be chosen by the economic operator, which is the review procedure and the procedure for declaratory judgment. The review procedure um, seeks to have decisions by the contracting authority declared null and void. And these applications must generally be filed within 10 days after the decision was transmitted. This is mainly by electronic means nowadays. Whereas in the procedure for declaratory judgment, these are aimed to have decisions by the contracting authority declared unlawful. These applications must generally be submitted within six months of the time at which the applicant had or should have had knowledge of the challenge decision. This um, timeline of six months has been absolute in the past, but then according to a decision of the European Court of Justice, it's, it has been made flexible, saying subjective, so it's important that um, somebody can prove that he did not know or could not have known about this decision previously. And on the next uh, uh, slide, I'd like to um, emphasize some condition for these two law enforcement procedures. Um, any application for a review procedure must fulfill certain criteria and requirements. So what do you have to do if you want to file such an application? You have to demonstrate your interest in the contract. You have to expound the sus sus supposed damage. You have to name the rights in which you are infringed. You have to indicate the reasons for the breach of law. And another very particular um, circumstance in the Austrian law of law enforcement is that there are only some explicitly enumerated decisions by the contracting authority that may be challenged. So you have only one catalog um, in which you can choose um, the reason for, 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 for which you are, are challenging this decision. For example, this can be the selected award procedure, the tender documents, the invitation to tender, the selection or exclusion of the bids, as well the selection or exclusion of, of bidders and the award decision. Just to give somebody as well a certain um, idea how in practice in Austria, this law enforcement would um, roll out. I have uh, just tried to find a certain success rate, how you could say are your chances if you trying to challenge the decisions by the contracting authority. There are of course no official statistics, but there is a yearly report by the Federal Administrative Court 
Uh, this report is made according to different categories, according to the fields of law. So you have, for example, numbers for procurement law, of course, regulatory, asylum, personal rights and education, social matters, traffic and envi environment, for example. And this success rate in, in the year 2020 has been um, of 23% uh, in public procurement in this federal administrative court. So you can say that one quarter uh, of challenges is positive, which is maybe a quite uh, um, significant successful rate success rate. And another la and last point I wanted to emphasize that so the duration of proceedings before the court, there is even one um, norm that is saying that the courts in public procurement affairs should rule within six weeks. So this is really something which might be um, very fast if it's always observed. And of course, this um, rule is just a general rule. So if the court needs more time, he can, can always find the reasons to say that this is justified. So in practice, you have 54 of all proceedings are terminated within six months, 13% within one year, 9% within two years, and even 11% uh, last uh, three years and 13% even above three years. So you can see, even if I have to say that this, this last um, statistic is for all cases, so not only public procurement, but it's a certain indicator that uh, these six weeks um, mostly is um, an orientation, but not the reality. With this, I'm already <laughs> finished. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. No, thank you. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. First Beautiful. of all, for saving the day, that that was that was amazing. Thank you. All the more. <laughs> <laughs> and, Thank you very uh, much. And I have and I have questions for you. Um, I would like to ask, how did the uh, the pandemic affect uh, the procurement uh, in the country and regulation for this past, I would say, two years also almost. Yeah, I mean, it was very interesting. Uh, on one hand, I mean, as I'm doing as well, a lot of things uh, in the railway, in the public railway sector, we had a lot of emergency contracts. So for example, for public transportation, there had to be a lot of um, additional traffic because um, the, the companies, of course, had a lot of financial problems. And the second big impact that we observed was in the building and work sector because many um, projects, of course, couldn't be really implemented as foreseen. So you had to adapt a lot of, um, of, a lot of contracts and contract provisions to foresee how to deal with these things because many had force majeure. So it was the question, is this covered by this? This was a second very strong um, emphasis of our counseling in this period. And generally speaking, we have observed that Beside from the emergency things, which were very important as well, of course, in the medical advice for masks and these things, we had, we really did a lot of them. It was even quite interesting to see at the beginning, and I think maybe in all countries it was similar. There were many, many people producing suddenly masks, you know, coming from anywhere. So it was really quite a time of learning as well to distinguish between between serious providers and somebody who just said, now I'm making masks. So this was an experience that we had as well in this time. And um, another thing that was interesting to see is that some people, of course, uh, postponed projects. So the ones that were not started yet, they had a tendency to, to wait to see how the situation would roll out. And now in the last uh, months and weeks really see an increase of of business, like trying to to gain the time that has been lost. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Philip. Uh, nice to hear you. And it, it was very interesting to hear your report today. And uh, I hope that uh, we will see each other next year at the conference in Moscow. Thank you very much. I hope so as well. And I wish good luck to Russia in the European Championships still. Same for yeah. Austria. Yeah, we have both one victory. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a good start. Thank you. Thank you very much. And see you. See you. See you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Уважаемые коллеги, и мы uh, все-таки переходим... Uh, colleagues, uh, and we continue our conference. Uh, we uh, stick to our program. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, Boris, Boris uh, Christopher, a professor of international business law at the University of Hull, Great Britain. I think the connection is good here. Last year, professor uh, Boris uh, uh, told us a lot about uh, things, about a, very, a lot of interesting things and also he spoke about an order of uh, uh, conducting uh, of uh, uh, procedures without notice without publications um, and also he spoke about uh, uh, court yeah. decisions uh, in which um, Italy participated, but regarding Italy we will have some other participants and speakers but now we would like to uh, hear our um, dear professor Christopher Boris. Boris. Dear Kuzma, dear Stanislav, uh, dear colleagues, I'm delighted to be with you uh, on the uh, 11th International Conference uh, for Lomonas University on Procurement. I'm very sad that I won't be with you this year because of uh, emergency, emergency situations that evolve around the pandemic. And I, I really upset uh, that uh, I missed the opportunity to meet uh, colleagues, meet yourselves and your colleagues and international colleagues on procurement. But we have technology and through technology, we're able to communicate and meet virtually and perform our academic duties and communicate best practice in our discipline procurement. I'd like to spend some time today to discuss uh, what is the state of affair for emergency procurement in the European Union and also in the UK. Many countries, including the UK that has now left the European Union since the 1st of January 2021 uh, and have more or less similar regime, but not identical regime of the procurement directives, are faced with that concept of emergency procurement. The pandemic was a rude awakening. There was a cold start for every administration in the world, not only in Europe, but also in other jurisdictions in North America and the Far East. And the problem was the concept of emergency. In Europe, the emergency procurement competed with the normal award procedures for public contracts. If nothing had happened, if we didn't have the pandemic, if there was no concept of emergency, we would have open procedures, restricted procedures, negotiated procedures, negotiated procedures with publication, prior publicity, competitive negotiations, the new procedures that the uh, new directives allow for some degree of benchmarking and competition in the negotiations, the competitive dialogue, the dialogue that allows the contracting authority to competitively find the best and final offer between uh, undertakings for complex and uh, sophisticated projects, uh, framework agreements for utilities, but also for the public sector, dynamic purchasing systems and electronic auctions for the uh, technological advancement of public procurement in uh, the European markets. That was the norm. This is exactly what we expected to see if the pandemic was not there. And there were preferences across the European Union. There are preferences of many member states. Some member states love the open procedures. They like the idea to have openness and transparency as much as possible. And of course, they have to counterbalance that with the concepts of uh, technicality and complexity in the projects. Others, other member states, such as France, for example, love negotiations. They like to negotiate. They like to create that element of uh, achieving value for money for their public contracts through negotiations. And the Code de Marche Public, the system that uh, corresponds into the implementation, the domestic implementation, allows and in fact incentivizes public servants to negotiate on price and quality for the delivery of public contracts. Other member states do not like negotiations. Other member states, they're against negotiations. They like that concept of rigidity in public procurement with a contest, with the ability to contest the pricing element. So they can verify that they achieve competitive and best value for money in uh, awarding public contracts. Last year, 
April 1st, 2020, when the pandemic was in full front, the European Commission decided that they need soft law, they need guidance. They need to intervene in the member states, specifically in administration, and issue guidance, which recognizes two important things. First, the flexibility of the public procurement. That's the first attempt that the European Commission openly, through an open guidance, through soft law, allows for any conclusion that the public procurement regime is flexible. And the second assumption here through the guidance is that the pandemic, the COVID-19, represents emergency of extreme nature, unforeseen circumstances, an emergency that allows the member states and the uh, administrations of the European states to take control of the situations. From the previous anticipated way to award public contracts through the variety of options I mentioned to you, you have that concept of emergency procurement through unforeseen events brought by the pandemic. And we have the options. The Commission put the options in front of the member states and the national administrations. The first option is to accelerate the procurement procedures. Follow as much as possible procurement procedures, but step on the acceleration. Create, because of due of urgency, shorter deadlines, accelerate the whole process, but still keep some element of competition, some element of contestability. The other option is to call that notion of extreme urgency. You heard many times, my colleagues are uh, very familiar with that, extreme urgency verifies the notion of uh, direct awards, negotiations without any advertisement, and also direct awards to pre-selected economic operators. Previously, that situation of direct awards and negotiated procedures without prior publicity, they were prohibited. The European Commission, the European Court of Justice, many member states did not allow that option, although that option is legal. Since 1972, the European directives allow for direct awards, believe it or not. And the last option that the European Commission offered to the member states it was quite a sophisticated option on market engagement for alternative solutions. That is soft issue of bringing together the market and allowing the market to bring some options, some solutions to the front so the member state, the national administration, the health system can engage and buy not only the vaccine, but also uh, the ventilator, medical equipment, uh, protective equipment such as masks, so they can beat the pandemic. There was no such an issue as a, a patent for the vaccine. The vaccine had to be invented. Therefore, a pre-market engagement was necessary to determine how many vaccines we needed. And you will see from many jurisdictions and many litigations in front of the courts that uh, there's a shortage of vaccines. Uh, many vaccines are not fully uh, circulated for a number of issues. The, the vaccine itself has been weaponized as a, a policy, a national policy instrument, which is unfortunate, but this is the reality. And the European Commission wanted to engage with the market to prevent that. The first option, we mentioned the acceleration, the timelines are shortened considerably. The open procedure, which is the norm, from 35 days down to 15 days, acceptable to award the contract within 15 days using the open procedure. For restricted procedure, for the first stage, for the request to participate, from 30 days down to 15 days, and for restricted procedure, the submission stage, the second stage, which is the norm, the expected default procedure, from 30 days are down to 10 days. So you will see a considerable shifting on the acceleration timing on these normal procedures. The most important change in the mentality is the extreme urgency, the negotiated procedures without prior publicity. That's allowed. 
It's in the directives, Article 32, Paragraph 2, I and C of the directive. Uh, the system allows for extreme urgency brought by unforeseen circumstances to the contracting authority, the contracting authority itself to negotiate directly without any prior publicity. The conditions are the unforeseeability that you couldn't see, you couldn't forecast, and so a lot of litigation will come to the European court and also national courts about uh, the planning, the risk assessment for pandemics, that part of the system of the government to create a kind of a risk of a biological risk of uh, contagious diseases. And they fail. Every state failed for that. So the unforeseeability will be collective, but uh, uh, quite often it's something demonstrable across the world that uh, they didn't do the job. The governments didn't do the work properly to forecast something which is uh, dangerous, uh, contagious, and something of a pandemic. We had pandemics before. We had the SARS, we had the, uh, uh, the, the foot and mouth disease the last decade. So we know exactly what's happening with a pandemic, epidemic versus pandemic situation. We had the Ebola crisis. Ebola was a pandemic, but it didn't materialize to the extent that the COVID family, COVID-19 did. So the unforeseeability is one condition. Extreme urgency means that you need to do something of an extreme intervention, which is to protect human health. That's the second condition. The legal causality link between unforeseeable events and the extreme urgency. This is legalistic, but it's imperative to see whether the government, any administration can prove that there is a causal link, there's a, a connection between the unforeseen circumstances and the extreme urgency. And the temporary nature of that intervention, it's only a stopgap. After the pandemic is over, we expect to go back into norm and use the procedures that we described before, not the negotiation procedures without publicity or direct awards. These are the exceptions. And that was the, what the commission decided to put on the table through soft law across the member states. The Court of Justice in the past was extremely negative for the use of negotiated procedures without prior publicity. It specifically mentioned that all the conditions, the conditions we just described, have to be met cumulatively, all at the same time. The causality, the extreme urgency, and the unforeseeability, they have to be on the table, cumulatively at the same time. If one is missing, the whole exception is not there. And you have two cases here, leading cases to the courts, the national courts, and also the academia and the researchers to use as a, a kind of a, um, a benchmark for the thought process. Commission versus Germany and the Consiglio Nazionale dell'Ingegneria, the Italian case, to justify the conditions for exceptionality of the use of negotiated procedures without prior publicity. Negotiated procedures without publication also allows the contracting authority to award the contract directly, to negotiate or award the contract directly. That means pick up the phone and award a specific contract directly to either a pre-selected economic operator or something that during that process telephone conversation, that short period of interface with the market, they decided that this is the undertaking to take control of that situation. So the direct award and the negotiated procedures without prior publicity have to be evaluated on the part of the contracting authority about the necessity. The contracting authority has to write a report, it's expected, the commission expects to produce a report every time they using negotiated procedures without or with prior publication. So we have that one more time, the specific obligation to record, to monitor that utilization of the exceptional procedure. And that is important to see on a, a holistic base, on an umbrella base, on a cumulative base about what is expected from the contracting authority. They know that they have flexibility. They know they have discretion. They can use 
anything other than the normal way to award public contracts. And that is the other side of the coin. They have to justify. They have to come and write the report to the commission to use that concept of justification for the award of a contract through negotiated procedures or direct awards. In practice, in real practice in the UK and also in other parts of the European Union, uh, the uh, award procedures, the negotiated procedures without prior publicity is used for three specific grounds. The technical reasons or exclusive rights. Technical reasons means uh, only one person because it has the know-how to complete the contract. Exclusive rights means intellectual property rights or licensing rights. For example, the production of a vaccine or the production of a ventilator for the national health system. Another reason for looking at very restrictively the use of negotiated procedures without prior publicity is extreme urgency. Exactly what the commission expects, what the court expects also, the extreme urgency. If you don't do something, uh, people will hurt, people, uh, human health will uh, diminish. And also the last concept, the last possibility of using negotiated procedures without prior publicity is the repetitive words, repetitive concepts of the same contract within three years of the conclusion of a contract which was previously awarded competitively. That is the only restrictive exceptional way to use negotiated procedures without prior publicity. But the court was every time faced with a case concerning these conditions, very reluctant to accept it. And you know that every time uh, the case concerning negotiations went to the court, it was by Italy. Italian lawyers are very famous people in Luxembourg and very famous people for stretching or trying to stretch the system of European public procurement, extremely imaginative lawyers and uh, extremely uh, innovative uh, procurement authorities. But for some reason, the court didn't like it, didn't like the arguments. And every time Commission versus Italy that uh, uh, referred to the European Court of Justice on negotiated procedures without prior advertisement, they lost the case. Every single case concerning urgency and foreseeability of circumstances, even exclusive rights. The court decided against because they threw the ball back into the state, to the contracting authority, Italy in particular, and said, you should have done your job properly. You should have planned it. You should have created a list of pre-procured entities ready to jump on and deal with the emergency, other than directly award the contracts to whoever you want. That was the argument back in the 80s, all the way to the 90s. The Commission, the European Commission, conceded that COVID-19, COVID the pandemic, is an unforeseen circumstances by the contracting authorities. And the pandemic poses extreme urgency on member states. That's the legal ground to use negotiated procedures and direct their work. Across the European Union, across the member states, they use that concept, the Commission's guidelines, and they copy and they put it into the tenders, into the award contracts to justify, to base legally their decisions. That was the impact, the power of that soft law in the member states. The Commission also creates a, another opportunity to join forces with other member states, to create, for example, uh, a joint procurement, not only for the procurement of a vaccine and the production of a, a joint pharmaceutical base for supply chain, but also for collaborative cross-border procurement for normal procedures, normal, for example, uh, uh, PPE and protective equipment or even ventilators to combat the disease or, or any strain of the disease after COVID-19 it could be COVID-20, 21, 23, or other strain and variant of that in the near future. So it creates reliance systems on member states to do joint procurement, collaborative procurement, and use the procurement directives in a way 
that they benefit the administrations rather than creating obstacles, create opportunities for the uh, joint procurement across uh, Europe and beyond. As a challenge, as unforeseen risk in supply chain, the pandemic, COVID-19, had tremendous challenges, legal challenges and practical operational challenges in the supply chain. The legal issues that we face, not only in the UK, but also in Europe, are contractual issues which are based on interruption of the business modules. Force majeure is a claim that comes quite often as a, an opportunity to break a contract because of a breach of contractual obligations. You can deliver and you claim force majeure, an act of God or something unforeseen, and you're off the hook. Nobody can sue you on the other side. Force majeure are booming across the member states as a way to decouple from contractual conditions. More sophisticated reasons are related to contractual and liability issues. Join and several liability or any other penalty clauses or any other aspects of uh, liquidated damages because of non-performance of a country. If the supply chain is not there to perform the prime contractor, immediately the contract, if it was a good contract, it will trigger penalty clauses or liquidated damages. And therefore it will bankrupt companies. It will put companies to the wall and create phenomenal pressure and stress into the member states' economies. So we trigger a lot of uh, clauses to protect, to freeze the contract, to put them in the freezer and forget for a number of years or a number of months, the contractual obligations until the supply chain picks up and continues to supply the prime contractor in order to perform the contractual obligation. The courts also are inundated with liquidated damages. In case that they cannot perform, there is no possibility of going back into square one and delivering a contract. Contracting authorities, the government, pulls the trigger and says, I want to uh, take the damages. I want to create a, a protection for me and my payers and my taxpayers. And I call the liquidated damages provision for the bond structure, if it's a performance bond or if it's a, a kind of a conditional to the work of the contract uh, in terms of uh, protection for damages. Uh, suspension of work also is another opportunity. Many contracting authorities find themselves into uh, suspending the works, completely forgetting about the delivery of a contract and put the obligations in the future, creating a kind of a uh, kicking the ball in the grass and waiting for the uh, over uh, the, the completion of the pandemic before they start again where they picked up uh, the contract. And uh, remotely, although it's possible, I've seen it many times in many jurisdictions, the contract is terminated. The contract is finished because they cannot perform. Therefore, the contracting authority decides to stop it because there's no point of waiting or putting uh, the contract into a freezer and suspending the, uh, the obligations uh, for the future. For the supply chain, the tremendous practical, realistic, and also legally related issues. The government responses to the pandemic uh, depends on what type of continent you are. Uh, Europe was uh, not fast. Uh, to respond to the pandemic. US and North America was worse than Europe. China and the, uh, the Far East were first to jump on the, uh, the, the opportunity to respond positively to the pandemic. Russia was the same also. It was far ahead in, in terms of uh, uh, controlling and uh, taking measures, uh, I think, to uh, create some cushion for the supply chain. The urgency revealed the spectrum, an opportunity of uh, uh, examining specific issues. For example, uh, the emergency revealed the, the, a distinction between sole sourcing and direct contracting. That brings together the government and specific companies or specific clusters or sectors. For example, the, uh, the PPE, remember the masks and also the, the protective equipment the, the, the masks and the, uh, the face uh, masks, and also the, uh, uh, 
vaccine, not the vaccination, the um, the washing up uh, uh, liquids and the, the sanitation uh, material for uh, the uh, the hands and uh, also uh, members of, of the public that they use that. The alcoholic uh, components of this created a, a used uh, uh, appetite, a huge appetite for direct sourcing for uh, companies that uh, didn't perform before uh, the uh, opportunity, the, the concept of uh, providing uh, sanitation equipment to the health system. <coughs> hoarding was an issue that uh, it, it's imperative for the supply chain. Hoarding is uh, warehousing, creating, for example, huge uh, uh, packaging uh, of uh, uh, material and also components and storing them for future references. But that has also problems because others need that. For example, they look at the vaccines or also other equipment that is needed in different jurisdictions. Price gouging and uh, also the spikes in prices. There's profiteering, speculation, also uh, limited resources will bring the prices to go up. Therefore, the governments are expected to pay more because the supply chain cannot perform normally uh, the, the, the normal way of supplying the components and the spare parts. There is a lot of opportunity for the, let's say, the, the bad concepts of the market for bid rigging, anti-competitive collusion, and also fraud. Fraud, it was endemic in the first uh, months of uh, combating the pandemic. Fraud was a major issue across member states of the European Union. When national administrations order uh, uh, masks for the protection of uh, health workers and people and population, and they receive uh, coffee filters, for example. Uh, I'll give you a, a, an example that will put a smile on your face. Uh, that's a fraudulent activity to, to protect, to, not to protect the, uh, people, but also to profiteer out of that sort of emergency. As a concluding remark for my uh, short and humble presentation, uh, we need to look at the opportunities, what, what uh, will come out of the, um, the, the existing crisis. Every crisis is bad. It has a lot of challenging effects, but also it creates opportunities for future. There will be other crises in the future. There will be more pandemics. There will be more uh, emergency, extreme nature situations that need to be uh, dealt collaboratively and cross-border. And that is the first opportunity to have something fresh, to see exactly how not only individual states, but also collective states, institutions as well, international institutions, can create something more than a silo effect in procurement, collaborative procurement. And procurement is central to dealing with the emergency. The government, the state itself, propel as a number one priority for dealing with a pandemic, which is the importance of our discipline, public procurement, the role of the state, and also the importance of the state in getting winning results out of this emergency. Ladies and gentlemen, with tremendous pleasure, I'd like to finish my presentation here, open the floor to any questions you have, and I look forward some time in the future to meet you personally and we shake hands. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, yeah, actually, we do. I do have a question for you. Um, you're absolutely right that uh, the pandemic has a huge impact on the economic, but especially when it comes down to small and medium-sized enterprises. And uh, what do you think are the possible legal support measures in the upcoming future of course, within the public procurement to help them uh, get better economically? Well, the pandemic is mainly not only the opportunity for the big company or the SME, but the entire market itself. The SME is imperative because the vast majority of companies are the SMEs. But you need to look at that concept of prime contractor to subcontractor. That's the issue that is imperative for the commission. Did they understand that? Not very well. The prime contractor could be a contractor of a big multinational or company that is tremendously wealthy and subcontracts everything at below level to sub SMEs or small companies. Who is more vulnerable? Who is going to be more 
in need of intervention, protection, preference, or utilizing state aid, or utilizing different approaches for contractual post-procurement issue. It's not the prime contractor, it's the SME. Correctly, you mentioned that the SME needs more assistance. Would the commission do anything? Would the member states do anything? I haven't seen anything. Stanislav, I haven't seen anything in reality other than good work and rhetoric about the need to protect SMEs. We haven't seen a specific way to look at the SME and the public procurement market. Many member states provided furlough schemes, provided a wage subsidy. They provided this sort of support and they borrow money from the markets to get into companies when they're closing and they don't allow normal operations. Many sectors, transport, aviation, any other sector re needed government intervention. That's not only for SMEs, but the, the big companies benefited out of that. The multinational benefited out of that. But for public market, the public procurement, and your question about the SME is that uh, we're still waiting for a decision. We're still waiting for some intervention by member states, not only the international community, the international institutions such as the Commission or the World Trade Organization or the GATT, but also the member states themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. It's much appreciated. Hopefully Thank you. you all see Thank you next Professor year Boris. in person. Thank you very much indeed. And you have uh, a tremendous uh, list of experts uh, in, in your masterful event. I look forward to meet them in the future, but I look forward to see what they have to say here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye. Уважаемые коллеги, мы переходим к нашему следующему докладчику. Dear colleagues, uh, we go to the next speaker, uh, Mark Steiner, the uh, judge from the Administrative Court of Switzerland. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. With my help. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm so pleased to see you, Chris, and all the other participants. Hello. So, what I have a, a special permission not to deal with law enforcement because last year we had questions about the Swiss understanding of sustainability from Russian participants. And what I told them is, hey guys, it's as simple as if you cut the tree, then you have to plant one so that the number of trees doesn't get worse but can be maintained and we will see that the russians have really lived up to that idea and i'll come to that later what i would like to do pursuing our trees uh, let's say discussion from last year is how can we use public procurement has have can serve as a model for sustainable capitalism, for a different kind of capitalism than we have now. And that's kind of a strategic view on the strategic use of public procurement. The next slide, please. So what we have, the first thing is the European approach and sustainable public procurement, then the Swiss one, and last but not least, the American one. As you know, Donald Trump has gone and Joe Biden has come. And what he does is a very European approach on sustainable public procurement. I'll come to that. And the digression is, of course, because we have discussed wood last year, wood trade policy, Russia at the crossroads. Next slide, please. Okay, the first thing is, Chris Bovis just mentioned the WTO, World Trade Organization, saying, hey, they have also a mission in policy design of public procurement. And that's what they did. They had a sustainable public procurement symposium 2017, which was very progressive. It's kind of 
inventing a new economy. So the WTO is about to do that. The next slide, please. And then especially this is true for the European directives because they explicitly say, hey guys, our public procurement policy scheme is the mean to accomplish the sustainable development goals of Europe. At that time, this was a strategy Europe 2020. Meanwhile, it's a green recovery and Europe 2050, but it's still the same. How can we use public procurement to cope with the Paris Agreement on climate change mitigation and stuff like that? So public procurement is explicitly seen as a tool to foster sustainable development goals. The next slide, please. And it goes with that, that the European Court of Justice has said, hey guys, the sustainability aim and purpose of the directive is as important as transparency, equal treatment, uh, competition, and best value for money. So the basic goals of public procurement legislation remain the same, but it's added to that as a cardinal value, as the court says, sustainability issues as aim and purpose of public procurement legislation. The next slide, please. The Germans were a little bit stressed by this because they were thinking it's all about competition, market access, money and nothing else. And then the Europeans told them, hey, guys, we have changed our attitude. Now it's about competition based on quality, sustainability and innovation and to use public procurement as a means to save the world. So it's just a little difference compared what the economists have told us about what public procurement is about 20 years ago. It's a real paradigm change. Next slide, please. And of course, Switzerland is not part of the European Union and has even some political struggles with it right now, to admit it frankly. But basically, we do the same thing as the Europeans when designing our public procurement policy. We don't admit that because back home it doesn't sell to say we copy-paste European schemes. The politicians don't aim to foster that and I can understand it somehow but de facto we are doing just the same saying hey guys sustainable behavior is aim and purpose of public procurement regulation. The next slide please. And this means also like in Europe that we foster on competition based on quality and not any more competition almost only based on price. So we have brought the paradigm change also to the weighting of award criteria. So the weighting of the price is not as high as it used to be years ago. Next slide, please. And astonishingly enough, in the USA, Joe Biden just does the same. He behaves like an European. So famous professor Stephen L. Schooner already last year told the Americans, perhaps we should copy paste the European model for our public procurement policy. And if you see now what Joe Biden is doing, it's exactly that. He takes copy paste green recovery plans and green new deal plans of the European Commission and says our infrastructure policy of the United States called Build Back Better is de facto nothing else than using public procurement as a very important mean of a green recovery strategy. So Europe on Switzerland and the USA are now de facto on the same page. I mean, this is quite a difference comparing to our conference just a year ago when Donald Trump was in power. 
isn't it? So next slide, please. And what's really interesting, so to come back to the topic of woods, which was the favorite of the uh, audience last year, that Switzerland has a special legal uh, provision saying, hey guys, on federal level, if you buy wood, it must be certified wood from sustainable sources and certainly not from illegal lodging. So this is really important. So it's the legal obligation for Swiss federal buying procuring entities that they buy certified wood and wood products. The next slide, please. And now you would say, why does this guy tell us about wood every year? Because now you will discover that this is relevant for Russia because Russia is absolutely fed up with illegal lodging in Siberia. And they threatened Europe and the US with an export ban in 2022 on wood products. And isn't that amazing? Because this transposes exactly the content of our discussion last year. So the Russians have discovered that's not in their favor to encourage, as they did in the past, illegal lodging to make as many short-term money as possible. But they take more profit if they look closer on what they export and they control better that there is no illegal lodging. And this is the policy change from outside. No one would have thought that Putin would do something like this, but it is the case. And it's important to know and discuss this because this is also a real change. Next slide, please. And now we come exactly to the same conclusion as last year. Switzerland should considering the importance of its export industry, not go for a post-COVID protectionism and close the market. This would be even stupid. Instead, what they should do and what they meanwhile also partially already do is to go for a green recovery plan. And what is even more important, if you go for green New Deal, for green recovery, for build back better, you must see public procurement as a key element of this strategy on green recovery. No Green New Deal will be cut without sustainable public procurement. After the Second World War, an important German philosopher, a lady, said, let's take the window of opportunity. Let's seize this hour zero to restart the new model. And after COVID-19, we are in exactly the same situation. Let's take the window of opportunity. Let's seize this opportunity to create a new pattern of capitalism and economy. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, dear Mark. Let's take the window of our opportunity yes. to go to Moscow next year, for example. <laughs> <laughs> With pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is a very interesting uh, presentation, as usual, and we will uh, learn it uh, with uh, our students. <laughs> I would say progress. To... But aren't you honestly surprised about Putin's last move on, on wood trade. Isn't that spectacular? It is, it is. But when it comes down to the green recovery inside of the country and, you know, uh, working on the local legislation uh, for, in, for these cases, unfortunately, we don't see anything. We just see lots of troubles with uh, expelled uh, gas and everything. So, yeah. unfortunately, there's nothing happening inside of the country. With uh, you know, I'm well aware, yeah. uh, reco recovering our forests yeah. and, and lakes and everything. So, and unfortunately, all our industry, the 
the chemical industry, unfortunately, is just creating another issue for uh, future generations. And I think that uh, uh, Switzerland and uh, European Union and also the United States are actually working on the good thing and they're progressing in this, uh, this case. And we have to catch it up. And I hope that maybe this uh, is going to be the start of the whole thing. I think on a geo, geostrategical level, it will be like a benchmarking effect. If one of the actor moves, for instance, the European Union, then people back home in the United States say, hey, guy, perhaps we should move too. And then a third actor says, hey, guy, those people are moving. Perhaps we should do something. So what I really count on is kind of a, a benchmark effect. Or am I too idealistic? Maybe we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> the future will show us everything about this. Yes. But I'm on your side for sure. For this. So thank you very much, dear Mark. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And see you. A real pleasure. Good luck to everyone, to the whole audience too. Bye. Bye. Уважаемые коллеги, мы продолжаем. Uh, Dear colleagues, we continue our presentations and our conference. Uh, now let's uh, proceed. Uh, let's go to Belgium, our new partners, um, new uh, friends. Uh, uh, these are representatives uh, of uh, the um, legal uh, company uh, with size. Um, this is. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Leader Kirke, uh, this is Frank Jude and Rubin uh, De Wolf, associate of business law firm and partner of business law at the firm Leader Kirke. Please, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Cosma. Indeed, it's for us the first time we have uh, the opportunity and we are happy to participate. I uh, very much appreciate that we are prepared slowly towards a full-fledged participation next year. So that's, that's very good for us. I think it's also the opportunity to present some peculiarities of the Belgian per procurement culture. I very much appreciated Professor Bovis' uh, talk about different cultures implementing the uh, European directives. And the Belgian culture is in that perspective somewhere halfway the Dutch and the French culture as it used to be in Belgium for purely geographical reasons. Um, we have a culture where in general the authorities adore to have negotiated procedures with only the price as a criterion and Ruben will develop more on that. Um, are there specific reasons for that? Is that maybe because we are very next to the European institutions, the inter European institutions in Brussels are in the same city as our national and regional institutions. So that might bring Belgium to a culture of limiting the amendments to the European texts, and that will be also be part of our presentation. What we try to do is to give you a general approach of what public procurement law in Belgium might look like, and that from a perspective of law enforcement. Maybe one last remark, Belgium is as Austria, as Germany, and as many other states in the European Union, a federal state, but contrary to the situation in Austria, we only have one federal legislation on public procurement. There are, unless some regulations concerning points of detail, no regional legislations on public procurement. The reason why is not very clear to me. It might be that we have found other reasons to introduce complexity in the Belgian situation, but it is slightly odd that the level that is competent for economic legislation, being the regional authorities, is not competent for public procurement. That might be a topic to develop later on. But I leave now the floor to Ruben to uh, explain some first points on the specificities on the legal regulation on public procurement seen from a perspective of law enforcement. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, a very good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to present. Uh, some of us uh, will not meet in, in person, but perhaps we will meet 
to our national teams in the Euro uh, Cup 2020. Uh, and for now, uh, we will meet uh, in on this interesting topic, which is the legal regulation of public procurement in Belgium. But we will start um, with the following. The Federal Kingdom of Belgium is, uh, as Frank said, founding member state of the European Union. In that regard, the public procurement legislation is an implementation of the European Union directives regarding public procurement. So there we see the tendency to literal implementations of the uh, European directives regarding public procurement. The Belgian federal government, rather than the regional governments, is competent to regulate the policy area of public procurement. The Belgian legislator transposed these two directives into the Public Procurement Act of 17 June 2016. This act also covers contracts below the European threshold. A very important principle of this act, Public Procurement Act of 17 June 2016 is the following. Public procurement contracts can only be awarded to the candidate contractor with the economically most advantageous regular offer. This is in accordance with the European Directive, uh, which stipulates that the award criteria shall be determined on the basis of the price or cost, in the latter case, using a cost effectiveness approach, such as life cycle costing. This may also include the best price quality ratio, which shall be assessed based on award criteria relating to what is offered. For instance, quality, back office support, line of approach. In practice, what we see is that the price criterion is dominant. We see this in two specific elements. On the one hand, we see that the price will be the sole award criterion, or if it's not, on the other hand, if it's not the sole award criterion, we see that it's in a total score, it shall, it, it shall exceed 50% on the points to be gained on the price criteria. To summarize, the award of a public tender in Belgium is only possible on the basis of the economically most advantageous offer, whereas in previous legislation, it was the lowest bidder. Whereas now we see that it's the, the economically most advantageous offer and in practice, price criterion is dominant. Second slide, the legal protection in Belgium. In summary, the concerned person may start proceedings to suspend and an an annulment procedure uh, of any decision taken by the contracting authority. If the tendering authority is an administrative authority, these proceedings have to be brought before the Council of State in a procedure in extreme urgency. In other ca cases, for instance, if the tendering authority is a private hospital or a private university, the suspending proceedings proceeding has to be started before the civil courts and takes the form of a summary procedure. For contracts meeting the European thresholds and for works contracts of house estimated value, Belgian legislation imposes a standstill period of 15 calendar days. For other contracts, for instance, those who, which do not meet the above mentioned thresholds, the tendering authority may voluntarily apply this standstill period. If a suspension request has been started within the standstill period of 15 days, the, contracting, the contract can only be concluded after the rejection of such request by the competent judge or in any case after the expiry of a period of 15 days following the notification of the decision. A judiciary decision suspending the effects of a decision can only be temporary. It will only be applicable until the competent judge renders its decision on the annulment request. Such annulment procedure has to be introduced within a period of 60 days following the date of the notification of the decision. In practice, we see that the contracting authorities will often withdraw the tender decision after it has been suspended, which makes the annulment procedure to lose its purpose. In practice, we see that the Council uh, of State, when it's the competent court, when a summary pr procedure will take between three and nine weeks, an annulment procedure between 18 and 36 months before the civil courts the duration of procedures is harder to forecast. We also see that the Council of State is to be seen as uh, developing the leading jurisprudence in Belgian public procurement law. The third slide, e-tendering. 
Electronic tendering has become mandatory for European tender procedures since 18 October 2018 and since the 1st of January 2020 for non-European tender procedures. As a consequence, all the submissions of tenders will have to be filed on the e-tendering, the so-called e-tendering is a uh, official Belgian public procurement portal where uh, a con candidate contractor has to submit its uh, offer. He has to electronically sign and can only do that with a qualified electronic signature. In practice, he will use his Belgian identity card. If he does not have this, he will need to download individually the submission report and through his own software or add a qualified electronic signature. To emphasize, a scan of a signature is not valid. Secondly, the competence of the executive uh, committee. When signing an offer, uh, the risk can be that your offer will be irregular if it's not signed by the regular uh, person representing the bidder. We saw that in long-standing jurisprudence of the uh, Council of State that the they, that signing an offer did not fall under the daily management. So therefore, it was not the competence of the co executive committee. However, Due to recent entry into force of a new company code, we see that due to the new definition of what falls under daily management, some, in some cases, uh, indeed, the executive committee shall be um, the competent body to sign the offer. However, here, uh, the tender specifications will set out where to sign and which mandates need to be added. Lastly, the specific positions of joint ventures in Belgium. When a joint venture in Belgium submits an offer, every uh, member of the joint venture has to sign through an individual that they uh, mandated. That they mandated. So, in um, what I spoke about was the award uh, criterion that price is determinant. I spoke about. Uh, the Council of State or the General Court, so the uh, jurisdictional dualism, uh, uh, as it's called. And um, I will now pass the word to my colleague Frank, uh, who shall further elaborate on the legal elements in tender documents. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Ruben. Um, one of the more delicate points in the evolution of law enforcement in Belgium is the evolution of especially the Council of State in its case law regarding illegal elements in the tender documents. The question is, in fact, how has a bidder has to act when he sees that there are problems regarding the legality of the tender specification or the tender documents in general? Does he has to contact the tendering authority in order to avoid problems? Does he has to participate without remarks or something in between, putting him at risk its own participation and its own success in the procedure? Historically, the Council of State had a rather legalistic approach telling that lots of the, a great part of the procurement legislation was legislation of public order, and that at least those parts could be raised in the first place after a decision on the tender as such. Then there was an evolution towards more pragmatism and maybe in a more authority friendly approach where the Council of State stated that if a tenderer had seen a legality problem in the tender documents, in the party had seen a problem of illegality in the tender documents and not raised it, but waited till the end of the procedure in order to see if he would yes or no obtain uh, the procedure. He lost his right to discuss this point of legality. And now we see a return to the first position, the more legalistic position, that in my view might be also more in um, 
uh, more com in conformity with the logic of the directives. But this is one of the most striking examples of an evolution forward and backwards of the um, case law of the Council of State and illustrates the, important, the importance of the law enforcement, especially in a regime where you have a dualistic approach, where the case law of the Council of State has to develop and is then taken over by the courts, by the normal courts, the civil courts. You always see some difference in, in the time slots. So now the Council of State has developed a new, an old new uh, case law. It will take some months till the courts have understood that there is a new approach from the Council of State, and then they will adopt the same stand. That is, of course, not very interesting for the equality between bidders uh, if they have to defend the position before the Council of State or before the, count, the courts. Uh, next slide, please. Something very specific for Belgium is the whole situation of the hospital sector as an important player in the health sector. We discussed uh, at length some specific problems of COVID and public procurement. There was a tradition in Belgium to avoid the application of procurement rules on public hospitals. Uh, for works, the procurement rules were completely applied, but not for the other parts of the public procurement legislation, at least for those hospitals that are were not 100% public hospitals. But as you know, as you might know, an immense majority of the hospitals in Belgium is mixed private public. So this meant that in the hospitals in Belgium, a culture has taken a place that in fact, has avoided the application of public procurement legislation during some 20 years. Now the Council of State and the courts try to find an, a proportionality, a proportional approach, respecting on the one hand the specificity of these standards, and on the other hand, the obligation to have the procurement rules applied also on the situation in the hospitals. You can imagine that during the COVID crisis, this was even harder for the courts to find that equilibrium between legality and the importance of public health. And it might be a very interesting study uh, to see how case law has dealt in the different European and non-European countries uh, this very specific situation and also to see the differences between national ways to comply with the European directives. Uh, the um, rather successful try of the Belgian legislator to avoid for an important sector the application of uh, public procurement legislation shows that this could work and this could have a long-standing influence on a public procurement culture in one of the member states. Uh, next slide, please. Some ideas for the future. Uh, we have more and more situations that are not procurement as such, but that are very influenced by the general principles of public procurements. Of course, real estate contracts do as such not uh, are as such not a part of the scope of the public procurement directives, but it is clear that the application of the principles of equal treatment and transparency makes the way those contracts are treated very similar to the situation of public procurement. We see in case law um, a tendency towards a more or less one-to-one -one application of the public procurement directives and public procurement legislation on those contracts that are clearly not in the scope of the legislation, but from an approach of guaranteeing an equal treatment to those uh, players that are active in those sectors towards other sectors, uh, brings judges and especially civil judges, not the Council of State, to go further and further in amalgamating those contracts with public procurement as such. Uh, 
And then the question raises how those general principles can implement it, especially from a perspective of legal certainty. How to give the different parties at least a beginning of, the, uh, of legal certainty when in fact very general principles are brought to the authorities and that principle should be applied in concreto on the situation that it lies before the authorities. We see that judges are very much stressing the principle of equal treatment and so bringing those non-procurement issues more and more in the flow of procurement legislation. Uh, I wonder where that will lead us and that might also be a topic to discuss especially from a procedure, uh, from a perspective of law enforcement. I wonder if you can qualify law and uh, a, law, uh, a situation of law enforcement when it is in fact imposing the application of legislation that is clearly not applicable to a situation. That is, is maybe law enforcement in a second degree. Next and last slide, please. Uh, so, if there are further questions, you are most welcome. Uh, we also mention our presence in Africa, in DRC and in Rwanda, and maybe it might be an idea to uh, have a discussion on the implication of public procurement principles in those countries also, where European principles are seen as a kind of model, but are put in a different context and lead to different application once again. Thanks a lot and open for questions. Thank you very much, dear partners, <laughs> dear friends, dear Frank and uh, Ruben. It was very interesting. Uh, it is our first uh, uh, representatives from Belgium in our procurement law conferences. That's why I think uh, today is historical uh, event, and <laughs> uh, uh, I'm sure that we have a uh, good uh, cooperation in future. And I hope that we will, that we will improve it. Thank we you very forward. much for the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, just a uh, just few more things. And first of all, I think it's uh, illegal to have uh, such good players on your football team. That's the first thing to say. <laughs> and the second is, uh, I actually have a question for you. Um, like, well, who, can, um, who can apply and complain about uh, public tender uh, illegalities? Is it any legal entity or any person or... Uh, absolutely anybody or it, it has some procedure and, and should be made by the rules? That's an excellent question, uh, especially because it is not extremely clear in the legislation. The legislation states that anybody who has an interest by the procedure of public procurement can uh, attack the decision. And in all the case law, this was always explained as having an interest being uh, synonymous to having the possibility to obtain the same markets. So in fact, you did have to be active in the same sector. And in fact, having done what is necessary to obtain the market. So not participating in the tender procedure barred you from attacking the decision unless you could explain why it was completely impossible and completely useless to participate in the tender. So you can imagine that this was a burden for lots of potential uh, parties in a procedure against a tender decision. If they had to participate in a long proce administrative procedure, just in order to afterwards tackle a decision, which uh, the context of the, the contents of which they know they knew from the beginning. Now there is uh, remarkably, especially from, especially from the perspective of the courts, the civil courts, an approach that is broadening the concept of interest and, in fact, not seeing a specificity from the more administrative context of, uh, concept of interest by procedure uh, and going to the more common approach that is in the general legislation on civil procedure. But 
that's work in progress. I must say that it is a theme that is not tackled in lots of procedures. As the Council of State, which handles 90% of public procurement um, cases, stand, uh, sticks to its traditional approach. It's only the courts that might broaden the discussion. And in, in the end, it might be the legislator that will have to guarantee um, a broadening of the possibility to tackle public procurement decisions. Thank you very much. Because it's a very common uh, problem here in Russia because we have uh, professional complainers on the public procurement tenders and uh, they get paid for this to just interrupt the procedure, you know, to tackle the decision, just um, to hold it for some time, just to, to interrupt it for no reason, basically for some some people getting involved. So thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Ruben, Frank, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Dear colleagues, we move forward to the next country, next speaker. It's a high time for Norway. We have two representatives of Kluge, law firm Kluge, we have been cooperating from 2016 with this company. We had uh, different co-authors in our monography of 2017, that was. Sorry, uh, maybe I will not mention the last names. I can't remember for sure. If I have one time, one minute. So Ronnie was the one, associate partner of law firm Kluge, and Tony Plato, associate of law firm Kluge, Norway. Please, dear guests, dear colleagues, it's your turn. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us. Um, you have already presented us both. It's going to be me and my, my colleague, Tony, uh, who are going to have this presentation today. Um, we both work with primarily public procurements in Norway and, um, and we work here at Kluge, as mentioned. One of the, law, the law, law firms with the larger practitioners groups of public procurements, so that we're kind of proud of to be. And this is our first year um, um, attending this uh, conference, so we're very uh, glad that we were invited. Thank you so much. Um, if Tonya is going to share the presentation for us. Due to COVID-19, we are uh, on different locations today. So you can just give me the second slide, please, Tonya, at the start. There we go. Um, oh, can, can you please zoom it a little bit? Yeah. A can... little bit closer, because there's a presentation mode. Nothing. Thanks. There we go. Yeah, I thought I'm going to start with a short history lesson before Tonya gets um, to speak. Um, because um, in Norway, we have a public human regulation that is more or less uh, identically to the directives that you find in the EU. And one may ask why Norway has um, regulations that are compared to the EU when we're not really an EU member. And Norway signed the so-called EEA agreement in 1992. Um, originally, the EEA agreement between Norway and the EU member states was never thought to be a permanent alternative, uh, but only to become an opening for Norway entering into a full membership of the European Union. So you may say that the EEA agreement from a polit political standpoint was thought to be a waiting room for a full membership. Uh, however, Norway uh, had its referendum in 1994, where the majority of Norwegian people voted against uh, a full membership of the European Union, and the EEA agreement did therefore enter into force and is uh, still today a permanent solution for Norway, and it's how we interact with the European Union. And uh, as a member of the EEA agreement or the, the relationship with the European Union, Norway has an obligation to implement EU law uh, on public procurement and other legislations that 
uh, is implemented by the EU. Uh, and to ensure a uniform interpretation, Norway has therefore uh, implemented the directives that EU has um, voted on on public procurement. Consequently, Norway has a leg legislation that is according to EU in that regard. Um, this also means that we um, take part of the, the case law that you find both in the European Court of Justice, but also by the EFTA court, which is the EFTA state's own court. They are both um, in, in uh, Luxembourg, uh, but it's not, not uh, wrong to say that the EU Court of Justice has a higher standing in Norway than the EFTA court itself. It, that's a big discussion in itself, I won't go into that. Um, but as a result, uh, we have the EU directives on public procurement has been implemented into Norway uh, by both uh, on an act on public procurement, and that's accompanied by regulations, the public procurement regulation, the utility regulation, the defense and security regulation, uh, where the act sets out the general principles and the regulation sets out the more details rules on each sector. Um, we do also differ between above and below the EU thresholds. That means uh, the EU regulations does also only, uh, is only applicable if the procurement is above certain threshold. And if it's uh, below that certain threshold, we have uh, our own national regulations that substantially deviates from what you find in the directives. Uh, but also about the, uh, about the EU thresholds, also there where we else therefore fo um, follows the EU directive, we have our own rules to, to some regard. So there are not a blueprint of the directives. Um, but by that, I will pass on the word to, to Tonya, we will take this a bit further. Um, Tonya, we can't hear you. That's too bad. <laughs> uh, no, you, you are on mute, actually. I see that he's uh, he's online and he's, uh, he's just uh, not having uh, geez, the you microphone. To, uh, are you connected to a headset or something? Might be, might be. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Tonya. Yeah, good. I'm very glad because I hadn't prepared to take your slides, so <laughs> good you are here with us. This was this was just a test, Ronnie. <laughs> good. <laughs> but can you can you see? Uh, do I share screens now as well? Uh, not in the, uh, not at the moment. We can see you okay. on the video, but we don't see the presentation. Okay, just give me one minute here. Yes. Yes. No, we can see that. Yeah. Okay. And you hear me now as well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And sorry for that. Um, to continue a little bit in the same direction as our uh, colleague from Switzerland. Uh, we are also uh, talking now about uh, what has become one of the new buzzwords in Norway after implementing the new EU directives uh, from 2014 uh, on public procurement. Um, as mentioned, one of the main objectives behind the adoption of the new um, directives was to strengthen the use of public procurement as a strategic tool to promote sustainability. And um, the, 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 it was also one of the main obje objectives uh, to use public 
public procurement as a tool to ensure the uh, at the time Europe 10 year strategy, the Europe 2020, a strategy for smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. So when implementing the, the, the new EU directives, uh, the Norwegian law also um, had some changes regarding uh, how we can use public procurement as a strategic tool. And we will uh, especially talk about uh, how we in Norway, after the implementing of the new directives, use public procurement as a tool for uh, environmental requirements. Uh, the previous directive in the EU uh, provided an opportunity to use public procurement as a strategic tool to promote sustainability considerations. Uh, but the new directive is therefore more binding with the change of the words in the, um, in the, direct, in the directives from that uh, the member states and the contracting authorities may use this to the now formulation that the member states shall take appropriate measures to ensure compliance with selected sustainability considerations as the environmental considerations in the performance of public procurement. So today there is no longer a discussion whether the, um, the um, procurement regulation uh, is that, that, that member states is allowed to use the um, pu pu public procurement regulations to promote these uh, considerations. Today, it's more a discussion how far the obligation goes to actually use the public procurement regulations to ensure sustainability. However, it's a, it's a great deal of discretion, discretion in the Article 18.2 in the, um, for the classic sector of the directives. The wording is up that the member states should take appropriate measures. And of course, um, that, is, uh, that is widely um, uh, formulated. And the, the directive has gotten some uh, criticism uh, regards to um, that the member states and the contracting authorities uh, is not getting any uh, guidance in whether how far the obligation goes and also um, any uh, specific uh, requirements that is um, that the, that the directives now demand of the membership states. Um, and that has the uh, practical and um, that has the practical um, uh, difficulties that maybe uh, because of the interpretation of the wide formulated words in the directives, member states and uh, contracting authorities and economic operators around the EU and EEA uh, area has to, of course, um, 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 has to um, work with a lot of different uh, law, law uh, regulation regarding um, how to use the public procurement as, a, as to promote sustainability. Because there is so widely formulated, uh, many states don't have uh, this ASA obligated mandatory requirements in their law. Uh, and that was also a um, discussion in Norway when it, comes, it came to implementing the, the directives. Uh, it was a, it was debated uh, what was the actually appropriate measures. Um, was it to to um, regulate this in the law, or was maybe uh, uh, appropriate measures to have focus on good information to the contracting authorities to ensure that they will that they would use public procurement as a strategic tool. Um, in the implementation, uh, the Norwegian authorities decided that some, uh, some challenges that the world is facing is so serious that also the 
public procurement regulation should uh, take responsible to ensure compliance. So in the Norwegian law now in Article 5, we have a new regulation that is stricter than, than we had before, uh, that, that uh, now demands that contracting authorities shall take responsible uh, for such as environmental and climate through their public procurements. Um, before we also had a May rule and that was formulated more like a general principle and that uh, rule that we had before, uh, economic operators could not use that rule to go to the Norwegian courts and, um, and uh, say that uh, the law was, um, uh, that the law was violated. But now, after the new rule in Article 5, that is meant to be uh, the meaning um, behind the rule, that it will be more obligated for contracting authorities to actually put the environmental requirements in the public procurement. And if you have, um, and if it's relevant in that specific public procurement, and contracting or an, an economic operator can now go to the to the um, uh, Norwegian courts and say that the rule is violated. It's also a discussion if uh, um, contracting authorities do not set up uh, environmental requirements in the um, public procurement when they are obligated to do that. It's maybe um, to do that change in the process uh, can also lead to um, a such, um, such big change that you cannot do uh, uh, on the basis of the um, um, procure public procurement regulation that the um, contracting authorities may have a duty to cancel the competition. Um, in Europe, Norway is, as far as we know, one of the countries that has gone far towards implementing mandatory environmental requirements in public procurements. Um, now, in the, in the, um, for the general classic sector, it is a shell rule, but you also have, um, you also have a relevant um, uh, you also have to um, think if, if it will be relevant in that specific uh, competition. And also, of course, you have to be in, the, um, in, um, in, a, in, in accordance to the general principles of uh, public procurement. Um, but in some, uh, some specific parts, for example, uh, in transport, uh, the, the Norwegian authorities has already uh, set up mandatory obligated um, mandatory requirements, uh, regardless of the um, of its of, of its relevant or not, because they have decided that that will always be relevant uh, for those kind of public procurements. Um, this question has this is this is a new law, and it's a uh, it's very very alive uh, and it will be exciting to see uh, in the future how far the obligation goes and there has not been challenged yet in the Norwegian courts we think uh, it will only be uh, a matter of time uh, that was our presentation uh, thank you so much and of course feel free to contact us if you have any questions regarding the Norwegian procurement law or um, other questions. We are happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear partners, dear Tony and uh, Roni. Uh, uh, please send uh, um, our regards to Frederick Nordby and Torsten Arendt. Arendt. 
Uh, I, I don't understand how it is necessary to pronounce this difficult word, Aryan. <laughs> uh, as, as you know, maybe you know that uh, they were co-authors of our previous uh, collective monograph, uh, uh, which uh, was published uh, four years ago. And now, as uh, I understand, uh, you will be other co-authors uh, in this year. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have no time more for questions <laughs> because uh, we have a uh, time limit. Thank you and see you in our future events. And I hope thank you as well. Keep safe. We'll you. see you at uh, our Moscow local conference in next year. We hope to, we hope to join you, yeah, we do. Mm. Thanks a lot. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. We're proceeding with our deliberations and allow me to give the floor to another speaker from the Netherlands. And we have uh, two uh, speakers uh, to our good friends. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this is the Associate Professor of Law of University of Leiden, lawyer, uh, and uh, he is a PINAR also. And it was a request of our speaker to hold uh, the record of our conference. Dr. Tirmemans говорит по-русски, и, правда, презентация будет на английском языке. He speaks English. Uh, um, so, I would like uh, to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, this is um, Dr. William R. Timmermans, uh, legal counsel, lecturer, Leiden University Chair, Dutch Russian Law Association, the Netherlands. Good afternoon. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Well, I'm glad to see you all. I think uh, uh, that it's important to meet with you at least uh, online. Unfortunately, uh, not physically, but uh, still uh, maybe it's uh, much better uh, to see you all here at least. First try to share my uh, screen and my presentation. Let me see if I PowerPoint open. Um, well, I'm, I'm afraid it won't work, but I, I sent you my, my per, uh, per, per presentation. Yes, I was Yes, maybe. Do have a possibility to open this presentation. Uh, let's do this. Well, uh, uh, but, uh, I have no I've never shared my slides uh, with the public okay, yeah. um, so far. Okay, so uh, yes, I'm going going to uh, to to briefly flip the conference. Okay, so so I'm going going to briefly uh, discuss uh, two uh, new uh, uh, legislative documents, and they're both both dealing dealing with uh, with, uh, with well, in fact, with a level uh, level playing field, and that 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 is in the field field of public. Uh, Public uh, pu public procurement, but also so uh, well in the supply chain. So, but well, there's still still one thing I I want to draw your attention to, and that is that that I've got a new new function. I'm 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 well since one year year a chair of the Dutch Russian 
law association. So uh, if there uh, are any Dutch or Russian, Russian lawyers who want to become a member, member of our Dutch Russian law association, please be welcome and send, uh, send me a mail, mail and we can, can, uh, can make you a member. So uh, the next slide, please. Yes, uh, next slide. Okay, I, I, I can do it. Too. Well, I will in particular discuss two uh, draft uh, uh, legislative uh, documents, drafts, uh, and they they will have uh, have at least that's what I I think a a major 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 impact on public procurement. Uh, well, in the first place, uh, there's the draft regulation on for, foreign subsidies distorting the, the internal market. It was published last month and it is now, now go, going to a two month uh, well, screen, screening process and consultation pro, process and, and well, uh, market par parties can, can, uh, can submit their 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 commands and well it's the uh, the purpose purpose of the commission that it will will uh, will become a a law a regulation uh, as from from january of next year uh, the second uh, second legislation is a proposal for a directive on sustainable corporate governance and that that will will have a major impact impact on uh, on procurement and as as well that may have a uh, so uh, well uh, the main reason the main ground for uh, the draft regulation is to counter uh, potential distortive uh, effect of a subsidy is given by by the state to uh, to uh, to potential bidders, There's, so so it's it's it specifically deals with uh, com uh, with companies, legal entities from uh, countries which are no member member states and are not members of the G GPA. That is the World World Trade uh, General uh, Procurement. With the agreement, and uh, well, the ground for uh, the draft directive that's the second legislative uh, document is to uh, ban distortive distortive effects by companies which allow their supply chain violation of human rights and damage to the. the the environment as well, and several uh, speaker speakers have already uh, uh, dwelt, dwelt upon this top topic as well. So, so I can tell them now now that that uh, that European U Union is uh, dra drafting a new new direct directive where they, this specific uh, this uh, this matter has specifically been uh, been taken care of. Um, to well, um, uh, well. In fact, uh, um, there are uh, are company, companies, uh, market uh, parties from countries which are basically uh, state uh, subsidized. So, so those uh, those com companies are uh, relying on a uh, major state subsidy these and of course of course if you're uh if you're on that kind kind of in that that kind kind of, kind of position it is really a very uh very uh easy of course of course to win a project to win a tender so uh well uh, the the propo therefore the proposed regulation uh, deals with such distortion of market of a the level playing field field and is going going to uh, specifically deal with that. Um, 
the well the main uh, main field, fields of law um, which is the the new regulate the draft regulation is focusing on is a competition public procurement and trade defense um, so it is in particular uh, dealing with uh, with com market parties who are participating in uh, public procurements in the European Union. The next uh, slide, well, we can go on and skip this one. Uh, so the the scope of the uh, the proposal is uh, is is basically to uh, secure a level playing field. And there, therefore, it it uh, it deals it fo focuses is not not only on the uh, the uh, the, uh, the procurement of uh, goods, but also the procurement of works and services. We will go on this. Okay. Well, uh, the uh, the. The system which they uh, they 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 uh, they they, uh, they propose in this regulation is uh, um, artifact three tools, two uh, two are notification procedures, and the and the the commission has also been granted will be granted a general mar market investigation power. Um, well, it um, as the regulation not only de deals specifically with procurement, but also with uh, mergers and takeovers. Uh, well, it uh, well it has a separate mechanism for that. But uh, well, in the within the framework work of this presentation, we we will do deal only with the. It's the procurement uh, side of the of the regulation, and it will deal deal only with uh, when when the the uh, deal of the procurement is more than two hundred fifty million euros. So that is the um, that is the border of that. Um, uh, well, the uh, the notification procedure is that the bidder there, there itself have has to notify the uh, the commission beforehand before well when when it when it will uh, will start start participating in the bid, bidding procedure it will have to to notify uh, the the commission of the fact that it has received state subsidies so that is a major uh, that is of major importance we will go to the uh, next slide uh, the well if if uh, if the commission should uh, the european Commission has been notified of that. It, it can start a, a, a special special procedure of investigation. It can um, um, and that, well, there are two types, two types of uh, in, investigate investigation. And during that time of the invest investigation, there is a so-called standstill. So the tender will uh, will be um, held will be will be uh, suspended on a temporary basis um, now we come uh, to uh, the definition of what exactly is a for for a sub subsidy and that apply applies well it's it's the same same definition which is also you use in the regulation on state aid so um, a for a foreign sub subsidy is uh, well you can see see all the criteria of financial co contribution or originating directly 
from a government of a non-EU country. And that benefits the company, it's selective, it, which means it's, it's limited to an individual company or, or a, 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 a industry or to, to a type of several com companies. Um, examples of uh, such foreign subsidy, these are so-called uh, zero, uh, zero interest loans, unlimited guarantees, compensation, export financing, not in line with the, with the OECD arrangement, preferential tax treatment, tax cred credit or other grants. So uh, the uh, procedure for the, the uh, investigation has two, two stages, a preliminary review and, and well, if during that, that, that preliminary review, it turns out that, uh, that a more in-depth investigation is required, required uh, well, then the second, second stage will, uh, will, will, will follow. Um, for regulation, for concentration, so, so mergers and takeovers, there's a special procedure, but for public procurement, uh, the time, time limit, so for the, for the preliminary review, view for 60 days, two months, and 200 days for uh, the more in-depth uh, investigation. Um, well, the... The, the commission uh, will, will uh, conduct its investigation and will, will determine whether a financial cont contribution constitutes a foreign subsidy. And well, that's, that's the first stage and the second sta stage, if that's the case, there is a foreign, foreign subsidy, whether it has the, the effect, a distortive effect effect on the single market. Um, subsidies, uh, well, um, examples there of unlimited guarantee, these uh, subsidies to, to a, a company in di distress stress without a restructuring plan, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, well, once the uh, commission has established that there is a for, for foreign subsidy and that it is deserved, well, it can take a decision on, on what to do uh, with, with that. Yeah. Um, well, it can, in that case, case in, impose a redressive measures or it can accept commitments from the com company that they will deal with the uh, distal distortion, they will cure the, uh, the distortion. Okay, and that can, uh, can, Im um, can imply repayment uh, by the foreign company of the foreign subsidy, uh, divestment, reduction of the, of the capacity or the market presence, or prohibition of certain market uh, behavior. Um, yeah, it will will have also uh, the, uh, the commission will have the power also to to uh, to forbid the award of the public procurement contract to the subsidized bidder. Uh, well, the main uh, main uh, uh, effect uh, of the proposed regulation will will be to to uh, to limit also the the administrative burden on companies because well you don't want to impose extra burdens on company these they they are also uh, well responsible for the enforcement of the draft regulation will be the European Commission and uh, well, this is a list of all the the uh, the instruments which are available. We will skip that. And well, um, 
a further point point is that the uh, that the European U Union more or less seeks to uh, make its standards, uh, its legal standards, uh, global to turn uh, turn the uh, the European standards into global standards, and this this is a way to to do that to uh, to tackle a new field of law and to try to set uh, standards which which in in the longer run will be taken will be be adopted by other com countries uh, countries as well in in that respect the uh, the commission is already working together with the united states and with japan uh, with a few to uh, make these standards uh, uh, global. Well, this is uh, what I already told you about. The, the uh, proposal uh, is cur currently, currently open for feedback. And well, it's the pur purpose that they will be, uh, that, that it will become a law um, in the near fu future. Uh, the, Okay, then we we uh, go to a directive, a draft a directive, which is more more or less in line line with uh, what with the with the regulation, the draft uh, draft regulation. Uh, the, well, for those those who, who are not familiar with uh, with Euro European law law EU law uh, the. The main difference between a directive and a regulation is that a regulation has direct uh, force throughout the European U Union, whereas a directive, well, it's it's already in the name. The directive has to be transposed into an into national national law. So that that is the main uh, main uh, main difference between the two. Um, well, there there um, there is a new uh, draft uh, directive, which would be uh, would be published. Uh, well, it should have been published in the uh, in the second quarter of the, this year, but well, it's it's still the second qu quarter, of course. But um, well, um, uh, the main uh, point will be to make companies uh, responsible for the entire uh, supply chain. So if if companies are buying uh, stuff or goods or services. Uh, would, for instance, the, the example raised by our our, uh, our Swiss, uh, Swiss colleague, those companies have to uh, scrutinize uh, that the these these goods and these products are in line with a standard that's applicable in the European Union. So, um, so in that that uh, that respect, they have to take care that uh, human rights are are observed are observed in that respect. So, uh, no uh, no child uh, child labor, no forced labor, etc. etc. And um, uh, environmental uh, protection rules have have to be complied with too and that is uh, well of course that will uh, will take effect effect on the uh, procurement meant as well because this provides a mechanism which can be be applied applied in public uh, procurement as well so that is basically uh, what I uh, wanted to uh, wanted to uh, discuss with you, share 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 with you um, in a uh, well very um, brief uh, 
brief period of time. Uh, so the uh, draft regulation and the uh, draft uh, directive uh, make it clear that foreign foreign company companies uh, which which are intent tending to enter the European market observe a fair competition print principle so the level playing field and closely monitor their supply chain and uh, sure. well both both leg legislative dra drafts are what I already told you about soft law law I I I instruments so well they they are seeking to set global stand standards that will 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 in the long long run run apply on a worldwide basis well thank you so much that concludes спасибо thank you very much спасибо большое доктор тимерманс мы мы обязательно подробнее изучим вашу презентацию потому что там thank you very much we will cover your presentation in details uh, we just covered uh, five slides out of 25. Uh, we will study your presentation uh, thoroughly. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. We hope to see you um, in Moscow personally. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. We move forward. Uh, to the next country and the next speaker. Uh, next uh, speaker will be specialists from Italy. They are representatives of the law firms, Palis and Partners. Uh, Aristide Palis, full professor of administrative law, Louis University of Rome, lawyer at Palis Partners, and Filippa Diagni, attorney at the law of firm Palis and Partners Italy. Uh, please, dear colleagues, take the floor. Please uh, join. Join us. So we need to let the, our colleagues enter the conference. To enter the room. Hello, Arisi is speaking. I, uh, the video is not working. You should habilitate it. You should just let moment. the video just work. Moment. Yes, just a moment. We're just about to do this. Yeah, yep. we can see Hello. you. Hello. And Filippo Deni should be online as well. Um, well, thank you very much for this invitation. It was very kind of you, and we are very, very happy to be with you uh, in the in this. Uh, it is our first time in uh, in your conference. Um, uh, uh, the, the time was running uh, running very late, uh, so uh, I, I'm now out of, of the office. But uh, I wanted to uh, um, share with you uh, the main and basic points of our Italian legislation, uh, with the assure, ensure assurance that uh, our legislation is very much similar to the one of many other European countries. Uh, and we heard about uh, uh, Norway. We had about uh, heard about. Belgium and uh, Austria and uh, in a way also Switzerland is very similar to our legislation as well as English uh, or UK legislation even though they are outside uh, European Union now uh, their legislation is very very similar to ours our uh, legislation so we, we will not uh, repeat and uh, uh, say again things that we, you already heard from them uh, taking into account that Italian legislation is mainly based on a, a code, uh, a kind of uh, uh, a code made up of uh, 20 and something articles, a very huge piece of legislation that was uh, published in, uh, uh, well, uh, um, almost three years ago. Uh, but uh, this legislation is very much uh, a kind of translation of the European directives, uh, directive uh, legislation vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the adjudication and uh, procedure uh, rules that uh, uh, are um, regarding contracts and the award of contracts above the financial threshold 
of the European directives. Uh, the uh, financial value of the contract that is above the European threshold is mainly governed by European regulations. Um, uh, I have to, to say something that I heard before uh, by um, uh, some, uh, some friend of us, uh, I think it was the, our Swiss friend uh, that was saying that in a way the European Court of Justice was very strict vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Italian legislation, uh, even stricter vis-a-vis uh, -vis the negotiation uh, uh, and uh, procedures uh, and towards a more flexible approach towards negotiation for all the contracts that are, uh, whose values is uh, uh, below the European uh, uh, thresholds of value. And this is very true, but it has to be said that the reason why the European court is very strict and legalistic, I would say, uh, uh, towards the, European, the Italian legislation is because our judges uh, the Supreme Court, Administrative Supreme Court judge, that is the Consiglio di Stato, is uh, like uh, the French Conseil d'État or the other uh, Council of States, like in Belgium, uh, uh, we have been told uh, is, uh, is working for these matters. Uh, well, our uh, Supreme Administrative Judge uh, has, uh, or better, had in the past years, a very legalistic approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis these procedures, uh, trying to restrict or abolish every kind of discretionary powers in negotiating and in finding out the best option and the best solution for the contract, uh, rather than uh, opting for the best price uh, or the, the better price uh, without any kind of attention to the quality of the works, of the services uh, uh, that are provided. And this is a, a very um, problematic point. Um, and uh, we have um, a very interesting piece of new legislation. It was uh, issued on the 31st of May this year. So, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this legislation uh, is uh, applying uh, for two years for the uh, giving uh, given for the pandemic uh, uh, crisis. And so the, the, the reason of this piece of legislation is very exceptional. But this kind of legislation is trying to do the things more flexible, uh, especially for the contracts whose value is underneath the European community threshold. Uh, so the, uh, this is very important, uh, but I leave to Filippo Degni to continue on this uh, uh, very point um, and not taking very much time also because we know that uh, you are uh, an hour ahead of us, so it's eight o'clock, should be in Moscow now, and uh, there are some more uh, uh, other people that have to speak. Uh, we will leave all other comments on our essay that I will forward to you in order to be uh, distributed. Thank you very much. It was a really great pleasure for us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your speech. Much Filippo, appreciate. you can join now. Hello, everybody. It's Filippo Benji speaking. Uh, I kindly ask the moderator to activate the, the video as well as uh, for Aristide. Um, yeah, you. just a second. Try it on. Okay. Not yet. But I think it, it is not a great loss. <laughs> if you can I'm see. I'm very it. sure it's a huge loss. Just a second. Forse adesso funziona. Prova, Filippo. Okay. Oh, well, good. Yes. Okay, maybe now it's working. It is. It would be a huge loss for us. So right now we're good. we're all good. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, as I said, the goal that will be uh, very short. Um, we will uh, um, let available our speech, and uh, so um, in this uh, this time of the day, I will uh, I will try to summarize in, in a few lines our, our thoughts uh, arising from the, um, the very interesting consideration we heard up to now. 
Well, in a line, I would say that the, the whole world is a country because we, we saw uh, that many, many issues are common in all the, all the countries, even in countries that have a very different uh, legal framework. And maybe this uh, uh, depends on the fact that uh, um, apart from the, the legal, uh, legal framework and the, the cultural heritage of different, uh, very different um, um, uh, states, there are common needs like uh, reducing private sector bid uh, cost or speed up the procurement process or uh, uh, ensure an efficient allocation of public resources. And I think that this is uh, this, uh, this one of the most um, challenging time uh, for the contracting authority um, that are going to, to face this important uh, um, challenge from the, the, the pandemic time. And they need to ensure above all uh, an efficient uh, allocation of public resources. And so uh, the, these common uh, uh, issues are um, probably leading all the all the countries uh, uh, towards two common solutions, and uh, um, in, in this um, in this uh, in this light, I think that uh, some common solutions are uh, given by the central role played by the evaluation criteria, because the the one of the most important things is to uh, to um, to choose the right uh, operator and the word the contract to the best uh, best bidder, and uh, in this uh, in this scenario, we we think that the, the, the common uh, the common ground um, is the is the criteria uh, set forth by the European Directive that were now in uh, in in place in Italy as well. Uh, as as in the other in the other European country, and we have certain, in in a few words two two criteria: uh, a price only price only criterion uh, and the best price quality ratio. As uh, I said, our Bel uh, our friend from Belgium, uh, some country are uh, um, more more comfy with uh, the price uh, the price criterion because. Uh, uh, it, it, it's more objective, and, uh, and on the other hand, uh, let the contracting authority to speed up the process uh, rather than a tender procedure grounded on the best price quality ratio, uh, during which the, the, the officials are in charge, while in charge to evaluate the offers, need more time to address the, the evaluation process. But uh, I think also that uh, in this case there, there would be a trade-off because uh, uh, it, it's not it's not sure that the price only criteria would uh, would ensure the, the best uh, the best uh, the best contract and the best uh, undertaking and um, and also in, in the latest uh, uh, EU directive the the European um, Commission and uh, the European legislation um, looks uh, mm, mm, towards uh, the, the best price quality ratio because it, it, it's likely to, to ensure a best uh, a best location of the public resources. So uh, we think that uh, the the the, pro the whole process uh, is. Uh, is still going on, and we can probably uh, foresee a, a, a clear picture. And also, we think that the um, administrative judge or the judge, more in general, will uh, will play a significant role, ensuring that the, um, the legislation will be uh, efficient and uh, uh, ensure a fair and um, efficient competition between the undertaking. So uh, I will I will stop here and give you the uh, the rule to, to carry on the, the debate and uh, thank you all for the for the time.
Thank you. Thank you for your report, Mr. Degni. Uh, you know, we have a um, very um, uh, same word in Russian language, not Degni, but Dengi. <laughs> it's, maybe you know this, no? Uh, it, it's quite difficult for some languages to, <laughs> to pronounce. I, I see. Because in Russian language, uh, the word Dengi uh, means money. <laughs> 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 I <not> think you, <laughs> you, you, you thank you means my name. Thank, thank you, thank you for your for your report. It, it was uh, very interesting, uh, and uh, thank you for your participation in our collective monograph too. Mm, uh, please take our congratulations with uh, uh, quality of your national football team in this Europe. Uh, <sighs> And uh, of course, we want to see you in Moscow in, in, uh, at our conference uh, in next year. The same yes. for us. Thank and you. we are sorry for the inconvenience, for the delay. Uh, this always happens at the conferences. <laughs> we, we had a lot of interesting uh, considerations. So thank you again. Thank, thank you, you very much. You. See you. Thank you for your time. Dear colleagues, we are proceeding with our deliberations. Now we go to Portugal from Italy. And let me give the floor to our good friend, Miguel Assis Raimundo, Professor of Public Procurement Law or School of Law at the University of Lisbon, Portugal. Um, me yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kuzma. I'd like to uh, thank the organization for the the, the the invitation to speak uh, here again at the conference uh, of course also the the Lomonos of Moscow State University uh, and uh, um, GPB the organizers of of the event uh, and uh, I present to you my all my uh, all my best sympathy for having a, such a conference such a, a remarkable conference throughout the day with such good inter um, interventions and participations. And unfortunately, I was unable to attend the whole day, but I have been uh, for, for most of the, 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 the afternoon. So uh, congratulations to for the organizers of the conference. I will share my presentation, a very short presentation uh, in which I make basically a summary regarding uh, what have been some uh, relevant changes in uh, recent public procurement law in Portugal. What I have called the, the procurement for recovery uh, trend, which is a trend uh, exactly because it is manifesting itself in more countries uh, around Europe and even the world in the sense of, of several changes that are being made to the laws of these countries regarding public procurement law in order to uh, respond to the need for recovery after the COVID crisis and of course the previous underlying need for energy and environmental transition. So I would say that these two movements, the need for energy, energy and environmental transition and the need for recovery after the, the, the very serious economic crisis, for example, in Portugal, it's, it's a very clear economic crisis and financial crisis right now uh, because of, of the, the lockdowns that we've been subject to. So public procurement has been considered um, something of, of a relevant uh, um, change needed uh, in order to respond to these, to these uh, movements. So just uh, uh, the first slide to give you some small context uh, regarding the, the, the legal framework of public procurement uh, in Portugal. This is a slide that you will partly recognize from last year's uh, conference, but I believe it's useful for those who may have not been uh, last year here. Uh, so we do have a, a public contracts code, um, which is uh, from 2008, but has been extensively revised in 2017. And now again, into uh, 2021 as exactly a consequence of this trend or movement that I've been talking about. Meanwhile, we had the, the, the COVID legislation regarding public procurement, which I talked about last year and will not uh, get uh, into this year. 
So the, the, the main change, and it's really a, a very important change that has been made to public procurement law in Portugal is regards law 30, 2021 of 21st May, which will enter into force next Monday. So uh, a, a very brief period of adaptation of, of one month for public, uh, for contracting authorities. And this is interesting because uh, it really sums up what we have seen uh, a little worldwide, let's say, uh, regarding uh, changes being made to public procurement regimes. First of all, it, it uh, implements uh, a special, what the law calls a special public procurement regime for quite a long temporary uh, period, of, uh, uh, period of time which goes um, at the least until 2022, the end of next year, uh, or in some cases longer, and which applies to contracts in sectors that are considered to be essential for the economic and social recovery after the COVID crisis. A and these contracts are the ones that are funded or co-funded by EU funds, contracts related to healthcare and social sectors, and contracts which will implement the so-called recovery and resilience plan, which I don't know if, if the non-European uh, non -European Union members uh, are quite familiar with, but the, the recovery and resilience plans are the instruments through which the European Union will channel the funds that are being allocated to the economies of the member states uh, after the, the, the COVID crisis. So uh, in addition to that, there's another investment plan, which is the economic and social stabilization plan, which is from last year. These two are large um, investment plans, not just for infrastructure. So not just for building roads and railroads, even though that is a very relevant uh, part of these investment plans, but also uh, re-establishing, re-equipping uh, changing, for example, the energy uh, status, the, 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 ener the energy sources which are used for public infrastructure, uh, for example, investing in cultural um, and educational infrastructure. So this all is part of a big uh, or, or two big uh, um, investment plans which for which there has been a special regime of procurement that has been approved. Furthermore, uh, we have had uh, an extensive change to the public contracts code, uh, of which I will be speaking more um, below. And then we have had, and it's interesting because one of the remarks that was being made, uh, I believe by Stanislav uh, earlier on, uh, regarded public procurement litigation and the, the situations in which uh, the bidders can stop, uh, paralyze, freeze, a public procurement uh, procedure. Well, uh, we had already had previously uh, very um, restrictive uh, changes to the law. And now in 2021, we have an even more restrictive change. So basically in Portugal these days, uh, it will be very difficult, uh, increasingly difficult for economic operators to be able to freeze a public procurement procedure. So basically this only happens uh, in the cases, the very strict cases that EU law forces this to happen. And even in those cases, it is uh, relatively easy for the public authority to lift the, the suspension regarding these topics. So as you can see, the, 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 the whole idea is to make things faster, simpler, accelerate procedures. As I say here, we have, uh, we can say that we have four main sets of changes regarding this uh, change to the Portuguese law. First of all, the, the, the introduction of even more instruments of strategic public procurement. Uh, this means implementing social and environmental and um, criteria, award criteria, specifications and contracts. Uh, conditions, but also granting access to SMEs, as I will uh, say, um, say um, early, uh, later on. Uh, the second big, uh, big idea is the acceleration and the reduction of expenses to bidders and the simplification of procedures. So this is, of course, something that we're always looking for 
Um, and uh, it appears that the only ways we can simplify right now are the reduction of, for example, deadlines and such things. Uh, it, it seems that it's the only thing that we can do right now because we have gone so far in simplification that I, I don't really see how we can go much further. We do have a third um, uh, source of, of uh, changes to the law, which is the attempt to integrate transparency and integrity in fraud prevention mechanisms, as I will say. Just to give you a very, very quick, uh, just two slides, really, this uh, and the next, regarding some changes that for you to have an idea, you'll obviously you'll read this in the in the contribution, the written contribution uh, afterwards. But um, just to give you a very quick overview of some changes with impacts in this change made by the 2021 law. So, for example, it, it, it has been extremely controversial and up until now not foreseen in public Portuguese law. Uh, the possibilities of reserves for SMEs and local companies, locally based companies. Well, this has uh, entered into Portuguese law. It's, it's a, an extremely controversial uh, change, uh, controversial in um, considering Portuguese constitutional law, but also controversial under EU law. So we have had this, we in, in EU thresh under contracts under EU thresholds, there will be the possibility of of uh, restricting access to the bids to the even even open procedures and for the restricting the possibility of access to SMEs and to local companies um, in contracts under the EU thresholds. This means that uh, even contracts over five millions regarding works and concessions are under this possibility. So this is extremely controversial. The second point, uh, really impactful change, is um, the elimination of duties to justify extensively some decisions uh, regarding big projects. So in Portuguese law, up until now, we've had um, a provision by which contracts over 5 million euro are always submitted to a cost benefit analysis. So the, the, the 2021 uh, Oh, excuse me, uh, Professor. Uh, the so, you are unmuted. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, just check the the microphone. So, yeah, but, but someone else did this, not me. <laughs> I don't know what happened actually. Yeah, but, so it was someone sorry. else. Uh, it, it showed up a message saying that the the host muted my my sound. So I'll continue. Sorry, Professor. Um, the second point was that, I, as I was saying, uh, there was a provision under Portuguese law stating that you should have a cost benefit analysis of every project over 5 million euro. Uh, and this uh, 2021 uh, change has eliminated this for the majority of contracts which are necessary for uh, considered necessary for the recovery after COVID. For example, another example of an impactful change, uh, the, the performance bond, which up until now was necessary for contracts over 20 um, to, to 20 hundred thousand um, uh, uh, euro contracts has been lifted to half a million euro. So five, 500,000 euro uh, is now the, the threshold for having the need to present a performance bond. So. Again, the, the, the risks of this speed, speeding up of the procedures and, and, and reducing costs for bidders are, are quite clear, I would say. Uh, the second slide, um, we have had some, the introduction of some, some rules that aim to solve a problem, which is a problem when happening, at least in Portugal, in every context that you have re restricted procedures by invitation. Um, I know that many countries use this, even European countries use this. Uh, I, I'm not so informed about outside of Europe countries, but um, many countries use these restricted procedures by invitation, establishing, for example, that you should invite at least five economic operators. So this is a very 
um, used mechanism for periods in which you need to make procurements fast. And uh, this has not been an exception in this case because we have had uh, approved by law a very generous uh, regime for restrictive procedures by invitation. And this always causes one problem, which is how do you decide who you choose to invite? And another problem, which is the, the uh, let's say the fake invitations that are made to companies owned by the same person and which are obviously fraud. So we've had some rules on the law to change this, try to change this. Finally, um, we have uh, an alignment with uh, the, the regime of the EU directives up until now. It was harder to make amendments in Portuguese law than the EU law um, demanded. So basically we aligned. This means that in practice, it has become easier to make amendments. And this obviously poses a risk. So we've had here a counterweight, which is um, rules that state that you should uh, publish all the, the, the amendments to contracts made, uh, contracts covered by the public contracts code. If they are amended, whatever the, the value of the amendment, that should be published. So uh, in this case, it is a case in which the legislator saw the clear review risk and tried to uh, solve it immediately. Just the, 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 the final slide of my presentation, it's, as you see, it's a short presentation. I think I'm going to comply with time. Uh, just to say that uh, basically, we nobody argues the need for simplification. It's, it's a, a need that we are always having. Uh, but I would say that we have very clear risks in this idea of public, changing public procurement rules to enable recovery, which I'm seeing not just in Portugal, but I've seen laws about this in Italy, in France, in Spain. So basically this is, in my view, um, something that creates a lot of risk, as, it, as you can see. Um, I think we're under the risk of, of losing competition and trans transparency as a central element of, of the system, because we're getting more and more the use of restricted procedures for contracts uh, under EU thresholds. Uh, secondly, we, secondly, uh, thirdly, in this case, uh, I, I already covered the second point. Uh, by, by restricting, for example, access to SMEs and local companies, we create a risk of, of fragmenting markets. So we create the risk of, of something that hasn't happened for a long time, which is uh, companies not feeling comfortable and not acting outside their very um, uh, narrow uh, geographical, let's say, point of origin which is something that is probably not good for the efficiency of markets. Uh, also, I'm seeing, for example, in Portugal, a great risk of alienating the economic dis the dimensions of, of big projects. So how can you decide on a big project, even when you need recovery, how can you decide on a big project without adequately planning and measuring the impact of that project? It's so complicated. Uh, finally, the, the risks of not taking due care and the, the protection of public interest. So you want to, to uh, uh, make the contract so fast that you lose the, the safeguards that you usually had in order to ensure the public interest. And, and these are the things that I think that in future years, uh, starting from now, we're going to have to be very careful about when looking at public procurement uh, and how it evolves in different systems. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope I, I comply with time. Thanks again for the invitation. And I am available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was very interesting as usual. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I hope to see you next year personally. Yes, yes. <laughs> I also. Thank you. Uh, Уважаемые коллеги, ну, у нас... Dear colleagues, um, we have two presenters, uh, two headliners. And they are not from uh, West Europe. Uh, first, uh, one, the first one is from the Dominican Republic. The second one is from Azerbaijan. 
И позвольте, я представлю слово a uh, partner of the company Martinez Peña and Fernandez, professor of Catholic University, Santo Domingo, uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, please, um, Luis, uh, you are welcome, uh, and you can start with your speech or presentation. Go on with your presentation. Good day. We cannot hear you, though. You have to unmute your microphone. Can you can you hear can you hear me now? Yes, right now we do hear okay. you. Okay, good evening, Kuzma <laughs> and Stanislav and in this marathonic conference <laughs> in Ghana procurement. I, I only can imagine what you've been through sitting there all day. Like the best. Uh, the best. The best <laughs> day ever. <laughs> uh, and I should I should say uh Dobri Dean it would be uh, the, the correct word. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and, and, and I hope next year we see each other. So I'll start sharing the... Yes, it is uploading. Can you, <clears throat> can you see it there? Yes. All set. Okay. Okay, so um, let me just do this. So my name is Luis Ernesto Peña. I'm an attorney from the Dominican Republic, and I'm also a professor in constitutional law and, and government procurement. Um, and, and today I'm going to speak about big protests and judicial claims in government procurement uh, in the Dominican Republic. Um, and this is uh, one of the last sessions, so I'll try to be to be brief. Do you still see the, the presentation? Yeah, we do see the presentation, but uh, if you want to switch to the next slide, you should try on. Because I, I don't see the switch though. I can see the presentation right now, but I don't see anything moving to the next slide, for example. Yeah, now it's uh, full screen. Okay, so um, maybe to provide, a, 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 first I'm going to provide a little context on how the Dominican Republic procurement system has been designed. Um, the current system was enacted in 2006. Um, we were in the process to sign the, a free trade agreement with the US. So uh, one of the requirements of the free trade agreement was to that we enacted a new procurement law. So. This meant for us uh, a big change, and we had to pretty much create a new bill that made us comply with OECD rules and international best practices. Um, there is currently a modification, a draft procurement law, a new draft procurement law, but it's not going to change um, many things systemically. It's, it's going to be mainly um, the same system um, with, with a little twitches. So the system remains a free and open competition system with equal treatment between offerors, um, meaning that uh, in order to, to buy services or goods, the government has to celebrate a, a free and open competition process to select the offerors. And also has to be transparent and, and, a, and a public. It's also a decentralized um, system, meaning that each government agency uh, must conduct its own government procurement procedures. However, there is a, a government procurement supervising authority, which is called the um, General Director of <clears throat> Government Procurement and Government Contracts that supervises this, um, all the government agencies, but it, it's, it, it's at, the, at the same time, um, it is also uh, an agency of the central government, which has, uh, has presented some issues over the time and, and now one of the main changes of the procurement law is that this uh, supervising authority, it's not going to be completely dependent of the, on the executive branch. 
and it's going to have, uh, meaning that the director is going to be appointed by the government, but it, it would have immunity to be removed for four years, meaning the duration of the of the of the tenure, and and it's also it will have a budgetary independence. Um, it's a it's a, it's an a, it's an intent to give it independence, but I believe it should be um, like in other jurisdictions, a completely separated um, entity. And and we also have the the a superior administrative court that oversees legal challenges. And regarding uh, COVID nineteen, um, I, I I think the same as everyone in the world uh, at first we presented uh, we had troubles buying uh, and celebrating the urgency procedures which uh, uh, presented mainly issues regarding price quality but also availability meaning in in in, in the chaotic chaotic market that the covid-19 presented that at first um, it, 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 it it was hard even to get the goods because every every, every country was trying to buy them at the same time. So uh, we had to fight uh, for availability and, and uh, quality and, and also prices. And especially for like, we, we, we had a, a big mask bubble would be how it's, how, I would, how we call it. Meaning that at first there were no, ma no masks. So a, a mask was, uh, was selling here for about um, uh, six, $7, uh, just one mask. So this presented a, a huge problem for the government at first, and now it's dropped um, to, to below $1 a mask. But in, the, in that time, it presented major issues. So we had a, a new government elected in August 2020. And one of the, men, the first measures this new government enacted was to Congress. They modified the procurement law and, 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 and authorized direct purchasing regarding vaccines. Um, and it was a way to to try and have direct access to the manufacturers of the vaccines. So we started importing and buying uh, directly by the government without no uh, public procedure or competitive procedure. So it's 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 not something enacted through an executive order. It's something that it's currently in our new procurement law. Vaccines, I mean, expressly, vaccines can be bought directly by the government. So um, entering in, in the specific topic of what can be challenged, uh, the law establishes um, what, what you can bring about in a big protest challenge or, or in a court. And it, it, it enumerates eight possible objects of the challenge. The main one is the announcement and the termination of the selection procedure, the approval of the specifications, meaning the approval of the request for proposals, which governs which will be the evaluation terms of the of the procedure, the qualification of bidders in this two stage process, meaning the habilitation of the offerers, and also the the habilitation of the of its uh, offers. The result of the analysis on evaluation of the economic proposals, of, of course, the award, the resolution to terminate or annul the process at any stage of the procedure or in its entirety, the application of sanctions, and the result of the opposition's. On the on the claims, in, in some. Um, what, what can be challenged is it, I, I have separated them in three main types of acts. The first one, meaning the preparatory acts, would be, for example, the market research is a uh, something in that happens in the preparation of a certain procedure that cannot be brought. There, there's not. I mean, you cannot bring a claim for a market research or or, or a decision to buy which be also a political act. For example, um, the decision on how the government spends its money, it's only limited by the law and in, in, in form, but not, not in, in what it decides to buy. I mean, if, if the government decides to build a road that wasn't necessary, this should be, this should have a, a political consequence, not a legal consequence, um, and unless it was uh, celebrated in, in, in violation of the procurement regulations. And also what it means that discretionary acts, which is also related to expenditure decisions. On the question on who can bring the challenges, um, um, currently uh, there is not an express statement saying that um, this person or that person can bring the challenge, but from a construction from two different laws, we can conclude that in the first part that says that any claim or challenge made by the supplier 
meaning that only participants in the in the procedure can bring a challenge. Um, this uh, this this lives in a in a certain limbo. For example, what, what would be a potential supplier in the in the phase where no supplier has presented an offer, and 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 this would be uh, complemented with when another law that says that any person invested with a legitimate interest, and this this would include also uh, of course potential suppliers. Meaning that if if you if you're a company that, that provides the service or, or or the goods that are going to be contracted or, or acquired, you should I mean you should have an interest there. And this and this has been modified in the new draft procurement law, um, and and they they said I mean the the new draft procurement law specifically states that um, you can you can bring a claim if you're a, a supplier or you or if you're a potential supplier a potential offer. So um, even though it's not it's not expressly stated. There are, there are certain uh, approved uh, grounds for challenges, ranging from violation of the guidance principles, which is a, a, broad, a, broad, a broad ground for challenge. For example, if, if a certain uh, request for proposals violates uh, the free and open competition principle, none of service are of, of, of the procurement process rules, the infringement, infringement of rights, overflow of legal powers and arbitrary or unreasonable decisions. So um, there are L, L, our system is, is really similar to the to the uh, bid procurement uh, bid process system in the U.S. Meaning we are available we are, we we can uh, bring challenges in the same contracting agency, and also these challenges can be appealed to the supervising authority. We can also then bring the same appeal to the uh, to a judicial claim in the superior administrative court. But we can also skip the bid challenges in the contracting agency and go directly to court, or skip the, or or, or go directly to the supervising authority, and, and so we we also have arbitrage available, but it's it's uh, it's demanded that it's agreed by both parties in in the contract. I mean, it 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 can be uh, uh, mandatory. We also have a uh, precautionary measures available. Meaning that both the supervising authority and courts could um, decide to suspend the procedure. However, in practice, it, this almost never happens, uh, mainly uh, because what, what, what mentioned Stanislav uh, earlier, there are some uh, potential offerors or participants that sometimes just uh, bring about claims just to, to interrupt the, the acquisition. Um, so courts are really reluctant to decide uh, automatic stays or, or suspensions of the procedures. But this at the same time has made that in practice, the uh, claims are not effective because uh, you know, the supervising authority sometimes lasts uh, about a year to decide an appeal and courts can, can last almost three to four years uh, to decide a, a judicial claim. Meaning that by the time you have a decision the, the contract is already executed and paid. And, and, and so the decision you have, you, 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 you could put it in a frame and just to see it and, and be happy about it, but you, you won't be able to do anything with it. Um, and because, um, because there is no stay, there's also no pressure uh, for the courts to decide. So it's a, um, it's a lose, lose situation, uh, but uh, I think uh, the courts should, should start deciding um, in a more equitable manner, so so the the, the remedies are, are really fair, and so the another criteria for issuing these precautionary measures are, are three: a appearance of good law, meaning that there's uh, an, an at least in principle uh, an appearance that that your claim is uh, it's founded, a danger of in, in the delay, which I think there's all always a danger in the delay in the in the procurement process because the main danger. Is that if if the acquisition is finished, then my claim has no has no meaning, and also that that the suspension does not affect the public interest or third parties. That it, it could also be really uh, really present in every procurement process, since um, since there's always a, a public interest in in buying something and or a service or in building something, and which is also 
it's going to be built for the public interest and for uh, the for public need. So if 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 you suspend an acquisition and, and it gets suspended indefinitely, then you will have a, a big public problem. So it's it's a that it's a criteria that must be really balanced case by case. So that that's all, um, and I, I really thank uh, Kuzma for the invitation. I believe it, it's the first time the Dominican Republic is invited to this to this event, which is a, a really big effort, and I really look forward to being in Moscow next year. Many more to come in person. Yes, we really hope uh, to. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for your participation in uh, this conference and uh, in our collective monograph too, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that, just, uh, that just proves uh, that we all have the same, the same problems from uh, east to west. Just uh, everywhere, there is, everything's the same. Not everything, but uh, most of it, most of it makes us uh, closer to each other. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a unified world and, 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 and government procurement has, and this, this event's really help a lot to, to see those common problems and maybe reach common solutions. You For are sure. the first representative of the Dominican Republic in our uh, procurement law conferences. So I think uh, today is a historical event, uh, as I told it before. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much and see you in our uh, future events. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, please. We will be in touch. Уважаемые коллеги, и позвольте... Dear colleagues, so we have the last uh, report for today. The representative uh, from Azerbaijan, uh, Rashad Mamedev, Associate Professor of the Civil Law Department of the Police Academy of the Minister of Internal Affairs of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Police Colonel, PhD in Law, Azerbaijan. Good day. So we're finishing our presentations uh, in uh, Russian today. So we can see you, we can hear you. Valerievich Stanislav Albertovich, dear colleagues, first of all, I welcome you. I have gratitude to you and uh, my high let's say wishes go to you. I hope that uh, this uh, event will help us to be closer to improve cooperation and fruitful future cooperation. So let me introduce my presentation. So in Azerbaijan, we have the law of Azerbaijan on the public procurement on 27 of December, 2001. So this uh, law identifies the economic, legal and organizational basics for public procurement in our Republic and identifies the principles and the rules of effective economic usage of state money while doing the public procurement. Despite the fact that uh, 20 years passed from the adopted law, so till today this law had a lot of amendments and changes which we would cover today. One of the significant changes and additions to this law, this is the law of Azerbaijan Republic about making changes to the law of the uh, Republic of Azerbaijan or public procurement of 28th of December, 2018. That we did for uh, usage of the certain methods of procurement and application of certain procedures. There are some principles that identify in micro, macro and middle companies in public procurement. As a result of uh, the adoption of this uh, law, we go to the improved system of framework of the field of public procurement in our republic 
as well as relocation, identification of the rights of the participants to the goods and services, public procurements in Azerbaijan Republic in Manhattan main money. We do now uh, with the E procurement using open bid methods. I want to highlight from the 21st May of 2021 in the plenary session of the parliament in the first reading, we adopted the draft of the amendments in the law of public procurement. Due to these changes, as the purchase, the public procurement uh, with the threshold of three, let, not let, more than $3 million will be done only with micro, macro and middle companies with the e-procurement, with the public procurement and the open quotes as well. In this context, we need to highlight that from March 2019, there was created the United Internet Portal of State of Public Procurements integrated in the IT system. The state one, this United uh, website gives the opportunity to do effective public procurement and creates the basics for the development of uh, the local companies, ensuring the their participation in the public procurement in Azerbaijan. So this uh, portal uh, organizes uh, the commission uh, tender decision taking and improves the transparency of using the state funds more effectively, transparently, and helps to avoid any kind of interferences. So we can conduct tenders very flexible and very open and transparent way. If we had the uh, United Portal tender, let's say we have the result through the automated system, according to the consequence of uh, the price offers just after uh, the evaluation of the tender uh, quotes. And so all these quotes evaluate uh, these opportunities and uh, compare the compliance to the, all the criteria and uh, it issues and publishes its decision at the same day. Due to the open tenders, the contract, let's say, is agreed in the e form through this United portal. In case of uh, taking up the decision within three days, as the authorized contractor prepare as all the information and announced it in the United portal and signed it. So the agreement in this way should be signed within five days. All the plans and opportunities on the biddings and the contracts should be open for everyone through the United Internet portal. So following and conducting all the procedures of public procurement laws, e in the e format. So through this United portal, there is the opportunity to submit the application in e form. It's a very easy way. I want to highlight in 2020. So there was uh, conducted more than 9,000 procedures for 6 million and a half million monarchs, about 3. 865 million dollars. Comparing to the previous year, 2019, the total volume of the public procurement increased up to about 800,000 monarchs. It's about 500,000 dollars. 
That's about 9%. So for uh, the last year, we conducted 2014 open bidding procedures for 2 million 150, 1 million uh, 570. Four uh, thousand monads. Uh, that's uh, about uh, one million dollar. And open procedures were conducted. All of them were done uh, through e United Portal. So comparing these figures to two thousand nineteen the quantity of the public procurement done uh, with this kind of method increased significantly uh, by 17.2%, and the total procurement uh, increased up to 3,400 monads, so 0.2%. At the end of my presentation, I want to highlight that uh, the state effectively works uh, over uh, the legislation and upgrade uh, of all of the uh, activities in the public procurement field and uh, offers uh, equal opportunities for every party and uh, participants and uh, set the effective uh, rules and regulations uh, on the competitive basis. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Rashad, uh, Rashad, uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice presentation. Probably there will be no any additional questions in a Dominican Republic. It's uh, 2 a.m. Uh, in Baku, it's uh, almost 11 p.m. You, let's say, have very hard times. Let's say, I think it's enough for today. So it's very interesting reports. Uh, did you get a lot of information? Thank you. Yes. Ваши материалы в нашу коллективную монографию, ну и в иных формах, о которых вы знаете. Уважаемые коллеги, мы ровно 12... Part of our collective work. And we just finished following the presentations. Let me give the floor to Mr. Gubin. He was the initiator of our conference, and it becomes quite logical for him to complete this conference. Thank you so much. I was always surprised why so many people take part in the marathon race. It's a very lengthy distance, but there are always too many people to participate in that. And I just sensed it that we had this marathon race and it's not just a competition, but it's a great feeling that you are working together, that you are running together. And at our conference, uh, we are acting all together as one team. And we are doing a very, very uh, serious uh, uh, thing. I remember the song um, that uh, things never pass without any footprint. And uh, uh, 12 hours altogether, we talked, talked, and talked. But I fully agree with that song, Russian song, that it really doesn't matter that it, that it was 12 hours, no. Uh, that was a serious footprint left, scientific one, uh, just uh, the footprint of your soul and heart, and that is really a part of our uh, cooperation. And uh, we've been uh, dealing with all of you for about nine years, and uh, scientific uh, takeaway is the key one. And I do know that a new project is being prepared, uh, which will uh, be dedicated to the issue of new articles in the journal 
and it uh, will be fully dedicated to the uh, uh, public procurement. It will be done by the legal faculty, by the um, RTS and uh, uh, the number of ministries. And this project will be wholeheartedly supported by all of us. If it were not for the role of the organized, it will never happen. Some people left, some not, but two people were here with us. It was a real shift, 12 hours shift. And they were all uh, with us in that audience. Uh, they've been working with us. Uh, they put questions, they controlled the situation. And that is their great endeavor. And uh, uh, I would like to cordially thank them all uh, for their heroic deed. And uh, actually it was uh, something which uh, deserves uh, respect and approval. Uh, dear colleagues, dear participants, uh, dear attendees to that conference, I would like to express my own viewpoint. And uh, we had uh, such a wonderful presentation so with such uh, uh, a high uh, spirit uh, and uh, with your heart and soul. And uh, actually, that was a real uh, uh, interesting topic dear to everyone's heart and probably it's uh, your key activity uh, for today and uh, today's uh, conference is uh, exceptionally interesting and exceptionally useful and i do believe that everyone who took part in that conference will be with us and uh, let me give the floor to the organizers and moderators of our wonderful conference the floor is yours, uh, um, Kuzma. Dear colleagues, uh, we had 44 speakers encompassing 28 countries, 12 hours of work. This is just uh, uh, statistics, but uh, we are supposed to have uh, a very serious takeaway. The collective monography uh, will be uh, issued and it will be in English but we are the co-authors of this uh, monograph, and then it will be published in Russian, and then all the articles will be uh, isolatedly published at our journal, uh, and the, it is uh, the public procurement and uh, law. Thank you for your involvement. Thank you for your kind uh, uh, words and cooperation, and uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, don't hesitate to call us and write to us. Uh, Benislav, yes, I would like uh, to support everybody and I really liked uh, this energy flow, which allowed us uh, to be together within uh, 20 hours. And we were charged by this uh, positive and uh, we acquired quite a number of information. And I definitely see that we have quite a number of commonalities. And uh, from the Far East uh, up to the West, uh, even Far West, uh, we've uh, been uh, discussing uh, this uh, very uh, substantial issue. And we have the same challenges and we have the same problems uh, and uh, many things to share. And that's another cornerstone, uh, or I should say a brick in the wall of our cooperation. Thank you once again. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. 600 people visited us and it was a Russian and English interpretation. And uh, thank you all. Your topics and presentations were of great value to us. Um, and this is a global subject for us. And uh, thank you. I would like to thank my colleagues, Ilya Garelov, Victoria Perminova, and they are with us. They've been working 14 hours today at this, uh, in order to support this event. And uh, Kuzma, uh, no comment, everything was just perfect. And uh, it was a great pleasure to be a co-moderator with you today. Okay, dear colleagues, and I would like to say goodbye to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.